Resident Evil has been a franchise that has stood the test of time, first releasing with the original game back on PlayStation 1 all the way back in 1996. Throughout the nearly 30 years of this series, we have seen it morph and shape with the times, some of them being great and some of them not so much. As a series that birthed what we now know as the original survival horror genre, I wanted to take a look at every mainland Resident Evil game to date, from the original that released way back when to the recently released, at the time of this recording, remake of Resident Evil 4. In this video, let's see how this series has morphed throughout the years, changing with the times, and how it has either improved or flopped. This is the ultimate retrospective of the Resident Evil franchise, and while many of you have seen the videos here and there, I wanted to put them all together in one massive compilation, so that we may look back on how these games have changed, for better or for worse. And for a better viewing experience, or if you want to skip to a specific game in the series, there will be chapters and timestamps for each game in the description below, so feel free to bounce around as you wish, or watch it straight through for the complete analysis. If you're a fan of this type of retrospective and review content, please consider subscribing to the channel, checking out the past videos we've done, and if you really want to support this content, consider becoming a member with the multitude of perks at each level, from inside looks at scripts, rough cuts, b-roll, and more, and just to join me in a monthly hangout where we can play games and shoot the shit. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below, and if you like this video, hitting that like button helps get this video out to a ton more people. So, without further delay, let's get into the ultimate Resident Evil retrospective. Enjoy. Over the decades of video games, there are a few franchises that have stood the test of time, evolving from its original formula to become something larger than the sum of its parts. One of the biggest names to this effect is the long-running Resident Evil franchise. Upon its original release in 1996 and seeing where it is today, the franchise has had a lot of ups and downs in its history, both in games, movies, books, and even TV shows. But the legacy of Resident Evil is maybe stronger than it ever has been. With the release of Resident Evil 8, along with a Netflix series, six movies, and up to 30 games including remakes and spin-offs, it's safe to say that this franchise is extremely history. With that, I want to take a look at all of the mainline games that have come out in the series thus far, starting with the very first, Resident Evil 1 on PlayStation 1. Released back in 1996 by Capcom on PlayStation 1, let's take a look into the very first game in this series, the thing that started it all, from the creation of the lore that would further lead into the movies, games, and TV shows yet to come. In this series of videos, we're going to be looking at all the Resident Evil games, from spin-offs to remakes and everything in between, so it's going to be a long and arduous ride, but I think it'll be well worth in the end. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into Resident Evil 1. Resident Evil Headed up by horror gaming icon Shinji Mikami over at Capcom, the original desire was to recreate one of his prior games called Sweet Home, released in 1989, with a focus on graphical fidelity. But with Capcom no longer having the license to the said franchise, we now have Resident Evil. Taking advantage of the power of the PS1 and its ability to render a 3D space, Capcom created the Spencer Manor, a space which will be iconic in the Resident Evil franchise for years to come in both the feeling and the style. Having released in 1996, I still think this game looks damn good for its time, due predominantly to the pre-rendered backgrounds the game utilizes to create such a well-rised 3D area. While the character models, zombies, monsters, and interactable objects all look pretty pixely, there is no doubt that the backgrounds in every room leave every space feeling iconic and well-realized. The amount of detail in each area is astounding for the time and make each area feel fully 3D, despite being only a basic painting of an asset imposed on a 2D plane. Looking at the main entrance hall, for example, one of the largest areas of the game, while being foreboding to the nightmare that is to come, there is a quaintness to the space, the bright red of the rug going up the stairs, the shading of the columns flanking the two wings, all the cozy end tables hosting the beloved typewriter, the central save point of Resident Evil, a sign of safety as we will realize later in this video. Other memorable area to me is the bar room hosting the grand piano, forest green walls, and a bar top sheen to perfection of hard oak, untouched by the living dead shambling the halls. Every area in this game is a looker, making exploring the inviting space juxtaposed with the horrors within, making a cold sterile labs underneath the facade of the house much more out of place, and thus pretty eerie. This game was heralded as a graphical powerhouse in 1996, and looking at other games around its time, you can really see why. Even now, having playing it decades later, I still love the look and style of Resident Evil, and I'm glad to see this pedigree of visual continue even to this day, with even games such as Resident Evil 7 and 8 looking absolutely phenomenal. The team over at Capcom for these games are well versed into making highly interesting spaces, and it still lives on to this day, making the Spencer Manor really the beginning of its style that we continue to see to this day. One main aspect for the style of Resident Evil 
comes from clever use of static camera angles when roaming the halls of the manors and the labs below. These were done for two express purposes. For practicality's sake, using a static camera angle allows for the pre-rendered backgrounds as we discussed before, also allowing the PS1 to render the game and keeping it looking as well as it does while moving from space to space, even with the loading rooms disguised as opening and closing of doors. Moving around to play space, even in games today, the processing power must be allocated to bring in objects out of view, hence why games have to what is referred to as pop-in, a jarring phenomenon when seen taking players out of the space and time that they are currently in. Keeping the camera angles in certain locations on the area makes everything load the same no matter how many times you come in and out. In a stylistic sense, however, it allows the team to create certain points of horror, leaving the player to not know what's around the next corner or further up the hallway. This means that said player needs to rely on not only their visuals, but the sound design to know if there is a threat in the next room. The thump of footsteps from the hunters, the shambling of zombies, or the snarl of the dogs. Not only that, but it gives the player a sense that someone or something is watching them. You can see this technique used in horror films as well, as many directors utilize camera angles that are off-kilter or awkward being used a lot. This stylistic choice is a technique that also puts the watcher on edge, as our brain detects that this is incorrect or wrong, heightening the tension felt in the movie. This can be best seen with the movie recently released on Paramount called Smile, where it seems like every angle in this movie is just a little bit off-center. It Follows is another great example of this as well. Resident Evil incorporates that to its advantage, ensuring that the player is kept on their toes at all times. With these angles, however, does lead to an interesting problem. That is, how does one keep the controls straight with ever-changing ways of looking at your character? What may be up on the D-pad may not be the case with walking down the hallway that's facing to the left, only to have the camera angle change to face the character, now having the opposite directional input being what is known as up, which leads us to what gets talked probably most about in the original Resident Evil run, the control scheme. One criticism that I find to be normally levied against the original Resident Evil games would be its controls, and rightfully so to a degree. Compared to games made today, it feels unintuitive and honestly downright bad, hence why the series also dropped these control schemes upon the release of Resident Evil 4. Games have a way of defining a generalized control scheme to eventually unify how a genre should be played. Remember when first person shooters required you to push in the right thumbstick to aim down sights? This was the case as most recently as 2008 with Bioshock 1. With the advent of 3D games in 1995 to 1997, the mode of control had yet to be defined and was still really being refined at the time, every company taking its own different approach to how the player would interact in the 3D area. Nintendo with Z-targeting and the one stick with the strangest controller ever designed, Sega with its taking it all on rails in the 3D flight during the Sega Saturn era with Nights into Dreams or Sonic 3D Blast, and PlayStation was operating under the lauded tank controls, which we see here in Resident Evil 1. Essentially, your character plays much like a tank, hitting forward to walk in the direction you're facing and controlling the pitch with the left and right, spinning in a circle if you're not moving forward. While it took me forever to get used to this when starting the game again, it eventually begins to feel kind of right given how the camera can and will shift as you make your way through a room. With keeping the context of how games are sussing out how to best form of control over the player character at the time, I don't think the tank controls were inherently bad. It just takes some getting used to, much like anything else. I found myself spinning in circles a lot when trying to feather the approach to a puzzle area or fighting a boss, and after, but after the first couple hours, I felt like I was just moving and shaking past all the zombies in the area, which feels really good to do. I'm a lot softer on tank controls and that's just a personal opinion. Go ahead, sue me. Say that Resident Evil popularized the genre that we now know as survival horror would be an understatement. Resident Evil essentially is survival horror, even you welcome me back to the game to the survival horror experience upon loading up the game again. Inventory management, slow plotting movements and attacks, and having more enemies and resources are a staple of the genre, all popularized here in this video game. Inventory management is a major staple of RE1 and honestly, maybe one of the most defining features of the franchise as a whole up until Resident Evil 5. Depending on the character you select to begin, Chris or Jill, will dictate how many slots you have throughout the game. Each item you pick up takes a slot, gun, ammo, healing items, puzzle pieces, and even ink ribbons which allow you to save. With there only ever being a dictated amount of each resource in the mansion, this makes item management a key. I love the push and pull of what to take on your next trek through the halls of the Spencer estate, ensuring that you have the correct items to progress while also making sure you have a gun and ammo to dispatch any enemies that may be in your way. If you can't seemingly run past them. Running out of ammo gives leaves you a sitting duck and expending all of your ammo in a given area leaves you defenseless in case a hunter or a horde of zombies are in the next room. Thus, leaving the safe room with intent also plays a key role in managing your slots, as these are the only areas really where there are no enemies that are going to be attacking you. Going out on useless expeditions will also end up a waste of precious resources, ones you'll never get back, like herbs and first aid sprays. We mentioned Egrim as before, which is a choice I both love and hate. Making saving a resource to manage really does 
does ratchet up the tension with each run into the manor. And if you run out for constantly saving, you need to make sure you live long enough to find the next ink ribbon. This makes even the act of saving a choice, as running out makes the game a lot harder for you in the long run. The downside is that if you're someone like me who has to play games in fits and spurts, let's be real for a minute. I have a wife, I have two kids, parents who live essentially up the road, and run day-to-day -day operations for a renovation company. My life is hectic, and so if I have to do a service call or go do something, be it grocery shop, go to a dinner, take the kids to work, or have a service call sprung up on me out of the blue, I need to be out the door, making me save more often than desired or that the game would want me to, edging me up to dangerously not having any ink ribbons and being stuck on a part for the better part of two hours due to not having any and no resources and saves. Dying will lead to, and has led to, a loss of a ton of progress. Frustrating for sure, but at the core of the design, and especially for 1996, I respect it, and to a degree, even appreciate it. Survival horror, a genre built on resource scarcity from bullets to health, and in this case, in the Mo Resident Evil series, even saving the game to shut it off for the night. Like I said, it's more of a love-hate relationship, but you either learn the game or be destined to fail, stakes which I personally enjoy. While the gameplay of Resident Evil 1 is dated by far, there's a ton of systems and devices has set out here in the first game that continue on in the series' DNA, making it one of the most recognizable game franchises in the industry. But with gameplay and systems out of the way, let's move on to the story of Resident Evil 1. It was Bravo Team's helicopter. Nobody was in it. But strangely, most of the equipment was still there. We begin the game by picking your main protagonist, whose story will be playing during the game, Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine. Taking place in 1998, we are greeted with probably one of the GOATs of the video game industry, full motion video, otherwise known as real life film footage, of a police unit named Stars. Our two main protagonists, Jill and Chris, accompanied by Albert Wesker and Barry, are in search of Bravo Squad, who has disappeared in the woods on the outskirts of Raccoon City, in the search for human disappearances. During their search, the group moves to take shelter in the Spencer Banch, and due to what looks to be like rotting Dobermans attacking their squad, killing a no-named member in the process. The team breaches the house, Chris with Wesker and Jill, and Jill with Wesker and Barry. Not sure where Barry disappeared to with Chris, but whatever. He must be allergic. It is here that the two pets begin to diverge slightly, but with the crux of what you're doing being virtually the same. Essentially roaming the mansion, solving its various puzzles to work out what happened with Bravo Team and what's going on with the mansion itself. To keep some continuity with the story aspect of this game, we're going to follow Jill on this playthrough, but we will touch on the differences between hers and Chris's near the end. As Jill were set out to search for Chris with Barry, where we come across some blood and in the next room we meet the main enemy of the game, the zombies. In a harrowing scene that we get a close-up of the zombie eating one of the Bravo team members, turning its head to begin moving for fresh prey. Keep in mind, in 1996, this is a ton of detail and helps contextualize what this what these series of pixels actually look like, burning the image into the player's mind. From here, we set off across the mansion, coming across more bodies, zombies, keys, and puzzles. A lot of these puzzles seem convoluted as fuck, as the intent seemingly was in its infancy at the time. And while some of these are kind of well executed, a lot of these require the player to just find a key item and bring it to open said area, most of these being fairly obvious. This is where the inventory we discussed before plays a key role, as it forces the player to navigate the halls of the mansion, hoping not to expend precious ammo and resources, and also making you actually think about what items you're picking up. As you explore, Barry continues to pull Jill out of some sticky situations, dealing out some beautiful one-liners such as, That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> you're right. Barry, thanks for saving my life. And then disappearing to do whatever Barry does when not saving Jill. As you explore, you pick up diaries that shed light on what happened and what's going on in the Spencer Mansion. You see what happened to the people of the house, such as such as the diary found in one of the bedrooms that you can actively read if somebody turning into a zombie, with the last entry being itchy, tasty. It's pretty amazing that a half zombie could write a diary entry, but it does shed light on that fact that you can actively see that the people that were living here are turning into them. You also begin to learn of the importance of the Umbrella Corporation a massive biochemical organization with massive influence of the neighboring city of Raccoon City and the United States as a whole. Known for making medicines, pills, you learn the Umbrella has been using experiments with genetic diseases and bioweapons to be sold to governments for the highest price, with one of the main labs being located in the Spencer Mansion itself, the same place you're in. What once seemed like a quirky house of puzzles begins to open up into sterile abandoned labs behind locked doors and underneath the mansion as we move through, discovering the secrets within. With the number of experiments having a 
occurred in the labs, it's not far-fetched to assume that some of these monsters would and did escape, much like what we learn is known as the T-Virus did in creating the number of zombies roaming the mansion. Contending with the giant snake, Plant 42 in the guest house, you learn through yet other notes that this was all planned by Umbrella in the first place to lure the STARS team in to test out these bioweapons before destroying the entire facility and thus any evidence of their wrongdoings. In mentioning these boss fights, while they are a spectacle of the time, they kind of suck, mostly relegated to running around a very tight space and unloading your ammunition upon them. However, with tank controls, for me, this basically just entailed spinning in a singular circle and out healing the damage being done to me. Not very fun, but great moments to be seen for sure. In the same note, we read about the final boss of the game, known as the Tyrant, or as Umbrella sees it, the ultimate bioweapon. As Jill makes her way down to the labs, we run into Albert Wesker, who informs you he's really been working for the Umbrella Corporation all along, and that the planet was all constructed out of his own brain, and Barry, has been working with him this entire time under duress due to Umbrella holding his family hostage in exchange for his cooperation. Wesker takes Jill to the tyrant where Barry has a change of heart and shoots Wesker in the back. The two move forward and get a glimpse of the imposing monster that is the tyrant as he breaks out of his test tube, stabbing Barry and forcing Jill to handle him on her own. Now this fight is a lot cooler than the other two and operates better at a mechanical level given the size of the play space. Constant rotations of the arena while turning to blast the tyrant behind you as he's charging you over and over again is exactly exhilarating and tense as you move through the area, a feeling essentially gone a long time ago thanks to the amount of ammo and health items I had acquired by the end of the game. Dropping the tyrant for now, Barry and Jill move to escape, getting to the helipad. This is where the game begins to split and having multiple endings, all contingent on saving Barry and Chris, who we find in a jail cell by the elevator of the helipad. Saving both nets you the good ending, where Jill has one final encounter with the tyrant after calling the star's helicopter from outside, blasting him to pieces with a rocket launcher, and the three of them escaping. This is, for obvious reasons, reasons the canon ending, as the bad ending sees the entire group getting blown up after defeating the tyrant itself as well. Chris's story plays most of the same, however Barry is swapped with Rebecca, a Bravo team member still surviving in the house, a seemingly frail medic, who pulls Chris out of seemingly every sticky situation he seems to get into, from getting serum after the snake fight, to making the Volt Plant Killer serum and playing the piano to open a hidden door, to one of the game's key items. While the voice acting in this game is terrible, so terrible in fact that it was laughed at in 1996, drew so much praise to this game was its ability to create a world around the Spencer Mansion, making it a character in and of itself. As the setting for a horror game, it's also unlike any other at the time, being just a house full of zombies, demon dogs, and dreaded hunters, a late game entry which will completely wreck you. They have a pretty dope intro, showing their speed and making them feel truly ominous in a handful to fight, which they are, taking three whole shotgun shells to kill. Being the first game in the franchise, seeing the DNA that carries through to the rest of the series that started it all with the game's inception is fascinating to go back and see to this day, and it still holds up. This is my first time actually beating this game from soup to nuts, having only played sparts of it back at my friend Cameron's house. And in 2022, I could see why this game and series has garnered so much love from the fan base. The world it sets up, the creation of the modern survival horror genre, the gameplay and lore all work really well here and gel fantastically, and I absolutely adore it. If you have a PlayStation 1 or the ability to emulate this game, I would recommend going back for a jaunt. To do both runs took me about six to eight hours, even with all the getting lost in screen myself up on saves. It's definitely well worth your time. And with that, we've reached the end of the first video of the Resident Evil series, but what did you think of Resident Evil 1? Let me know in the comments down below as I love reading them and love responding to them as well. And until next time, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you all for watching. Following the huge success of Resident Evil, Capcom had come out swinging, and in 1998, Resident Evil 2 was released, arguably one of the most popular and well-received Resident Evil games released at the time, the same accolades that would incidentally follow the remake of the same game. It's amazing how fast games used to come back out in the 90s, huh? But the question is, why? What did Resident Evil 2 do that made it so memorable and beloved to this day, more so than almost any other game in the series? In our continuation of the Resident Evil saga, let's take a dive into Resident Evil 2 back on PlayStation 1. Without Without further ado, let's dive right in. Coming 
After the critically acclaimed Resident Evil in 1996, Capcom went to work on the sequel Resident Evil 2. This time, more versed in the PlayStation 1 hardware, it's easy to see the obvious improvements this game received. While virtually all the gameplay systems stayed the same as the original, albeit kind of tweaked and tuned a little bit, the visuals here got a massive upgrade. Characters and interactable objects having a lot more fidelity and much less pixely. Backgrounds looking a lot cleaner and rendering more zombies on screen to add to the tension and going into certain rooms. Being hardware limited, there were never really more than five zombies in any given area in Resident Evil 1. However, in just one of the first rooms that you entered to on an A-run playthrough, sports what seems to be almost nine or ten in just one small enclosed area. Capcom also opted for fully rendered cutscenes as opposed to FMV that was used in the original. And while these do look dated at the time of writing this in 2022, it comes off as way less hokey than the full motion video, despite my absolute love for it. The sound design also got a huge upgrade as well, gunshots sounding less grainy, music being diverse and very well written and performed, and while the voice acting is still hot garbage, at least they don't sound like they were recorded in tin cans like the Soggy Bottom Boys in Oh Brother Where Art Thou. On a sheer presentation level, this game is a huge step up from the original, unsurprising as you see this in almost every hardware generation. Visuals and AI and optimization all getting better the further you get into a console cycle. With every room having far more detail this time than the, its predecessor, really makes this police station feel lived in as if it was just an operation before the outbreak. I think of the stars room in particular, the special unit from the first game, with each desk being recognizable as being one of the former cast, Chris, Jill, Rebecca, and Barry. Seeing Rebecca's iconic first aid satchel behind the desk or Chris's jacket hanging on the wall shows a glimpse into the, that these worlds are connected, which I can always appreciate. The way that Resident Evil from the very beginning expanded on its lore and story to continue game by game, all in service of its plot, even after what would seem to be a hard reboot after Resident Evil 6, which we will definitely get into. It's something I can always appreciate about this series. They all seem interconnected together and it just makes everything have much more continuity with each other. However, with it only being two years after the fact, we still have the lauded tank controls here in Resident Evil 2 as well. If you didn't watch the last video, here's the TLDR. Tank controls are exactly what they sound like. You hold up to move in a straight line and left and right turn your character in that direction. While still a pain in the ass to get used to for the first bit, I don't know if using if it was just using the sticks this time, but the movement itself did feel a lot smoother to control. The main gripe that I have for this game is that some of the camera angles the game leans into, as it still does the static camera angles from the first game, especially in the outside area on the way to the station itself. While the cluttered streets due to the chaos of the the zombie outbreak really makes sense, combining that with the terrible angles the game forces you into with a fixed perspective and incorporate a little bit of tank control on top of that, this part was an absolute pain to get through unscathed with almost no healing items actually being available until you make it past the liquor in the first hallway. I died on this run quite a few times, forcing myself to just do a full restart in order to make a better run happen to have more health when I make it into the police station naturally. Health is a far more important resource this time around than even in Resident Evil 1. Obviously, you need health to stay alive, but the more damage you take, the more visibly hurt your character is, leading them to also being a shit ton slower. Hell, when you're low on health, Leon and Claire both hobble about at a snail's pace, about a quarter speed to be exact, making the need to take some herbs or sprays occur a lot sooner than they even did in Resident Evil 1. This pull of further using resources makes each herb more precious than the last in order to keep moving through the station at a normal human pace. I like this change as losing health adds further stakes, forcing the player to think about just running past zombies or if they're going to take them out with their own ammunition and having the choice of which resource to burn, ammo or health, to stay alive and keep moving. This further decision on resources really helps force engagements as well, something which Resident Evil 1 didn't really force you to do, as you could run by most of the zombies if you knew what you were doing. Your experience on this may be different than my own, so if they were, definitely sound off in the comments down below as I'd love to hear your guys' experience in Resident Evil 2. All that being said, the largest differentiator between Resident Evil 2 from the predecessor comes when discussing the plot. In Resident Evil 1, the two playable characters, Jill and Chris, essentially had the same narrative as each other, minus some flavor text and side characters to aid them on their journey. In Resident Evil 2, we have a choice between Claire Redfield and rookie cop Leon S. Kennedy, each with their own motives for going to Raccoon City during the outbreak. Claire is heading there to search for her brother Chris, who had disappeared after the events of the first game, in search of more information on the Umbrella Corporation and the bioweapons they have 
Project created. Leon is showing up to report for duty of his first day of being a beat cop in Raccoon City, only to be tossed into the mess of the outbreak and seemingly the only surviving cop left in the city and attempting to find out what happened and get out alive. Both paths here lead to the police station and unlike Resident Evil 1, you're required to play both characters to get the true ending of the game and complete their respective stories. When running the B-Run, in my case as Claire, you're met with a different point of entry as well as harder enemies out the gate due to the fact that the player should have already run through the police station in the first place. With the change up of key item placements, different weapons, and the ability to leave items behind from the A-Run, such as the machine gun or the extra inventory slots, all lead to both runs feeling distinct, a huge step up from the Resident Evil 1 split. Plus the inclusion of Mr. X in the B-Root is just downright amazing, an unkillable enemy that will follow you throughout the police station with the sole purpose of killing the player. The idea in Resident Evil 2 is pretty rudimentary, something which will be further expanded on in Resident Evil 3, as well as super fleshed out in the Resident Evil 2 remake, which we'll do a future video on that here real soon. It's a fun bit of tension to have the player put on the back foot whenever he shows up to play, and it truly is kind of terrifying, where the only way out is to run, much like how horror games are now. With all these differences in the narrative structure of Resident Evil 2, it'd probably be best if we hopped on into it. There's a bit more to get into here than there was with Resident Evil 1 for sure, and we'll be going through this in the way that I played, Leon for run A and Claire for run B. We begin with the game's recap of Resident Evil 1, to then be taken to the streets of Raccoon City, a jeep pulling up to a dead body and outstepping rookie cop Leon. A truck pulls out of the gas station, followed by some zombies. As Leon's inspecting the body, he becomes surrounded by zombies and after blasting one and backing into the alley, he turns to be face to face with Claire, also being chased. Saving her, the two make it to a abandoned cop car and speed off into the distance. They discuss why both of them are there, Leon showing up for his first day and Claire searching for Chris. Cut short, a gas tanker speeds towards the car and both jump out, separated by a blaze of fire and burning gasoline between them, leading into the game itself. Battling through the streets, Leon makes his way to the police station, hoping to find it relatively safe, only to be sorely mistaken. Finding one single cop, bitten and wounded in the other room, he fills him in on the events of RE1, and the dying cop tells Leon to rescue any of the survivors in the other rooms and hands him the blue card key, telling him by gunpoint to get out and save himself. Leon begins to explore the police station, only to naturally find no survivors, but zombies and the newest enemy to join the cast of Biomutants in Resident Evil series, the Lickers, a quadrupedal mutant with an exposed brain and massive tongue. Much like the Hunters, the enemies are a pain in the ass to kill, using a ton of ammunition and unlike the Hunters, are introduced near the very beginning of the game. While exploring the police station, Leon makes his way to the parking garage, running into a woman in a red dress named Ada Wong, who claims to be looking for her boyfriend, John, who was an umbrella scientist stationed in the area. Working together, the two move the truck to find a reporter locked in one of the jail cells, named Ben, a reporter that has knowledge of what Umbrella's been up to and how the police chief has been potentially aiding them, but refuses to open the gate as his only protection from the oncoming living dead horde, and telling Leon and Ada that there's a way to escape out through the sewers in the back of the kennel. Ada runs off, only to be caught up by Leon and asks him to boost her into a small hole, where she runs into a small girl named Sherry, who we'll talk more about later, and drops a pendant that Ada scoops up and tells Leon to move on and find another way through. Back to exploring the police station, Leon finds his way using some chess piece circuit breakers, and after heading back down to the door of the sewers, he finds Ben bloodied up by an unknown enemy. Ben hands Leon the evidence on Umbrella and of Chief Irons, who's been helping Umbrella hide the creation of the T-Virus, as well as the newest edition, G-Virus. Heading into the sewers, the two encounter a woman who begins taking pot shots at Ada, and with Leon being the sweet gentleman he is, dies to take a bullet for the woman he just met. Ada gives chase and ends up cornered by said woman, who reveals herself to be Annette Birkin, Sherry's mom and the wife of William Birkin, the creator of the G-Virus. We get a pre-rendered cutscene where we see William Birkin being accosted by Umbrella soldiers trying to take control of the G-Virus, and in an attempt to only save himself, injects it into his own body, and we see him slowly begin to mutate and take out the rest of the soldiers. A bioweapon, much like the tyrant from Resident Evil 1. The T-Virus is released in the scuffle, hence why Raccoon City is now a fucking zombie pit. Leon awakes to find Ada basically bitch-slapping Annette off of the railing, and the two proceed down further into the sewers, locating a tram that leading them to the abandoned Umbrella facility. However, as we saw, the now mutated William attacks the tram and wounding Ada in the process. Leon holds them off and as they make their way down to the labs below, takes her to the reception area and moves out to find something to treat Ada's wounds. Exploring the facility, we'll learn more about the Umbrella's creation of the G-Virus and again we run into Annette, who thinks you're there just to steal the G-Virus from her and tells Leon that Ada's really a spy for, quote unquote, the agency and she's there to locate and steal the virus for herself. Leon, being ever gullible, tries not to believe, but before he is shot by Annette, the facility begins to shake and a pipe falls down. Knocking Annette out, the self-destruct sequence then begins. Ah! <laughs> 
Running back to get Ada, she shows up behind Leon, holding him up at gunpoint and tells him to hand over the G-Virus. Leon attempts to call her bluff and suddenly Annette shoots Ada in the back and after a long drawn out moment between Ada and Leon, holding each other off of a banister, he drops her down to the abyss below. What a shitty boyfriend. Leon runs to make it to the train platform to escape only to find a now fully mutated William Birkin looking like this weird mutated dog thing. Killing him, Leon makes his way to the platform to see Claire and Sherry speeding by. Hopping on, the three escape to safety, but with Rude Day done, that's not the end of the stories by far. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the boss fights in this game, as there's a lot more than there were in Resident Evil 1. Between the giant alligator that you have to shoot the explosive barrel in his mouth, between the numerous encounters with William Birkin, and the giant creepy thing heading down into the sewers, all these fights feel kind of like the last ones did, where it's a lot of just bullet spongy shootiness. However, the arenas in these kind of lead the fights to be a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more fun. I especially find the alligator boss to be pretty entertaining, as it's not very clear as to what you need to be doing until you start just running away trying to make the space and you see him grab onto the explosive barrel into his mouth. It's a cool fight and it's a cool gimmick, but with it being so easy, it's hard to even consider it as much. We see some more fights during the Claire run, such as the encounters with Mr. Rex. These are pretty good too, but with Mr. Rex, it just really devolves into just running away and trying to get by him without him completely demolishing your body. So that being said, let's hop into the B run, see the differences between that run and the Leon run that we just went through previously. Following Claire, we enter the police station through the back, where a helicopter crashes into the side of the building, and an umbrella helicopter then drops a large container containing Mr. X inside, the perfect bioweapon, and he begins hunting Claire, or so we think. While exploring the station, Claire runs into Chief Irons and the corpse of his girlfriend, who he claimed to have killed as she was becoming zombified. Claire then checks the back rooms behind the office and finds Sherry, the small girl from earlier, and upon some convincing the girl that Claire's really there to help, Sherry claims to be looking for her parents. Running off after hearing a large noise, Sherry bolts and we find Chief Irons is gone, leaving a diary behind explaining his actions and covering for Umbrella. Upon finding the three cubes for the wall in the Chief's office, we find Sherry again, just chilling there again. Claire goes to the door and finds the Chief in a safe room, heading down to the sewers. Admitting to his transgressions, Chief Irons ex explains about the creation of the G-Virus, and how unlike the T-Virus, which needs the host to be dead before bringing them back to life, the G-Virus transforms alive humans into mutants themselves. He also informs Claire that Sherry Sherry is William Birkin's kid and that Mr. X was released by Umbrella to cover up for what had been occurring here, much like the bombing of the Spencer estate. After this massive lore dump, the chief gets yoinked by Birkins and is no longer with us, murdered by the monster he was covering up for. Finding Birkins on the catwalk below, Claire makes short work with her grenade launcher and Birkins falls into the abyss, and Sherry and Claire escape into the sewers. The two split off again a lot in this area, leading into the Umbrella labs and meeting a wounded Leon, running from Mr. X, and learning of Annette along the way. The fight occurs on a train elevator as before, but this time as Claire moves off to restart the elevator, it activates and goes further down on its own, leaving Claire to maneuver through power units and furnaces to find her way to the labs and Sherry in the reception room. Claire moves to activate the elevator and upon doing so, needs to head back to the power room in order to actually turn it on. Claire and Sherry are then cornered by Mr. X and now knowing of the G-Virus, Claire throws the pendant containing the vial of virus off of the edge, Mr. X going after it. Doing this causes a surge in the facility and the self-destruct sequence begins. We know that Leon's sitting on top of the catwalk right now, so it's kind of interesting to see how the two paths cross while not necessarily crossing in an invisible manner. The two rush to escape and reach the train, only to find out that they have to actually activate the train platform, which is now when the timer begins to show up, leading to five minutes left before the facility explodes. As we make it to the switch, Mr. X jumps down for one final battle. We see the shape of Ada toss Claire a rocket launcher, much like in the first, blow his ass at Kingdom Come. You lose, big guy. This means that Ada is not dead despite falling down a countless number of stories into literal nothingness, so it's safe to say she's going to be showing up later in the series as well. Leon joins them on the speeding train as we saw at the end of the run A to escape, only to have the train alert them of a biohazard on board. The three turn around to see a massive flesh monster that is the final form of William Birkin in the back of the train, slithering towards Leon. Leon unloads everything in the arsenal and once defeated, begins to disintegrate only to come back with a vengeance thereafter, ripping the train apart. The three working together, share 
Harry flipping the e-brake and the three sprint to the tunnel entrance. Now a bright and beautiful day outside as the explosion of the umbrella facility disintegrates anything from the tunnel and beyond. A vast difference from the dark and horrid night the three had just endured. The gang deserves some much needed rest, but Claire stands up, knowing it's not over until she finds her brother's Chris. We then fade to black. There is a ton going on here, and while once again, much like the first, a lot of it's working your way through winding corridors in one small area, solving puzzles and blasting zombies. However, unlike Resident Evil 1, where you wandered aimlessly for about three quarters of the game, here in Resident Evil 2, you are actually moving forward with some sort of purpose. For Leon, it's saving Ada and finding a way to escape while learning about Umbrella and the G-Virus along the way, and the betrayal at the end just adds all that insult to injury. Claire is found saving Sherry while learning of the deep roots that Umbrella has had in the city for a long time and that her brother is off to expose all the dirty laundry that they have, seemingly heading to Europe if that fax is to be believed, as well as the terrible experiments that occurred in the labs below, with this girl all in the middle of it. There's a lot of heart in this story, and while still holding on to the over-the-top nature we know Resident Evil for, it's a far more compact tale where the two paths weave between each other and touching in just the right ways. That's kind of hot. The story does change a bit if you do the characters in the opposite order, like Sherry being infected with the virus that grows mutants inside of her, which is pretty fucked up. But as a follow-up to Resident Evil 1, it's safe to say that the story it tells is demonstrably better than its predecessor. I like what Resident Evil 2 does here in setting up the continuation of the series with an obvious cliffhanger, meaning that Capcom knew that it would be making more of these titles. Whether they knew how many, that's unknown, but they knew that there was at least going to be another one for sure, and that the next title would actually come sooner than expected. To me, much like the first, if you could make it past the controls, this game is a must play, whether on original hardware or emulated on PC. If anything, to experience the roots of the series and where the fandom is truly born at. Resident Evil 2 is one of the best selling games upon its release, and rightfully so. Improving on the original in almost every way, it's easy to see why this game is a fan favorite then and now. And until next time, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Oh, oh you can't mean. Chris, I have to find you. Let's go ahead and start this video with a hot take. I don't like Resident Evil 3 at all. There, I said it. It's not that it's a bad game necessarily, but in my time playing it for this review, time seemed to absolutely slow to a crawl, a telltale sign of not having much fun. That being said, continuing the Resident Evil series, we're here to discuss Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Let's dive into Resident Evil Nemesis and dig into why I found this game to be the absolute worst in the series thus far. Taking place at the same time in canon as Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil Nemesis takes place in Raccoon City, this time following our protagonist of Resident Evil 1, Jill Valentine, as she makes her triumphant return to escape the now completely overrun and infested Raccoon City. Knowing all the secrets of the Umbrella Corporation and the lengths they will go through to cover up any outbreak, it's imperative she escapes, battling the hordes along the way. This game is the final of the PlayStation 1 trilogy, and while this game carries most of the mechanics forward from the past two games into this one, as well as the controls, there are a lot of changes to the core formula introduced here as well, one being ammunition crafting. We start the game with an ammo press in our inventory, an item which turns found gunpowder into usable ammunition. Mixing different types of gunpowder makes different types of ammo, from pistol to magnum, shotgun to grenade. Survival horror, as we discussed in the last two videos, have a few tenets that need to be followed in order to keep the tension alive, the main one of these being resource management. In the last two Resident Evil games, there was always a balance between finding and using ammunition and health items, such as herbs and first aid spray. While not always perfect, as I normally had a ton of both towards the end of the game, with Nemesis offering a new way of obtaining ammunition, not only does this lead to having a massive stockpile of rounds for all the firearms, but the addition of resources to pick up leads to a loop of gameplay that to me was just not very fun. As someone who absolutely needs to go and collect all the things, just in case I need them down the road, the amount of back and forth needed from the item box to different parts of the world to pick up gunpowder and other items leads to a loop of play that to me is just not very fun. Going from loot to save 
receiver room really added the padding to the runtime of Nemesis, which isn't even that long in the first place. And having too much loot to grab at one time really kind of brought on an anxiety inducing forethought, which just led me to running back and forth. The joy of the prior two games I had was making the choices of what to grab have now been ramped to the max here. While going back to the room to insert an item to progress the story felt like moving forward with the game. Going back to these rooms just to pick up two more gunpowders felt like I was more playing Squirrel Simulator than anything else, stocking up resources for the just-in-case moments that would hopefully never come. My box was absolutely so full by the end of the game, more so than any of the other two games thus far, that it was actually hard to find anything in there in the first place. With all this additional ammunition as well, the balance of the enemies keep the tension ramped up needs to be altered to coincide, with Capcom handling an honestly lazy way, and that is by upping the health of all the zombies throughout Raccoon City. While guns like the shotgun and grenade launcher still do a good amount of damage, the pistol in Nemesis is absolute trash, taking almost a full magazine to garner a kill on The Walking Dead itself, and that's just one of them. Between the additional use of your inventory slots, including the actual ammo press, that for some reason takes the space, and the bloat of ammunition and subsequent enemy health, I feel like creating ammo in this game, as presented here in Nemesis, more so detracts from the experience rather than help. While it's nice to craft some more magnum rounds to hopefully use down the road during a boss fight, the amount of space and items needed just don't weigh out in my opinion here. However, while there's a large blotch on the game in this mechanic, the other added mechanic works far better in building variety and adding tension to your escape from Raccoon City. You're saved. Down here! It's finally over. This new mechanic revolves around your hunter nemesis, the souped up version of Mr. X from RE2. We learn from the outset from Stars member Brad, the pilot from the first game, that there is a new mutant on the loose whose sole purpose is hunting down the members of the Stars unit, the special task force of Raccoon City who was present for the Spencer Manor incident. In an effort to keep their secrets hidden, Umbrella releases nemesis into the city to hunt down the remaining members of Stars, achieving its goal slowly but surely. As the only bio mutant we have seen that can also talk, it's obviously that there's some intelligence in that gray mushy head of is, announcing his presence by gutturally uttering his sole goal. Stars. Throughout the experience of RE3, you'll be running headlong into Nemesis multiple times, and in doing so, the game gives you options on what to do or how to react. While there is no right choice, both leading to the next story beat no matter which one you choose, the effect on how the next moments play out will change drastically. For example, Jill works her way up to the top of the clock tower to ring the bells and call the helicopter on standby to rescue her and Carlos, a member of the Umbrella cleanup team stuck in Raccoon City as well. Reaching the apex of the tower, Nemesis joins you, and the player is presented with two different options. One being to blind him with the floodlight, or one being to shock him with the open power line. If blinding is your choice, you send Nemesis over the edge of the tower, leading him to no longer follow you around the clock tower while you complete puzzles and activate and call the helicopter. If you choose to shock him, you do receive another part to your shotgun. However, Nemesis will eventually get up and continue to chase Jill in the area, making the movement through said tower pretty unsafe. Both options here are viable, one making you stronger and the other making the movement safer in the current location. However, the effects on the gameplay changed a lot, even in the subsequent boss fight later, where blinding him has him using more melee attacks while shocking him has him incorporating his rocket launcher more often. While each of these choices are binary, the scenarios that play out are pretty different, leading to a variety in your run through. This is much needed as the structure of movement through the world of RE3 was extremely boring in my opinion, due mainly into the setting of Raccoon City itself. While trudging my way through Raccoon City and its respective areas within, I couldn't help but find myself unimpressed with the play space on display here in Resident Evil 3. And looking back while writing this, I think I figured out my issues with it as well, that being the quality of the space and the containment of the play area. Looking back at Resident Evil 1 and 2, the Spencer Manor and the police station respectively, the ability to flesh out a fair, fairly enclosed space, making it feel winding and maze-like, rooms with secrets to uncover, hallways leading to death by zombie, each area feeling enclosed and yet infinitely accessible at the same time no matter where you are at in the game. Resident Evil 3 follows the same idea, however the long narrow alleys leading to small unlinked buildings where key items lie just don't 
don't feel conjoined together at all. Why would the medallions to open city hall be spread across the gas station, diner, and clinic? This disjointedness further compounds with the amount of alleys you have to walk through to get from place to place. Resident Evil 3 is a linear game, and while not bad per se, as most story-based games are in some respect linear, what the other games offered was the sense of exploration and discovery. You were dropped in an area and told to find keys to get behind locked doors and thus get to the underground and complete your mission. While the hallways act as the through line from room to room, with the nature of how buildings themselves work, this still made a lot of sense. Look at the map here in Resident Evil 3. Now that is a lot of long, narrow pathways, where the game essentially doesn't open up until you reach the park over halfway through the game. To me, this exposes the core of what makes the first two games so well regarded, as the manor and the police station not only are death traps to the player, but they feel real, explorable, and in collecting notes and context clues throughout this space, more like a character of the story of Resident Evil rather than just a setting. Resident Evil tries to buttress this with the amount of notes and collectibles being almost tripled in this game, even having their own collections paid. But with the lack of focus on any area or aspect of the story, it feels disjointed yet again, leading me to have little investment on knowing anything about the area that we're exploring itself. Raccoon City is a dangerous place, but to me, it was done dirty by blowing up the focus of the entire city itself, losing its sense of world building in the process. This issue will be corrected in later entries, and Capcom will eventually figure out how to do a big space but make it feel well realized, but I wish the focus was narrowed here a bit more. I understand the desire to go bigger in each entry, in order to grow in scope and keep the players engrossed in the next game, but in doing so, Capcom harmed what made the first two games so memorable, its setting. Between the feature creep that harmed the balance in the gameplay, and the lack of focus on the setting and growing of scope so far, I hate to say that the story doesn't pull its ass out of the fire either. When discussing Resident Evil games, it's safe to say so far that the story has never been anything too stellar, but Resident Evil 3 has probably the least out of all of them. Essentially, the main goal here is to escape, as Jill Valentine, first making your way to the police station to find some way to get out. We are introduced to Nemesis pretty quick, the game establishing the big bad right at the gate, which I both love and hate. In other games, you work your way up towards that big bad, but here in Resident Evil 3, he is dumped on you pretty damn quick, which hits hard at the gate, but as you make your way through the game, he becomes more of a nuisance than a nemesis. Let's see what I did there. Anyway, you hear a call from a mercenary group hired by Umbrella, with the lead guy named Carlos, working their way out of the city as well. Jill locates the team on a tram, with one being injured and one kind of being an asshole, and Carlos all sitting there planning the next move. And while she doesn't trust this new crew, she works with them to get the tram working, which will take the posse to the clock tower where the helicopter is meant to show up and take them out of the city itself. Doing so, Jill runs into Carlos a few times during their hunt for parts, and after saving her from Nemesis a few times, Jill begins to warm to the unknown Merc, creating a bond between the two. Once the tram is repaired, Nemesis strikes again, but one of the group, Mikhail, the one who's hurt, sacrifices himself, blowing a grenade and exploding the back tram car, causing all of them to crash into the clock tower. <laughs> Jill and Carlos ring the bells above, only to have the rescue chopper be shot down by Nemesis again, and then come in to fight the two on the ground. The duo defeat them again, but with Jill taking all the damage, because chivalry is dead in this game, she is now infected with the T-Virus. Carlos moves her to the chapel inside and heads to the Umbrella Labs to find a vaccine for Jill, finding out that his former boss that they thought had disappeared earlier was really a traitor at helping Umbrella and exploding the hospital in the process as Carlos escapes. <laughs> Stabbing Jill with the vaccine, the two look for another way of escape through the park, where Jill comes across a secret room in the cemetery. Learning of a missile strike to cover up the incident in of itself, taking Raccoon City off the map, Jill runs into Nikolai once again, doing bad guy Russian things, and fucks off when a giant mutated worm attacks Jill. After said worm is defeated, Jill finds a way to the waste disposal factory for Umbrella, and thus a helipad where her and Carlos can escape. The two fight their way there, arguing with Nikolai, fighting Nemesis a bunch more times, eventually killing him, and subsequently escaping at dawn. 
as the nuke makes an impact to the city behind you. I jumped all over this last part as that really is the crux of what this game has. I'm not really sure what role Nikolai even plays here in the story, and he feels forced that Compcom felt that there had to be some human bad guy in the end rather than just let Nemesis stand on its own. And while the end, Nemesis is a cool spectacle, it ends up being more of a gimmick fight, avoiding him until the railgun is charged over and over again, which once you figure that out, it's pretty anticlimactic as well. The main aspect of this story, which I did enjoy, was Carlos. While not overtly fleshed out as a character here, the avid dynamic of an umbrella-employed Merc helping Jill, who's determined to take the company he works for down as well, is a pretty interesting dynamic, and I only wish that there was more time to flesh him out either in this or another game. On the whole, though, while Resident Evil in the PS1 era wasn't known for its narrative it told, but in looking at the structure of Resident Evil 3, although considered mainline in the series, feels more like a side tangent to me, not moving the needle much in the overall lore progression of the story. This wouldn't be bad either if positioned this way, but with the next entry in the core series being this, I was disappointed and expected more out of the title for sure. With the core tenets of this game feeling the same as the prior two, along with the additions of ammo, choices, and the lackluster story, I couldn't help but just not enjoy this one as much. Is it still worth playing today in 2022 at the time of this recording? I mean, if you're looking for a quick romp and you're going through all these games anyway, it is the shortest thus far and thus you can probably finish it in about a day or so. However, with how many games in the franchise there are now, it's pretty hard for me to go back and recommend this today. I understand that Resident Evil 3 has its fans and I don't want to take away from that, but also if this is your favorite game in the series, I would love to hear why. But until next time, my name is Brendan and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. After the first three core games in the Resident Evil series in 2000, Resident Evil takes its next step forward, moving itself to the next generation of consoles, this time to the Sega Dreamcast. Now, this was a console exclusive only at launch, and later both a PS2 and a GameCube version came out in a kind of an updated form, sporting new cutscenes to flesh out more of the story. While acclaimed as one of the best Resident Evil games of the time, I don't really think it holds up at all today. In fact, I think this game kind of sucks. From the weapons to the storytelling, characters to boss fights, it all feels pretty lackluster compared to the other three in the series, and I didn't even like 3 all that much. In this video, I want to give a fair take on Code Veronica, as played on the PS2, the goods, the bads, and the outright confusing. Now with that, let's hop into Code Veronica. We open Code Veronica with a pre-rendered cutscene of Claire running through some Umbrella operatives, chasing her through a facility, helicopters opening up with chain guns, and eventually jumping down a staircase only to be captured by the soldiers down below. Over the scene we have a narrator recount the events that happened, learning Claire had infiltrated the Umbrella facility here in Paris three months after the Raccoon City incident, still looking for her brother Chris. The scene ends with Claire stuck in a jail cell in a different place altogether. This cutscene from the very beginning of the game kind of just rubbed me the wrong way, a feeling that would follow me throughout the rest of this game. This is mainly due to the tone set here being much more of an action focused title and having actual Umbrella being the bad guys here rather than the bio mutants this game has been known for thus far. This chase scene in the hallway with an IR camera helicopter dumping thousands of rounds into one girl does not carry what Resident Evil was all about. Resident Evil is slow, quiet, slowly building tension to a crazy finale with rocket launchers and massive bio weapons and here we are mag dumping from a helicopter at the main protagonist. Also, why was Claire looking for Chris on the 45th floor of a skyscraper in Paris. It just doesn't make any sense to me, with some additional explanation being woefully needed. Not that Resident Evil is known for its writing, and I applaud the effort of trying to flush out the world and continuing narrative thus far, especially with these recurring characters, but this just kind of feels lazy, like the scene was designed around the spectacle and not the other way around, something which will occur a few times throughout Code Veronica. However, unlike the other games in the series thus far, this is actually a lot of story and character progression here in Code Veronica, conveyed through rendered cutscenes and not just dialogue as the past game had before. As Claire escapes the prison cell and makes her way through the prison complex on Rockford Island, amongst yet another T-virus outbreak, we run into a fellow prisoner named Steve Burnside, who takes pot shots at Claire, thinking she's either Umbrella or a zombie. The two make fast introductions, and Steve runs off to find a way to escape by himself, having the every-man-for-himself mentality, a vast dichotomy from Claire. Despite the corny dialogue and sketchy voice acting in Code Veronica, something this series has been known for thus far, it is hard not to enjoy the main characters on display here, the main one being Claire, Steve, and Chris. Taking place three months after Resident Evil 2, you can see the growth of Claire's character and resolve, obviously much tougher than she was in Raccoon City. Seeing the risk she takes in the beginning cutscene, the playing the game of chicken with a helicopter gun, and staying collected while being shot at by Steve, it's safe to say that Claire
has developed into a bit of a badass here in Code Veronica. Having been through Raccoon City, though, would have made anybody grizzled in the face of zombies and psychopaths. On the other side of the scale, we have Steve. This Canadian hothead is the complete opposite of Claire. He's brash and whiny and pretty fucking annoying, epitomizing the scene where he steals the golden lugers needed to unlock the door in the Alexander Mansion, demanding Claire find him something that shoots fast to trade him for. He does begin to have a redemption arc, however. After clearing the path for Claire in the basement of the military base, Steve runs face to face with a shambling corpse of his father, the man he risked his life to find. Upon this revelation, we begin to see a new Steve, a young man now dealing with the trauma of the loss of his father, begins to have a renewed focus and commitment to getting out and helping Claire in the process. While after the first meeting, I struggled with Steve to enjoy him as a character due to his outright annoyingness and his overtly Canadian accent. I'm sorry, Canadians. After the revelation of his father, he begins to grow on me a bit more, even so much as I was hoping that the inevitable mild romantic connection felt pretty nice, albeit rushed as hell. The other playable character is Chris, Claire's brother and one of the Stars members from the original Resident Evil 1. While not so much changed from the first game, his resolve to stopping Umbrella is much deeper, and when obtaining the message from Leon in Resident Evil 2 about Claire's capture, Chris moves fast to save his sister. Although Chris is a pretty one-note character, your generic tough guy action hero, I can't help but just like him and watching him contend with his sense of duty in defeating Wesker and returning bad from Resident Evil 1 and Redfield's old commander, as well as his sense of duty to stop Umbrella and all their genetic experiments. The commitment really comes into full form when, at the very end of the game, moving to escape during the self-destruct sequence on the Antarctic base, leaves his sister, who he's there to actually save behind, to go and stop Wesker, and prevent his plans from furthering even more. Watching a man put his feelings and family literally to the side to complete the mission that he's been set out to do after the events of Resident Evil 1 is somehow commendable, and I'm here for it. A character doesn't have to be so deep and complex like an Arthur Morgan from Red Dead Redemption 2 to be enjoyable. He could just be a fucking cool guy, which is what Chris is. He's a fucking cool guy. And I like Chris a whole lot, and personally was happy to see his return after being out of the limelight since the original outing of Resident Evil. Code Veronica begins to do what prior games haven't so far, and that is to establish more of the characters in the Resident Evil universe, how they interconnect, and their impact on the world, which is important that we'll see these characters return time and time again. Hell, even Leon has a small mention here, shedding some light that what the rookie cop's been doing since, well, Resident Evil 2. Having been asked by Claire to get in touch with Chris means that the two seem to be kind of like a middleman connection between them, with Claire obviously keeping their bond alive months after the incidents in Raccoon City. However, the main protagonist from the first games collide also gives more credence to the connected world, which is much different outside of just mildly revisiting Jill in Resident Evil 2, hasn't been done yet in the series. While I enjoy these main protagonists, however, we need to set up the other players in the story, that being the antagonists, and this is where I get real lost in Code Veronica. We have two villains to set up here in Code Veronica, one recurring baddie and one new one, and neither here are all that great. The main bad here on Rockmore Island, as well as the subsequent Antarctic base, is Alfred Ashford, a crazed man whose family we learn is not only responsible for creating the Umbrella Corporation to an extent, but the original version of the T-Virus, known as the T-Veronica Virus, hence the naming convention of this game. Alfred as a character kind of sucks, with no real motivations other than stopping Claire and Steve because they are there. As Claire and Steve continue searching for a way to get off the island, they see a woman sitting in a room, claiming to be his sister Alexia. Giving chase, they find a wig sitting in the middle of the room and find Alfred hiding above them, revealing that he's actually suffering from a dual personality disorder, impersonating his sister as well. We learn through logs of the troubled history Alfred endured, his creation through genetic manipulation, along with his sister Alexia. Genetically modified to have superior intelligence, Alexia outstripped him in every way, making him the lesser of the siblings and making her essentially what can be known as a prodigy. And with that, his losing both of his father, Alexander, and sister to the T-Veronica virus through self-experimentation. Always playing second fiddle to his sister, he struggles with this, and while idolizing her, also seemingly resents her at the same time. While the backstory of Alfred is actually pretty great, it's told through miserable collectibles, so without these, you would have no idea how broken of a character he really is. Instead, coming across as a cross-dressing psychopath, not something like out of Dead Rising. Short of some disjointed flashback scenes of two creepy kids thinking something like straight out of Stephen King's The Shining, there's not really much here. Having all the backstory and missable collectibles, it really does just kind of feel disjointed if you're not actively searching for them. I always prefer the show and don't tell mentality and would like to actually see these implemented in game. However, we weren't treated as such, mostly due to the limitations of hardware at the time. At least I can imagine that. The other main bad that we need to set up here is Albert Wesker, returning from Resident Evil 1, who was also the main bad in that one as well. Wesker, no longer working for Umbrella, shows up here in order to locate a sample of the T-Veronica virus in order to take back for his own nefarious plans. Utilizing Chris and Claire, he makes his way to the Antarctic base to locate Alexia, who is now mutated by the T-Veronica virus. Amazed by the transformation, he leaves Chris and Claire to basically deal with her while he tries to steal a sample of the virus on the side. Now, the reason why he's taking this virus really isn't known. He's just kind of there to cause havoc 
can kind of be that antagonist for Chris. And while Wesker is such a cool fucking character, I wish that he was elaborated a little bit more in this game as instead of just kind of showing up and going, oh, I'm here. I'm going to steal this virus now. Chris, your sense of duty knows no bounds. It's just, I don't know. It just doesn't hit for me. Like I said, for being such a cool character in the Resident Evil lore, I wish that they had done more with Wesker here, which we will see in later games. So fear not. Like I said, it's not necessarily bad that he shows up much like Chris. He's just a cool generic bad guy. I just wish there was more reason for him to actually exist in this game. Following the theme of the villains themselves, the setting of Code Veronica suffers from the same disjointedness as the villains do. Much like the first two games in the series, we begin in one main location, only to move on to a more laboratory, industrial type scenery later, such as the Spencer Manor in the labs below, or the police station in the sewer labs. There's a lot of labs in these games. Beginning on Rockford Island, which as a location feels weird as well. Being an umbrella prison facility, this also houses a military complex, catacombs below that, a mansion where Alexi lives, and an underwater submarine base. This area feels like a bunch of mini areas kind of just shoved in one space. What it lacks the most, however, is character. Looking back at the Spencer Manor and at RCPD, these areas oozed with character, allowing the space to become arguably a main character of the series in and of itself. Resident Evil 3 did begin to lose this with the scope of the space it was playing in being an entire city, but Code Veronica just feels all over the place. All of these areas on the island are drastically different from each other, and to me, it just doesn't mesh very well. Couple this with the fact that they are so spread out from each other, not only makes each area feel really secluded and by itself, but it also makes backtracking feel way longer than needed, and you do a lot of backtracking in this game. After the main climax of the story, where they fly off an island in a plane, I don't know how they know how to fly it, and we end up in the southern ice cap of Antarctica, where yet again, another area that just feels kind of disjointed, with areas that look like a mansion, all of the Spencer Mansion, labs, and a giant ice sheet, which has some zombies underneath it. With the amount of differing locale visited here in Code Veronica, everything feels really slapped together to lead me to be pretty confused as to what was actually happening in the narrative, and making every area pretty unremarkable at best and severely disjointed at worst. The need to add more in different types of areas than the last few games had just didn't work for me here in Resident Evil, a series whose bones were built on interesting and thoughtful locations and creating a variety of space within the confines of a singular focus. Between Code Veronica and Resident Evil 3, the scope creep is on full display here, needing to make their locales varied and large in scope because that's what the trend is in video games, thus leading to each being less and less interesting. And while being bland sucks, they also host what may be the worst aspect of this game, the boss fights. I'm not here to oversell Resident Evil on its boss fight mechanics thus far. Given the control schemes and the fixed camera angles of tank controls and fixed cameras, the fights on display in this series, while a spectacle in the visual department and looks pretty good, all these fights do leave something to be desired. From the snake and tyrant to Resident Evil 1 to Mr. X and the multiple encounters with the mutated Birkin in Resident Evil 2, it was essentially just run away and shoot the guy in a small room. And while some of these encounters areas really sucked, a few of them had enough space to maneuver that actually made you feel like you had a chance to run away and regroup yourself. Code Veronica has none of any of that in these boss areas here. When fighting the tyrant, you're in the back of a tiny cargo plane, where you almost are always in range of his attacks, if not his charge attack, which can knock you off the fucking plane. This fight just straight sucks. While fighting Alexia, you're on a tiny square platform with her mutated form taking up one third of the space, and her ad she lets out at you, and there's a lot of them, taking up another third, leaving you just this tiny little area to actually try to maneuver in. The only fight that actually makes sense and feels okay is the Alexander fight on the helipad, but given the length of his attacks and the ability to just straight knock you off the edge and ending the fight real quick, this fight kind of sucks as well. And in these early Resident Evil games, the play space the boss was set in is what determines if the fight was going to be okay and fair, or miserable and terrible. And in Code Veronica, between the cramped arenas and bullshit mechanics these guys toss at you, including the insta-gibs of knocking you off a ledge, these boss fights are just not good, more so than the other bosses in the Resident Evil series thus far. And going back into all these games in the last few months, these early fights in the series are all pretty painful, but Code Veronica has taken the cake by far. Regarding the narrative of Code Veronica, much like the other games in the series so far as well, the main focal point is to, well, escape. As Claire, you work with Steven to move through Rockmore Island, learning about each other along the way, and while Steve is in search for his father, who we've learned through his recollections that he was learning what Umbrella was up to and hence being sent here as a prisoner, and subsequently mutated by the T-Virus. Coming to grips with the outcome, Steve helps Claire to escape, and as they board the cargo plane and take out the hunting tyrant, the plane diverts to an Umbrella base in Antarctica, where Alexia is hidden away. Learning of the plight of her and her brother Alfred, the two try to find a way out still, only to have Alfred awaken his sister, who captures the two and takes Steve to God knows where, and leaving Claire for dead. Not to fear though, as Chris is not far behind. Running into Wesker, the two learn about the Antarctica base and head there separately. Chris arrives to save Claire and begins looking for Steve, while Wesker is looking for Alexia to take the sample of the T-Veronica virus. We find Steve having been 
mutated by Alexia by said T. Veronica virus, and beginning to lose his mind to the mutation, attempts to subdue Claire, only to regain some semblance of humanity, as they express their love for each other in a very awkward scene, and regaining some semblance of humanity, attempts to stop Alexia in her path, and subsequently gets dead. Meanwhile, Chris and Wesker locate Alexia, with Chris taking her on as Wesker moves to escape, scooping up Steve's body along the way out. Defeating Alexia, Chris and Claire escape in a Harrier as the facility self-destructs. Once again, I don't know how they could drive a Harrier, and in typical Resident Evil fashion, get out in the nick of time. We know that this is not the last that we will see of these two, and as the story, while fairly simple in plot, I think works mostly for this type of game. It isn't a numbered entry, and as such, this game does a lot to more build up the lore of Umbrella, Wesker, and our protagonist at the same time. I like the introduction of Steve and actually seeing his loss and mutation gives some effect to someone close to you that tries to bear some emotional weight that the other games in the series have lacked thus far. With enough backstory to chew on as well, if you decide to search for it, Code Veronica from a narrative perspective is simple and pretty okay. I feel like I spent a lot of time dunking on Code Veronica, and in truth, I have. I didn't like this game very much, but that being said, these feelings really only exist because of the pedigree set by the ones before it. With lackluster level design, bizarre antagonists, terrible and rage-inducing boss fights, and lack of flow and cohesion with each location in the game, there are still nuggets to enjoy here. Seeing Chris and Claire again is a treat, and while Steve grated on my nerves at first, I do appreciate the attempt of giving something a little bit more emotional weight to the series in the loss of Steve. Coupling that with the lore built up in Code Veronica, there are still some nuggets of great littered and brown Code Veronica itself, as long as you're willing to subject yourself to the rest of the game has to offer. And with that, I want to put a bow on Code Veronica. But thank you guys always for watching, and as always, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. When playing through this series of the Resident Evil franchise, the last question I ever thought was, hmm, I wonder what Rebecca was doing before Resident Evil 1. Well, apparently Capcom thought we did, and thus Resident Evil Zero was made. And while playing through this, while not drastically offended by the game as a whole, it seems obvious to me that this game was made to test certain features, to throw shit at the wall to see if it worked or not. And for me, it mostly didn't. In this video, I want to discuss Resident Evil Zero, a black sheep of the franchise in my opinion, and one that messes with a lot of the core design tenets that Resident Evil built its bones upon as a series. Much like a house, when you mess with the foundation, the entire structure begins to basically split open and fall apart, revealing how integral a lot of these systems actually were. Let's dive into what makes this game forgettable at best and not good at worst. This is the Resident Evil Zero Retrospective. We open with a pre-rendered cutscene on a pretty fancy train, occupants having a good fancy old time as much as they could in 1998. As a swarm of very gooey leeches comes and attacks the train and attacking the passengers, we spot a man, a very grey man, watching the scene from the cliffside above, singing a haunting choir song, as the leech infection occurs below him. Two hours later, we see the helicopter of the RCPD's Stars Bravo team zipping over the forest, here to investigate reports of cannibalistic murders and animal attacks here in the Arclay Mountains, a fact we learn in the original game of the series. Rebecca, along with the rest of the team, comes the forest to stumble upon an MP van, or military police for those uninitiated in military lingo, the soldiers killed and its prisoner, Billy Cohen, nowhere to be seen. Assuming that Billy himself had killed the MPs and escaped off into the forest, Captain Enrico tells the team to search for Billy as well, as he is armed and dangerous and was wanted for murdering a bunch of villagers while deployed overseas. Rebecca wanders alone, which I'm pretty sure is against all police procedures, and stumbles on the train we saw before, and upon exploring is attacked by Resident Evil tried and true zombies. We begin to explore the train, finding Billy in the process, and upon saving her from a leech man on the upper deck of said train car, the two begin a tenuous relationship to escape the train and let stars know what's happening in the forest. While exploring, we run into giant scorpions, more zombies, more leech boys, and puzzles galore. I like the setting of this abandoned train as the detail in this area is absolutely stellar, and the puzzles really do feel akin to something in the Spencer Mansion. Nothing out of the box for Resident Evil, mostly just searching for keys, items, and a zipline gun to explore higher areas with no ladder access. This area feels pretty realized, and while the space is a series of cramped train compartments, it's pretty fun to explore. However, we're also introduced to not one, but two of the drastic changes here in this outing of Resident Evil, both of which I'm not a big fan of. Up until this point, the item box has been a staple of the franchise, located in safe regions of the play space and allowing the players to drop off unneeded items and materials to free up more slots for other stuff like key items, health, and ammo. We lose the box in its entirety in here in Resident Evil Zero, and in its stead, we're given the ability to drop items on the ground to be picked up whenever they're actually needed. This change to me just pretty much 
much sucks and adds to a convoluted mess of systems when grabbing items you need. Not only do the item box serve as a storage space for the players, stashing away items like pack rats looking for nuts on a rainy day for when they're actually needed, but it also created a place of respite and relaxation, an area that was essentially safe for the player, an area that where you could save, unload your stuff that was unwanted at the time, and plan your next run out into the zombie infested area. Instead, you choose basically wherever you want that you think may be safe, toss your shit on the ground, and run back to said room whenever you need it, sometimes all the way across the map, rather than from another item box closer to your location. This leads to vast amounts of backtracking, which I know is a staple in Resident Evil, but there's a certain way of doing it, and in this game, it just made it feel convoluted and messy, to say the least. And with each item tossed on the ground marked on your map, this became a vast quantity of visual clutter, both on the map and on the floor in which you stored your items. There were a number of times in my playthrough when searching for a key item or a first aid spray in order to continue forward that you would have to sift through all the bullshit you dropped on the floor. Your rat pack collection of crap sprawled around the central area of the play space you're currently in to try to minimize as much running back as you possibly could. This type of inelegance when designing an item system makes me wonder why this method was taken rather than the item box we were so used to in the series thus far and pretty much worked. There's an argument to be made that this approach is quote unquote more realistic. However, I do contest that this is a game where leech men have turned into humans and there's also zombies and leech has taken the form of more humans and also this is a fucking video game that is meant to at least have some mild enjoyment of playing. Realism when it comes to item management sucks and with a game's main purpose being to entertain I just don't understand this change. Not to mention we lose the amazing savory music that we've been so used to in the Resident Evil franchise thus far which is a tragedy in and of itself. The second major change comes with the quote unquote buddy system that is the introduction of two characters being controlled in the game. In Resident Evil Zero you play as both Rebecca and Billy each with their own pros and cons Billy being able to deal and take more damage while Rebecca can mix herbs together in typical Resident Evil fashion and create more healing style. And to be honest this mechanic had some promise albeit this rendition is pretty clunky. With a simple press of a button you can swap between either character at any time in separate rooms anywhere on the area to solve puzzles, explore, and killing zombies. And while this does lead to interesting interactions with the game world and puzzle solving, Billy giving Rebecca a boost here and there and Rebecca being able to mix all the healing items for the pair that they need, I found it to be a lot more frustration than there were payoff moments. For example, when one character dies, you get the game over, pretty self-evident. However, with the AI being as clunky as it is and only being able to move and shoot, there was almost no reason to leave the other character behind unless the progression dictated that you must. It also seems that this game was meant to be a co-op experience and according to some prototypes that I was reading online, it was. Now this would have been infinitely better to give the option of co-op, especially realizing at the time that co-op was king. Keep in mind this came out in 2002, a year after Halo 1 and a bunch of other games that were supporting co-op had come out on. However, this was not meant to be, more than likely due to hardware limitations on loading two areas of a map at once, utilizing the split screen, as online really wasn't that prevalent at the time. Instead, the two character system feels clunky with item swapping taking what felt like a million button presses and item management being made that much more cumbersome with two inventories to keep track of rather than one. And while I respect the idea, something we will see more fleshed out coming in Resident Evil 5, this in this game feels like a pretty big miss. Not to mention horror of any variety is diminished with more good guys on screen or in real life. Gameplay wise, minus these two major changes are pretty much the same as it ever was. Fixed camera angles, inventory management, herbs, biomutants, and kind of lackluster shooting. So if you've seen or played any other Resident Evil games, you pretty much know what to expect here. As we move through the train, Umbrella agents infiltrate the main engine car and start the train up again while under orders from Wesker to move the train for further investigation on what occurred and how the T-Virus made it to the train. As the leeches envelop the Umbrella soldiers, Billy and Rebecca stop the train and depart, entering an abandoned Umbrella training facility used to train new executives and workers and researchers to the company to a secret goings on, otherwise known as Biomutant Research. Moving through the training area, chemical plant, attached church, and water treatment area, we learn of the creation of the T-Virus, or as it was originally termed, the Progenitor Virus, founded by Umbrella's co-founder, Dr. James Marcus, who after supplanting the T-Virus into a series of leeches, was assassinated by Wesker under the orders of Oswald Spencer of the Spencer Manor, also known as the other co-founder of Umbrella, in order to steal said virus. As Billy and Rebecca have learned what happened, they begin to learn more about each other, much like a buddy cop movie. Billy being accused of war crimes for murdering innocent villagers, and Rebecca just being a stars member. Not following the orders of killing them, the massacre was pinned at his feet and he was wrongfully tried for said crimes and was 
in transit, assumingly to be taken to the firing line. It is here that we need to discuss Rebecca and Billy for a moment, and the vast opportunity wasted here. If you're a veteran of the series, you remember Rebecca from the Chris playthrough of Resident Evil 1, the rookie stars member and a medic of the team, who concocted the antidote for Chris, helped murder the evil Plant 42, and learned to play the piano to open the door while by practicing while in the middle of a zombie-ridden mansion. So the idea of visiting her again in this prequel title, you would think that there would be a little bit more fleshed out about her and her character, and if you assume that, you would in fact be wrong. Rebecca is just kind of thrust in this entire scenario with little fanfare, and after saving her from the leeches, just decides to blindly trust somebody who she believes has murdered a bunch of people in cold blood. Billy gets a little bit more exposition here, giving his backstory as to why he was there, but even then, not much is really expounded upon about it. A series of foils for the players to interact with the world itself. Positioned as a prequel to learn about what occurred before the Spencer Manor incident, you would think that there would be a few more ties to the original game as well, and there really just wasn't. I'm sure I'll hear in the comments how wrong I am, and please leave them down below, as I very much could have missed something in all this. I'm not expecting Yakuza Zero treatment here, which acted as a prequel to that entire series and really flushed out how Kiryu and everybody got their starts. But some tethers here would have been nice. While learning more about Umbrella and its founding, as well as the creation of T-Virus is cool, that information does boil down to lore, which you don't need a full game to do. And to be clear, I think the lore buildup around Umbrella is pretty fucking dope. Learning of the creation of the T-Virus using the leeches to be the original carriers is interesting, and the betrayal of the co-founders is fascinating as well. And the inclusion of Wesker and Birkin from Resident Evil 1 and 2 allows for the characters we know to grow a bit more. However, how is Wesker and Birkin looking at the events of Resident Evil 0 while supposedly Wesker is with the STARS unit, more than likely prepping for the Surge of Bravo team after their chopper went down? It does raise some questions in the continuity of the timeline. It's a small nitpick from somebody who's looking too hard into things, but it did bother me a little bit, but you know. One thing that has been the focus of the last videos has been the setting of these games, and honestly, I like the areas here in Resident Evil 0 as a set piece. As mentioned before, the train feels a lot like a condensed version of the Spencer Manor for me, and while exploring the training facility and seeing the lecture halls of Umbrella with its libraries and laboratories full of genetic experiments and creating bioweapons is pretty cool and harrowing at the same time. The amount of detail in the scenery is pretty impressive for the time as well, having moved away from pre-rendered backgrounds of the first three games and now having a fully rendered in-engine like Code Veronica. For this video, I was playing the HD version of this game, which allows for much more dynamic and better lighting and a little bit more texture polish here as well, as it is the easiest way to play these games from coming to modern consoles and PC. I like the look of Resident Evil Zero a lot personally, and unlike Code Veronica, the locations of Zero do make a bit more sense location-wise. With the church only being the real outlier here, having the entire umbrella training facility, chemical storage, and water treatment areas connected feels intentional and meant to be mushed together as opposed to Code Veronica, which had a military base, a mansion, a submarine base, and then going to Antarctica. Just that one felt like all over the place where Zero feels a lot more condensed like you would actually go to these places. Like it was all part of one facility. And there's a ton of environmental storytelling here as well, from seeing the humanoids in test tubes, gas chambers for failed experiments, and different areas housing different bioweapons all give depth to the location of Resident Evil Zero. On that note, this game nails it out of the park, and while I wish I had some better characters here, keeping with the first Resident Evil traditions, these locations become more of a character in and of itself. And while I'm not hitting the bar of the Spencer Manor or RCPD station, it, this one is pretty good to me, and honestly far better than Code Veronica ever could be. While the location itself is pretty good, Resident Evil Zero feels drastically lacking in anything actually narrative related. Short of the cutscene in which Wesker and Birkin see the Leech Marcus, Billy's backstory, and the confrontation of Leech Marcus at the end, it doesn't feel like anything has actually happened here in Resident Evil Zero. It comes across as Billy and Rebecca wandering the halls trying to find a way out. We do run into Captain Enrico while searching for Billy, who got knocked into the water by a biomutant ape, and he tells Rebecca they are meeting at the mansion as she runs off to find Billy, but short of that, nothing really happens other than solving puzzles, killing zombies, leechmen, and multiple bosses, all of which are basically mutated animals, the original tyrant and the leech queen not included. The bosses here are pretty easy as well, not posing too much of a challenge, which was a kind of another gripe that I had with this game as a whole. That would be the difficulty curve of the leechmen scattered around the area. In short, fuck these guys. If you have molotovs, they're not much of a problem, minus the incredibly long wind-up time to toss one, and you need three to kill them. But if you're just blasting away in the tight corridors, these guys are tankier than anything in Resident Evil 
level so far, including some of the bosses, leading to multiple deaths to these assholes as well, cause they pack a fucking punch. So much so that by the midpoint of the game it was more viable to just take the hit and run by them more often than not, avoiding these confrontations altogether. And while that does work for resource draining and creating tension, there are certain points where there are like three or four back to back, and needless to say, highly frustrating to basically running around expending everything to kill three guys. I like hard games, the challenge isn't bad, but throwing a ton of super tanky enemies just back to back isn't good game design and just plain sucks. The last encounter with the Leech Queen, however, was a pretty cool fight and stand out in my opinion. Having a large space to work in, this fight does utilize both character mechanics pretty well, Rebecca opening locks to open the skylight, while Billy tries to keep her distracted by peppering the boss with bullets. With a wide open play space to this boss, while gimmicky is still satisfying to do, and the change of pace with not actually killing the boss with your guns and ammunition, but having interaction with the map itself was pretty cool in my opinion. Losing the trope of just blowing things away with a rocket launcher at the end of Resident Evil game. All in all, this fight was pretty awesome, and with most boss encounter arenas being more open like this one, it really didn't lead to any of those feeling nearly as unfair or frustrating as Code Veronica, which is a good thing. After defeating the Leech Queen, Billy and Rebecca escape into the forest, and after a touching scene of Rebecca taking Billy's dog tags and declaring him dead, allowing him to escape and roam free, we see her head down to what we now know as the Spencer Mansion to enter and begin the events of Resident Evil 1. And while there are parts I enjoyed my time with Resident Evil 0 from the locations, lore building, and boss fights, this game did a pretty good job, in my opinion. However, with the item box change being as abysmal as it was, the two character mechanics feeling more cumbersome than they needed to be, and with almost no story or characterization dragged this game down for me a lot in my opinion, making it honestly more of a slog to play in the moment to moment than any other game in the series thus far. I respect the desire to change up the formula, and as we will see in Resident Evil 4, it can be done with variable or even in that case, pretty good success. However, that did not hit with this outing of the Resident Evil franchise by far. This game is a mixed bag for me for sure, but this is just one man's opinion. And stay sexy, stay awesome, and as always, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. This is simply the best survival horror game ever created. In fact, had it come out in 2004, it would have been my pick for game of the year. If you don't own Resident Evil 4, it owns you. An absolute must have. 9.5 IGN. Simply put, Resident Evil 4 is the tightest, most accessible game in the series and one of the best games out there. Games Radar, 100. There are no flaws in Resident Evil 4. It is the greatest horror game to date. I never thought a game, or a movie for that matter, could deliver pulse-pounding action in such an awe-inspiring way. March 2005, page 134 of Game Informer. These are just some of the overwhelmingly glowing reviews of Resident Evil 4 from its release in 2005. Heralded as one of the best games ever made and one of the best in the Resident Evil franchise, it's here that I must kind of contend with these statements. As I am writing this in 2023, I'm kind of mixed on Resident Evil 4 as a whole, and with hindsight being at our disposal here, I have to say that in playing this, it's easy to see why Resident Evil went the way it did, an action-packed romp leaving the horror behind that we had seen in the last outings of the series. This is a retrospective on Resident Evil 4 and why this game almost killed the franchise despite it actually being a great video game. Now with that, on with the video. Where's everyone going? Bingo? We open our returning hero, Leon S. Kennedy, no longer a rookie cop in Raccoon City, but working for the federal government on a mission to locate and rescue the president's daughter, Ashley Graham, with her last known location being in a backwater Spanish province in Europe. Being driven by two policia, the three spat back and forth, shit-talking each other the entire way while heading to where Ashley was last seen. I love this beginning scene of Resident Evil 4 as we get to learn a lot about Leon's character and see how he's grown and evolved since the last time we saw him in Resident Evil 2. No longer a rookie cop who was showing up on his first day of the job, we see a much more confident Leon snarking back with the police but focused on the task at hand. The silent determination as well as his obvious improvement in skill given how he now works for the federal government and for the president directly shows his growth and abilities as well as some rookie cop wouldn't be hand selected by the president if he didn't have the skills to step up to the job. This gap of seven years also allows for the player who is an old hat at the series to wonder what he's been doing all this time. Not only that but Leon was given some real stylish flair here in this outing of the series, supporting the appropriate emo haircut and slick fur trimmed coat, this ability to make the character stand out amongst any others thus far. I mean, let's face it, this version of Leon is iconic and really sticks with you, making him recognizable to anybody with even slightly play video games, and short of maybe Claire, it may, might be the most fleshed out in the Resident Evil franchise as a whole. A true ode to the power of Resident Evil 2. I love Leon in Resident Evil 4, and as a character truly carries this game forward with his blend of seriousness as well as camp. I swear this guy has more quips than in any given situation that give this game a 
much harm not seen in any other Resident Evil game before or after. From... Where's everyone going? Bingo? To... So maybe you have nine lives, but it doesn't matter now, Mr. Kennedy. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? Hmm. Say whatever you please. Die, you worm! <laughs> The ability for Leon to thread the camp with the supernatural and disturbing is masterful. It is a trait I hope is carried forward in the upcoming remake, as it wasn't in 6 for god's sake. As we approach the nearby house, pistol in hand, there's a sense of eeriness surrounding the forest. It's quiet, the sound of leaves crunching beneath your foot as you take each step forward. There's a feeling that you're being watched. I mean, there's a whole cutscene where you're actually being watched from inside a house. Entering said house, we see a villager stoking a fire in a fairly dilapidated home. Leon asks if you see Ashley anywhere, holding her recent picture, and in response, the villager grabs a scythe and takes a swing at Leon, yelling and not listening to anything he has to say or shouting. This is where we're given the first taste of combat here, which leads us into the gameplay changes in Resident Evil 4, and there are a metric shit ton. Up until this point, Resident Evil has had a style of gameplay that really has never changed since its original outing in 1996, that being the utilizing of tank controls and aiming in the general direction of an enemy to shoot, requiring no true aiming skill that was really just, you know, point and click. Resident Evil 4 not only changes the combat in these games, but the interaction with the world as a whole. Long gone are fixed camera angles we had been used to up until this point, instead falling Leon finally over the shoulder, being ingrained in his perspective, and now bringing the series forward into the playstyle that we now have in tons of games today. This was definitely not the first game to do the third person over the shoulder, but for this drastic of a change and how these games are played, it made it a ton easier to actually interact with. I mean, hell, I've spent so much time playing every other game in the series thus far, it was a kind of drawing to go back to a moderately modern style of gameplay. Because of the change to a truly third person perspective, combat has now become more tactile as well, giving the player to ability to aim at said enemies, leading to the all-important headshot become a skill-based advantage, rather than a chance you had in the prior games, where no true aiming action Actually existed. One aspect of the gunplay which I do feel goes underserved and under talked about is the inclusion of a laser attachment on every weapon of the game, essentially a reticle that you would typically find in most third person shooters like Gears of War or Uncharted. However, using the laser, this keeps reticle to be actually needed, something which I wish more games would actually adapt, much like Dead Space. It also acts as a visual indicator of the sway when aiming, once again visually the impact of your upgrades, which you can do to every gun in the game. More on that later. One aspect which I did struggle with is the insistence on Resident Evil to force the player to play and shoot, rather than shoot on the move. With the amount of enemies this game actually throws at you, the lack of ability to move and shoot at the same time feels foreign to me, a choice which I can only assume was implemented to keep the tension alive when taking a shot, making each round you fire a distinct choice, rather than just spraying bullets downrange. And while it really does work in that regard, it still felt weird when actually playing, as humans and 98% of video game protagonists can move and shoot at the same time, sacrifice sacrificing accuracy for mild mobility. The other major change in the combat, and to the interactions within Resident Evil 4 as a whole, were the introductions of contextual prompts for Leon to interact with the world. For example, no longer your two options, shoot a guy or run away. Shooting a villager in the knees staggers the poor bastard, stunning him for just long enough to allow Leon to perform the follow-up kick attack, knocking the poor infected villager on his ass, allowing for a further bevy of options, from the stabbing of the knife, to conserve ammo, blasting him away, or simply running at that point. Not only that, but when grabbed by an enemy, a cute QTE or button prop event pops up for the player to perform or get killed. Quick time events or QTEs were a staple in gaming back in the mid 2000s, forcing the player to fully stay engaged with the experience rather than kicking back and enjoying a cutscene. The desire was not only to keep that engagement alive, but also to allow for quote unquote player agency in areas of the game that used to just be a video that played out for you. And while at the time it did work on me pretty well and the use of QTEs were fun to me, Resident Evil 4 uses a lot of them, and many of them being instant game overs as they are intended to kill Leon rather than giving you a chance to actually survive. They really did begin to wear on me after a while here in 2023. From running from a boulder, dodging the gigantor troll fucker, or the CQC fight with the late game boss Jack Krauser, failing any of these leads to an instant death and forcing the player to go back to the last save, all for missing a button prompt which just kind of plain sucks. This is the whole other side tangent, but I'm glad that these are gone from games as button mashing, although it will not be the last we'll see it in Resident Evil, don't really enter the franchise that much anymore. The 
inventory system got a drastic overhaul as well, and not knowing where this fits in with the rest of the video, I feel the need to talk about it now. I'd be remiss if not to discuss it, as it may be the Shining Star mechanic in this game that was never revisited until the la latest outing in Resident Evil 8. Past games designated 6-8 to eight slots where you stored your weapons, ammo, meds, and the like. While in later games, some of the long-barreled firearms would end up taking two slots, there was nothing that complex, just managing what you brought with you and what you placed in the item box. Well, once again here in Resident Evil 4, we have no item box. However, with the inventory case Leon has, there's almost no need. And the creation of what essentially amounts to a minigame of Tetris with your items not only makes you think about what you have and what you can grab, but also how it sits in your case as well. Essentially, you're given a grid of boxes. Each item takes up a required number of slots. One slot for herbs and grenades, going all the way up to like a 2x12 for the sniper rifle and another 2x1 for the required optic. Couple that with the 2x1 slots for ammo, combined herbs and first aid sprays, and you're in for a good deal of time working solely on your inventory, rotating and slotting in as much as you can to fit in the small defined space. I love this style of inventory management, as you essentially get to play another game just to make all the stuff fit. And with the satisfying clicks and turns and the feeling of min-maxing your inventory, it's an amazing system which I really wish carried over to the rest of the series. I am glad a style of it sort of came back for Resident Evil 8, however Capcom needs to keep that going for sure in whatever outing of Resident Evil we have next. <laughs> But for now, we really need to return to Leon. Post the attack from the villager, along with his buddies, and I guess maybe his wife, we make our way to the village. Scoping out the area beforehand, we see one of the police members burned on the pyre in the middle of town, and without the invitation to the wiener roast, Leon dispatches the villagers in a tense fight to immerse the player in learning the combat or die. It's safe to say that this area is probably the most memorable in the entire game, with its interwoven interiors full of ammo and a shotgun, as well as subsequent healing items, cows, pigs, chickens, and eggs. And bad guys. Lots and lots of bad guys. Guys. We also get the introduction of the Chainsaw Bagman and mass amounts of enemies rushing Leon around every turn. This area is an absolute nail biter. The village may be one of the best designed combat arenas as well, so when the bell chimes and all the villagers leave, you're still left with the tension as the title card rolls. With this being my like dozenth playthrough of this game, this area still hits. However, in looking back, this area really should have served as a precursor to what the series was going to be gameplay wise, and in hindsight, it probably wasn't the best choice. In playing through the other games in the series for this video, there's a formula how tension is created, that being the drastic limited resources in both ammo and health, along with the tight corridors and enemies that can absolutely take a beating, draining said resources in the process. The player is meant to always feel on the back foot and when engaging in combat and whether it's actually a good choice to do so or not. And in playing Resident Evil 4, I never really felt that tension anymore. You get tense in a engaging in combat sort of way, much like how you do in Halo or Gears of War, basically just worried about maximizing your uptime for murder, knowing that there will be more more ammo and meds on the other side of the fight. I played through a normal which players have to go through in order to get to the hard difficulties and in here I was just constantly finding ammo, health, treasure, money and the like, losing that feeling of needing to choose my fights as I now had the ability to just blast through everything in my way. This is further realized with the introduction of the shopkeeper in Resident Evil 4 and while he may be the best shop owner in all of video games, this addition once again poses an issue when it comes to balancing and keeping tension that is in a Resident Evil staple and survival horror. Throughout the runtime of RE4, you find various treasure items along the path, and often offset path, which can be sold to the shopkeeper for a variety of items, most notably guns, first aid sprays, and most importantly, weapon upgrades. In prior games, you would be able to find gun parts like muzzle brakes or pistol stocks to improve the stats on the gun in some sort of arbitrary way the game never really told you. In Resident Evil 4, not only are you able to find and purchase said attachments in order to make your guns better or have less sway, but you also have the ability to upgrade the stats with the gun as well. For from ammo, passy, reload speed, and damage. Now, to be clear, I do enjoy this feature in Resident Evil 4, as it is fun having that side goal to work for, and seeing the progression of Leon in the form of upgrading his weapons is pretty satisfying, much like a Skinner box and poking the button and getting the treat. However, to the mid end game, after you have a few weapons fully upgraded, for me it was the shotgun and the sniper rifle, you're just able to kind of blow everything away with relative ease, making the end portion of the game and incidentally, the more combat heavy sections kind of a joke. Well, this seems like a minor nitpick 
nitpick in the grand scheme of this game that is absolutely beloved. This upgrade mechanic left me feeling bored by the end of Resident Evil. All the tension that was even there for the combat just stripped away in the mass shootout with villagers and gatling guns and me one tapping everybody until the bubbling goo that they were just spilled upon the floor. As a long time lover of the franchise, I have to admit it was deflating to feel the horror just kind of disappear. And with the success of this game from critics and the audience alike, is it really a surprise looking back at all of these combat arenas that were thrown into Resident Evil 4 and see why Capcom went the way they did with 5 and 6? A change to the formula of a video game franchise is never a bad thing, and keeping the series fresh is, I'm sure, a hard thing to do. But by the end, it really didn't feel like Resident Evil anymore. It just had this sad realization in this last playthrough that this game was really kind of the death of a franchise for a while. I don't know, it was hard to come to grips with, hence why we're making the video. And all this said, and we haven't even touched the story so far. So with that, let's get into the meat and potatoes of Resident Evil 4's story, which, you know, is also still pretty good. No longer will the United States think they can police the world forever. So we kidnap the president's daughter in order to give her our power and then send her back. No. After the mass amounts of combat that is the village area and heading off to find Ashley, Leon runs into Luis, captured by the cult, and soon after becomes captured himself and subsequently infected with the parasite known as Los Plagas or the Plague. <laughs> I'm unable to resist this intoxicating power. <clears throat> After waking up with Luis, we learn that Luis was once a cop from Madrid, as well as the main researcher for the cult, essentially cultivating Los Plagas, which has also have infected the entire village and everybody on the island. The two go their separate ways, and after finding a giant mutated sea monster, as well as the gigantic orange troll fucker, Leon finds Ashley locked away in the tower of the cult church, much like Rapunzel, but without the hair. Also, I believe that she's voiced by the same person who voiced Emma Emmerich from Metal Gear Solid 2, so I guess she really has a type of voice acting. Upon freeing her, we run into Oswald Sadler, the cult leader, and as you could tell by his fancy purple robes, who reveals that he's injected Los Placas into Ashley as well, who will then be controlled into injecting the president with the sample as well, beginning his quest to dethrone the United States as the world leader and begin his quest to control the globe. You see, Los Placas acts as sort of a mind control parasite over the infected, as we will see with Leon multiple times throughout the game when we run into Sadler. The two jump through a window making their escape and head to a cabin where the extraction chopper is meant to come and pick them up. This section of the game, and honestly whenever Ashley is around, turns this game into a glorified escort mission, another trope of the mid-2000s, where Leon must protect, direct, and guard Ashley from either dying or being taken away by the cult. And while a drain on your health resources to keep two people alive instead of one is a nice bit of item management and engagement added to the mix, escort missions have always pretty much sucked, as AI really struggle to keep in lockstep with the player, leading to frustrating bouts of Ashley being stuck on walls, stuck on steps, Ashley dying, or being parted away and in general just slowing down the entire flow of the gameplay. You can tell her to hide in a box, but it's faster just to run through. Resident Evil 4 is absolutely best when she is not around, and thankfully there's a quite a bit of runtime in this game where she is just completely MIA. Reaching the cabin, the duo meet up with Luis again, and after their chopper is discovered to have been shot down, a swarm of villagers come to attack and are subsequently dispatched by Leon and Luis. Luis runs off into the night, off to go look for something to help, and Ashley and Leon make their way to the gondola, taking out the captain with this cool fake guy in the, in the process and make their way to hopefully somewhere safe. It is here we meet the acolyte of Sadler, the most confusing part of the game for me, Ramon Salazar, a small boy-like person who lives in a giant castle in the middle of the woods in Spain. Now the whole thing doesn't really make much sense, and while this part is memorable for sure, due to the aesthetics of the castle and Salazar as a character, the entire arc of him kind of feels like a bizarre side tangent to the entire story. My, my, we've got a feisty one. If you care for your own well-being, I suggest you surrender yourself and simply become our hostage. Or Mr. Scott, you can give us the girl because you're not worth a penny, I'm afraid. You can die. I'm never turning into one of them. Never. Got that right. We'll find a cure. 
After coughing blood up, Ashley begins to run away from Leon, only to be captured by Salazar himself and taken away, forcing Leon to make his way through said castle in an effort to find her. On the way to reaching Ashley, Leon runs into Luis one more time, providing him with a serum to slow the infection growth inside both himself and Ashley, as well as providing a sample of Los Plagas. Unfortunately, this is the end of our friend Luis, murdered by Sadler, who takes the sample away, as well as taking away Leon's main ally on this godforsaken island. <laughs> I have the sample. You serve me no purpose. Sadler! My boy Salazar will make sure you follow the same fate. <laughs> We also meet returning character Ada Wong, who we learn is on the island to locate said sample of Los Plagas as well, sporting her typical red dress and working in the shadows for a group called The Organization. We do learn a bit about Ada's mission and side content after beating the main story, boiling down to how she secretly helps Leon from the shadows while working with Wesker to find the sample of the parasite for themselves. While it's pretty fun to play as Ada, it basically just boils down to the bit of her story and mild substance provided to the world at large. Bit of advice, try using knives next time. Works better for close encounters. Leon. Long time no see. Leon eventually reaches Ashley, but is unable to get to her. This is where we, the player, take the role of Ashley in an effort to make it through the dungeons and flipping switches in order to escape. This scene is actually pretty fun, as you're armed with nothing but the ability to throw lanterns and crawl through tight spaces. This really breeds tension and having a minimal way of defending yourself. It really is a great change of pace to everything we've done so far. It is short-lived, however, as the two are eventually reunited and they locate the machine to basically rip the infection out of them, relieving them of Sadler's plan of my control and killing the president with a bug, I guess. You sure you want to do this? Yeah. All right. Here goes nothing. How are you feeling? Like a million bucks. I thought you were gonna die. Alright, guess I'm up. Soon after, however, Ashley is once again caught and taken to the military base on the other side of the island. Leon, with the help of Ada, kills Salazar and heads to the base as well, and with the help of his new helicopter buddy, who just shows up to try and save them, takes all the villagers in the military base to task. This is where the action really ratchets up to like one million with explosions, gabbling guns, tons of enemies, and exploding walls coming to the fort, losing literally every sense of horror and dread that this game may have held on to. We also fight Leon's ex-comrade, Jack Krauser, someone who the game acts like we should know and if you played i guess the dark side chronicles light gun rail shooter on wii you might because we all played serious games on the wii back in the day sidebar i first played resident Evil 4 on the wii and no cap that is probably the best damn port of this game out there however i do wish more was done with krauser here as he kind of just shows up with the player expecting to know who he is because this is evidently a huge revelation to leon i'm sure i'm missing something here so let me know in the comments down below and no i'm not playing a light gun game for the wii in 2023. I do hope that they flush this out more in the remake, but obviously we'll have to wait and see at the time of recording this. After more fights with new BOWs in the base, Leon is able to reach Ashley, and we move to the final encounter with Sadler, who is now transformed into a massive biomutant in typical Resident Evil fashion. With the help of Ada and cranes with support beams attached to them, Leon is able to defeat said cult leader of Sadler, and as he plummets to his death, Ada snatches up the Los Plagas sample and tosses Leon keys to a jet ski while she leaves in the helicopter above in the sky is her mission, now complete, and departs the island. Ashley and Leon make a break for the jet ski and escape the island as the self-destruct sequence inevitably goes off. Once again, a trope in the Resident Evil series now that we have seen in, I think, every game to this point. I swear, if, this was, there, if there were this many explosions in random places around the globe, I feel like somebody might have something to say about it by now, but I digress. We bring the story of Resident Evil 4 to a close with an absolute bang. Leon and Ashley on the move to the next adventure in the dreaded Resident Evil 6. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. 
somehow I knew you'd say that, but it doesn't hurt to ask, you know? So, who was that woman anyway? Why do you ask? Come on, tell me. She's like a part of me I can't let go. Let's leave it at that. From a narrative perspective, it's safe to say that this game might have been the best story in any game in the Resident Evil franchise thus far and probably since. Shifting the formula from a couple of expansive locations, Resident Evil 4 takes Leon and across a ton of different locale on the island, shifting the focus from an enclosed open space, which I realize is a dichotomy, but you know what I mean, much like the Spencer Manor or the police station, and turn it into a long series of mostly linear areas, each space getting progressively more fucked as the night goes on. A small detail that I do appreciate is just shift in time as we move throughout different areas. Starting off at midday in the village, we shift to evening with the first encounter with Luis, and again tonight as we make our way to the castle. By the time we kill Sadler, defeat Krauser, and move to the fight with Sadler, the early morning hours begin to reflect in the glow of the new day as our two heroes zip off on a jet ski to safety, showing the progression of time and danger that looms in the night. This can be seen in the Los Plagas victims as well, as once night descends, when exploding their juicy heads, a centipede-like bioweapon sprouts from their exposed neckline to keep the creature alive and honestly vastly more dangerous and tanky than the original villager that was there before was. While playing Resident Evil 4, I remember why I enjoyed it so much for the first time and still do today. The gameplay is tight despite a few of my gripes with it and by the end, you really do feel like a complete badass murdering dozens of infected victims per room by the end of the day. With the power of fantasy is real and damn is it fun. And despite my criticisms of certain antagonists, Salazar to be specific, every character in this game is pretty endearing. Leon's quips, Ashley's determination to stay alive while contending with the infection and being pretty much useless. Sadler is a truly menacing foe and Salazar, despite how hokey and confused I am, I, I am, creates the air of an unhinged psychopath, not unlike the psychopaths we saw in Dead Rising, bringing a certain sort of charm to the game and leans into the weird level of camp and seriousness that is actually threaded pretty beautifully. It's definitely a fun romp in the story and while the gameplay is pretty tight even 18 years later. However, this formula would also be the pre cursor to a large and drastic downturn the series would take in the next few entries. The focus on action and blowing away absurd amounts of enemies by Resident Evil standards may not have been off-putting at the time of this game's release, but in hindsight and looking back at the different trend lines that the series took, it's obvious Capcom took the reception of Resident Evil 4 and decided to ratchet up all the aspects that play here up to 11, losing the identity that Resident Evil had had up until this point. As we will see in 5 and the most lauded and dreaded 6, the series loses its focus on the horror and leans heavily into the action that is almost becoming unrecognizable as a series, and all of that was supplanted by this game. Resident Evil 4 still holds up well at the time of writing this in 2023, however it's easy to see where Capcom took inspiration for the next games, and if not for the focus on more action here in Resident Evil 4, 5 and 6 may have been completely different. But with that, I want to bring this video to a close. This one was a long one, and honestly was pretty hard to write for me, just knowing how important this game is to a lot of people, including myself. But ignoring the harm that this game would ultimately inflict on the series and franchise that is so beloved by many would be irresponsible and while I do like it a lot it's glaring problems and tonal shifts cannot be ignored for what it did for later games in the series. While it's not necessarily fair at the time to judge a game for that looking back I feel like that's a little bit fair. So my name is Brendan, stay sexy, stay awesome and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Brendan, and if you're returning to the channel, welcome back. And if you're new, welcome. Hopefully you enjoy. Coming off the back of the banger that was Resident Evil 4, it was an exciting time to see what Capcom would follow up the beloved title with and Game of the Year winner with next, introducing Resident Evil 5. Remember when I said that we would take all the worst parts about 4 and then put them into a game? Yeah. Released in 2009 on the PS3 and Xbox 360, I remember being so hyped for this title to release, only to be met with this action game that had the facade of Resident Evil and... I don't know, it was all really confusing to say the least, and I don't think I was alone in that. We have reached the dark times of the Resident Evil franchise, so let's delay no further and dive into the confusing mess that is Resident Evil 5. Let's hop into this bad boy real quick and dive deep into Resident Evil 5. Freeze! <laughs> <laughs> 
Are you okay? Welcome to Africa, the setting for our next outing with seasoned protagonist Chris Redfield, who we haven't seen since Code Veronica. Now, part of, of the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, or BSAA, that is a mouthful, Chris is deployed here to locate a black market bioweapons dealer, Ricardo Irving, who was last seen in the area. In the backstory given to us at the very beginning of the game, Umbrella has fallen after the events of Resident Evils 1, 2, and 3 with the Raccoon City event, but 10 years later, their research in the creation of biochemical weapons and mutants have spilled into the world at large, leading to a black market of chemicals and essentially stems to create more bioterrorism weapons. This is why the BSA was established, an agency that we'll be getting to know very well here in the next few games, which is basically created to assist in closing these rings and assessing any bioterrorism threat and subsequently taking them out. If it seems like a lot before the game even begins, that's because it is. There's a lot here prior to Resident Evil 5 that occurs off screen. I mean, it is a 10 year time lapse. And while this isn't new for the Resident Evil series as a whole, the lead up to five feels like just a lot and a lot really fast. It just kind of dumps a bunch of information on you in order to even kind of simply understand what Chris is about to be going through. But down back to the nitty gritty, Chris makes his way into town discussing his hunt for Irving and moving to meet up with his new partner, Sheva, in the local town. For 10 years passing since last seeing Chris, he hasn't seemed to age a bit, albeit he has more steroids running through his veins than blood given the size of these appendages. I mean, holy Christ, his arms are like four times bigger than my entire body. We won't even talk about his lower half. We meet up with Sheva, a local member of the BSAA, and the two move off to their local contact to get information on Irving and collect their gear, because you still can't fly with guns. Instantly, you can see the major changes that come to Resident Evil formula, that being the introduction of full campaign co-op. If playing solo, Sheva is controlled by the AI, which for all intents and purposes isn't actually as bad as you would think. Obviously, it would be much better to have another player rolling with you through this 8-10 to 10 hour campaign, but because I have no friends, I kind of just had to roll with the AI. And the basics of what they would do it really isn't all that terrible though. It shoots, it grabs stuff, it gives you ammo whenever you need it. However, it still just runs into a bunch of stuff constantly, but we'll get more into that later. And the implications this has on the gameplay is a much different beast in all of itself. So let's take the time and hop into the gameplay of Resident Evil 5, the crux of why this game to me kind of sucks. My name is Sheva Alamar. Chris Redfield. Your reputation precedes you, Mr. Redfield. It's an honor. Just Chris, thanks. So you'll be accompanying me to the destination? Yes. Tensions are running high ever since the change in government. I'll bet. Intel says it's a haven for terrorists now. Now, if you've seen the past videos on the channel, mostly speaking about Resident Evil 4, you probably know where I'm about to go with this, so feel free to skip ahead if you want. But as a TLDR, as we discussed in the Resident Evil 4 video, links are in the top right for the full thing, there was a dramatic shift in the gameplay of Resident Evil. Long gone are the days of tank controls of the past and Resident Evil 4 being a more action-focused title, horror-infused romp through the back villages, castle, and military base of Spain. In RE4, there's a moment where you can pinpoint where the action side completely took over the horror side of it, and it's here that Capcom really really seem to lean into the formula for Resident Evil 5, that being the mass destruction of the entire military base in an explosion-filled, guns-blazing, action-fueled power trip that was inserted near the end of the game after the defeat of Salazar. Seemingly, th this is the moment that Capcom believed outshone the rest of the game and created the focus of Resident Evil 5 into this over and over again. Resident Evil 5 is no longer a horror game, but an action game with, you know, some mild horror elements in there, but nothing really all that frightening. Almost undistinguished from something like Gears of War, who I feel like may have actually thread this needle a little bit better. The amount of guns, ammo, enemies killed, and explosions in the first chapter of Resident Evil 5 alone dwarfed the amount of action we had seen in any other Resident Evil game prior, except for maybe the end of 4. Chris finds a handgun, shotgun, machine gun, sniper rifle, as well as a cavalcade of grenades, herbs, and any other sort of arsenal in order to kill bad guys, all within the first two hours of gameplay. Hell, I mean, you're even graded on the amount of enemies killed in each subchapter. The higher the number, the better the score, intrinsically coercing the player into killing more and more enemies. A tenant 
that you would say is almost antithetical and the complete opposite of the bones the franchise itself was built on in the games prior, making resources scarce, hard to find if not rationed appropriately, and if you really, really sucked, but soft locked the player into being basically stuck, only having the knife at their disposable and making the game infinitely harder to progress. Playing this, I honestly kind of felt nothing in going through the motions of moving forward, blasting everything on my path and moving forward, knowing that everything I just murdered and every box I'll find after said encounter will likely drop more ammo than I even spent on the encounter in the first place. For a series that introduced and refined the genre we now know as survival horror, there is almost none of that DNA present here in Resident Evil 5, short of like characters that we'd seen and been following since Resident Evil 1. Now you may stop and say, Brendan, you may say Resident Evil had to change to stay viable, and that it's an argument you definitely could make. Back when this came out, there was a growing sentiment in the industry that horror and survival horror was essentially dead, now morphing its way into a more of an action horror genre, a trend that we would see in games like Dead Space and even more notably Silent Hill. In fact, we're going to do this on the channel eventually, but Silent Hill more or less went through the same transformation that Resident Evil did, but really didn't survive through the action phase of its life cycle. While attempting to stick the horror landing, progression systems and having the player grow in power seemed like a must at the time, whereas back in the older Resident Evil days, your power came directly through your knowledge and effective item use. Obviously, this notion has more or less been dispatched entirely, given the popularity of games like Outlast, Amnesia, and even to agree, Resident Evil itself reinventing itself with the advent of 7, which we're going to get into in a future video. However, this change could have been done better as well if this game just kind of controlled a little bit better. Resident Evil 5 feels unbearably stiff, unusually clunky, and hard to maneuver. Its walk speed is painfully slow, and when holding the sprint button, yes, there's a sprint button, you do move a bit faster, but you're almost guaranteed to get hung up on doorways, walls, corners, and other random bullshit geometries that are in the area, so on and so forth. A killer if you're trying to make space between yourself and the 52 assailants looking for your head. Couple this once again with not being able to move and shoot, a weird no dodging system, and a finicky red dot to show where you're aiming, and you're in for an overtly frustrating experience. This game was honestly a slog to play through, and for what little payoff you have in the story department, it almost wasn't even worth finishing for this video. I know there are lovers of this game, and by all means, love what you love and play what you want to play, and I can't wait to read your comments on how wrong I am down below, so be sure to leave those and we can have a back and forth if you want. I'm willing to hear the arguments, and hell, I'm even willing to have a chat about it over Discord. But from where I'm standing, Resident Evil 5 just kind of feels like ass to play. One aspect that I really did enjoy in Resident Evil 5, because with all the bad comes with some good, is the boss variety. However, as I'm a sucker for topaz and extravagant bosses, something the series has been super hit or miss on up until this point. I want to omit a couple of boss encounters out of this section to save for the story aspects of this video, just for pure spoiler sense, but all the early game bosses meet that spectacle that should be implicit when discussing major fights in video games. While still contending with the poor combat controls, these fights are varied and honestly a very fun time, all having a different variety of attacks, damage methods, and more specifically, mechanics that leads to a quote-unquote damage phase, to use MMO terms, of said boss. I specifically love the giant insect fight on the elevator leading further into the Tricell Umbrella facility, slight spoilers, using its mandibles to suspend itself above the platform, you must first do damage to said arms, leaning for him to drop on the ground, for Chris to run over and go shove a grenade in said beast's mouth. From there, in the subsequent explosion of said grenade, the carapace pops off the top, exposing its gooey head bits, breaking off more each time you do it, showing more and more of the weak points on the enemy. After doing this three to four times, the head is blown apart and the real damage can be dealt while laying into its brains while it's laying on the ground, writhing in pain. All of this while contending with ad spawns that will drop even more ammo and grenades that you will need to finish this actual fight. It's actually pretty well designed in an awesome fight that's just kind of fun to play, and there's a ton like this as well. All of these multi-phases in order to murder the mutated beasts, which is my only real complaint about these bosses that I wish they were kind of more tied to the story and lore of the area a bit more than they are, as most of these are kind of just mutated animals or insects that have been infected with the Uroboros virus. Mine is the boss fight on the boat with Irving, which just revolves around running across the boat, shooting a stationary gun to a stationary gun, and shooting glowy bits on his back and head. This fight kind of sucks. But overall, the bosses in Resident Evil 5 have really stepped up the game in the series here, probably given to its more combat focus rather than horror and clunky controls. Great job, Capcom. Sincerely. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
However, the good must come with the confusing, which brings us to UI and specifically inventory management in Resident Evil 5. And going back to Resident Evil 4 in the last video, I was absolutely infatuated with the inventory system that game had to offer, taking the minimal space idea from previous games and turning it into a fully fledged system of organizing your items case to maximize the amount of stuff Leon could carry on his person at any given time, relying on a tile and grid based system to slot items into your case in the most effective manner possible. Lauded by everyone, what we have here here is, well, what we have here is a massive set backwards in every way possible. Almost like Capcom completely missed this praise of Resident Evil 4. In Resident Evil 5, we have gone back to the nine tile system, with each item taking one space of inventory, including ammo and meds. With limited space and vast amounts of ammo, herbs, and guns, these slots fill up overtly quickly, and with utilizing your partner's inventory if you're running solo, you have a maximum of 18 slots in total. Seems like a lot until you realize that your partner also needs to carry her own guns and ammo as well. So so with having a loadout of three separate guns using different ammo types, this would mean that six slots per character are already consumed by said gun and requisite ammo, leaving three slots per character to hold on to other stuff. I'm here to say that this system pretty much sucks, a lot like what I said in my Resident Evil Zero video. It absolutely baffles me that going from Resident Evil 4 to this, why it seems that Capcom took such a stark step backwards when it came to item management. There is simply not enough space to hold anything in a level, leading to me using Chavez basically a healing pack rat while Chris carried grenades and trip mines, but if both inventories were full, there was no way we were going to pick up said meds, leading to a convoluted song and dance between swapping, dropping, and throwing items out, and then swapping slots with said items to try to make anything work. And yes, this is no different than how it was in the previous Resident Evil games, but with a more action focused and you potentially taking more hits, this will obviously lead to the need of more healing items that you're going to want to carry on hand. The balance and flow between game and inventory just don't match up like they did in the prior games and with the changing of the times of making this a more action-focused game, it's a little weird that we didn't go down that route with any sort of healing options either. Not that I would have liked that, but it would have been a more understandable design choice than what we have here. The hotbar system is kind of cool, where you put your weapons in one of the four cardinal directions in the inventory space to quickly swap between them utilizing the D-pad, as I did play on a controller. But once again, if you're carrying four guns, this leaves only one slot to carry anything else, which just kind of feels bad when the game hands you items like their candy and I can't pass up on shinies. If we went from Code Veronica to zero to this, I don't think it would have been so bad. However, coming from Resident Evil 4 to 5, this feels like a drastic downgrade. We still have treasure item systems here as well that we had in 4, finding items that are meant to sell to make some money to upgrade your guns. However, instead of having a dope ass shopkeeper to sell your items and upgrade your weapons to, you just sell everything at the end of every subchapter, as well as buying and upgradings in the same menu screen as well. While it does serve its purpose, there's just no flavor here and feels like a tacked on system with no flair that we had seen in Resident Evil 4. You can also go back to the screen anytime you die as well, which kind of rips the challenge away from starting again, as you could just stock up on first aid sprays or even more so rocket launchers for a one hit boss fight to just out heal or out plow yourself through any encounter you're actually stuck in. All in all, these systems just kind of feel bad and really when contrasted to the elegance that came before in Resident Evil 4 systems, it's amazing how far back Capcom stepped in this outing of the series. Like I said, if we hadn't made all these great changes in the Resident Evil 4 systems, I don't think this would have been such a stark downgrade. But when you have something as so elegant as, as how Resident Evil 4 did, this just feels not great. We mentioned discussing the AI as well, and I did want to touch upon that again, as it is a pretty key role if you're playing by yourself. If you have a friend, this really isn't that big of a deal, and you can skip ahead to the story sections if you so choose. But if you're playing by yourself, you do have to contend with your AI co-op partner, something which is really popular in the late 2000s in video games. I love the idea idea of having co-op in almost everything as you know back when I had friends in middle and high school this was a damn good time however utilizing Chev as the AI as I said isn't terrible but there's a lot of improvement that could be done and something that we have seen in Resident Evil games even after this I'm looking at you six my main complaint with this AI is the pathing I have never seen a computer controlled character get hung up on so many walls in order to come and save you which this game also introduced the down but not out system that we saw in games like Gears of War and this system always has just felt bad to me. I can't explain why, but especially in this game, it feels entirely broken, where if you are outpacing your AI, which you invariably will, because you're a human with functioning thumbs, and you're so far ahead of where she's at, she needs to run all the way to come pick you up, while you're praying you don't get hit by a follow-up attack and then die. This never happens, depending on how far you are. Hopefully she doesn't get caught on geometry, or even worse, tries to just run through a horde of enemies with its sole focus of picking you up, rather than actually move around said swarm of bad guys. Ultimately, 
ultimately leading you to restart at the checkpoint. But the true way this is broken is when you're actually together. If you and Sheva are stuck in a corner and you happen to go down, she will instantly pick you back up, leading to basically just a rotation of her picking you up while you keep going down, slowly whittling away the amount of enemies coming at you. I mean, hell, there are many times in these hunter-filled sections where they're just swarming us in a corner that I'm constantly going down and she's constantly picking me back up, leading to a never fail state. It just feels bad. And yes, this is definitely in the player's favor to do, but I like a bit of challenge when it comes to my games and I don't expect everything to be incredibly hard, but to have something as cheesy as let's stand in this corner and you can pick me up over and over again just doesn't feel great either. This will not be the last time we have a fully functioning AI character with us in the Resident Evil series, but luckily in these new outings, that's kind of a thing of the past. So I'll just leave it there. I just needed to rant about that a little bit because the AIs are completely frustrating to me for whatever fuck reason. But with gameplay aside, let's go ahead and hop into the story beats of Resident Evil 5. Work out there. We'll analyze the data immediately. This whole town's gone to hell. The people here, they're acting like those Ganado detailed in the Kennedy report. And aside from that, there's something new, something we've never encountered before. Our transportation has been taken out too. Requesting a mission update. The mission stands. Capturing Irving is your top priority. We believe he may have fled to the mines on the other side of the train station. Wait, we're the only two left. You want us to go in there alone? Delta team have been dispatched and they're on their way. They'll assist you in locating and apprehending Irving. But wait, we can't! I repeat, your mission stands. We can't afford to let him get away. The story in Resident Evil 5 is a very mixed bag, and while definitely not great in the slightest, it's fine at best, and if not over the top in almost every way possible. Going back to our heroes Chris and Sheva, the two grab their gear and learning the location of Irving, Chris somehow seems distracted, hesitating with calling Sheva his actual partner, and seemingly hesitant to work with her at all. The reasoning for this is due to what happened to Jill Valentine, his old partner, being murdered by Wesker on a mission the two were on to find Oswald Spencer in the old Spencer estate. This was a paid DLC, and while it was fun to go back to the Spencer Manor where the series first began, it was kind of lackluster in playing through, and so I'm glad that it showed all this in cutscenes, however, unlike what Resident Evil 4 did before with Krauser. Having Jill get tackled by Wesker off of a cliff and supposedly falling to her death saving Chris leaves Chris with the guilt of her blood on his hands, making him distant to new partners and questioning even the reason for fighting B.O.W.s at all in the first place. The two move on to Irving's location upon reaching the town square is swarmed with the local infected, much akin to the village section in Resident Evil 4. That is, being swarmed by enemies, chainsaw dudes, until the BSA show up to back up the genocide that's occurring in this town square. We're also treated to a scene of a villager being infected with the new strand of Los Plagas, Los Plagas 3, a sub-strand from the infection of Resident Evil 4. But rather than having a gestation period of days and inserting the parasite as an egg, this substrand has a gestation period of a few minutes, basically shoving an entire parasitic ball down somebody's throat and forcing them to swallow. It's pretty gross. Making their way to the docks while Irving is seen headed to, the pair commit genocide through an entire infected population of a village, murdering a giant slimy B.O.W. worm monster by trapping it in a furnace, and meet up with the last surviving member of the BSAA's Delta Squad, Josh Stone, who helps the two escape towards the docks and gives Chris a memory card with research data they obtained from the village. Looking through the files, Chris sees a photo of Jill, spurring his motivation to continue forward despite his orders to retreat the area. Him thinking that she's dead and seeing somebody who he cares about actually being alive, this would probably make anybody move forward. I'm telling you, Chris and Jill have a thing going on, but I don't think it's ever mentioned in the series. Crossing the savannah, killing giant bats, and braving the mines, which is actually a pretty dope set piece where one player holds the lantern while the other does all the killing. Chris and Shevra trek their way across Africa on the hunt for Irving and information on why Jill was on the memory card in the first place. Reaching the marshlands beyond the desert, the tone shifts from murdering villagers to murdering native villagers. In their huts and hovels and temples scattered around the marshlands. Making their way through the temple, Chris and Jill reach a pair of tents marked with the Tricell logo, a pharmaceutical company that had also been funding the BSAA. Chris notices the umbrella logo and some old rubble with some notes left behind, implicating Tricell to having infected the local villages with Los Plagas 3 in some sort of test bed for the virus. Moving through the cave and reaching the oil fields, Chris and Sheva corner Irving, but before capture, Irving blows the oil fields and attempts to flee in a boat nearby. Chris and Sheva give chase and given no other choice, and knowing his capture is imminent, Irving injects himself with Ouroboros and causes himself to mutate into a giant water beast, leading to the boss fight of blowing him up with stationary guns on a boat, which, as I said before, kind of sucks. But it is a cool set piece in its own right. Dad, who do you think got this entire operation off the ground? Research like this doesn't fund itself, you know? Yet everyone looks down on me. 
but not anymore. Don't do it! We learn that Ouroboros is another form of mut mutagen to create more bioweapons, where the mutations occur when the host is rejected from the parasite. Despite the mutations Irving just went through, gurgling his last infected breath, he tells Sheva and Chris that Tricell Africa division manager Excelic Gioni, I said that wrong, is to blame for this, and to go to a nearby cave to find the answers they seek before passing away for every mutated in his nasty fish form. With that cozy bit of information, Chris and Sheva make their way to the cave to find more native locals, all infected, protected their way forward. Battling their way through, the pair reach a cave, hosting a group of flowers known as the Stairway to the Sun, and with context of old computer terminals and notes nearby from an abandoned umbrella research facility, this is the source of what was known as the progenitor virus, the same one that we saw in Resident Evil Zero, and was the base for the T-virus created in 1996 by Umbrella in the events of Resident Evil 1. Making their way through and learning about the studies that occurred there by Umbrella, we find new terminals sporting the Tricell logo, showing that this group basically just picked up where umbrella left off, creating new strands of the virus from the same flower and the basis for the Ouroboros virus itself. While searching for more information on Jill, the two reach a giant elevator filled with test pods that carried humans inside of it. Typing in Jill's name, the elevator springs to life and takes the pair down deep into the facility, and after destroying the dope spider boss we spoke about earlier, reach a pod to find it empty. Excella appears on the screen denying any knowledge of Jill and tells them to leave if they know what's good for them. Chris and Sheva, who don't know what's good for them and are determined to press on, run into a Excella, who releases another wormy bi bioweapon, much like the one that killed Alpha Team before, and with the help of a beautiful flamethrower, turning this one to a crisp as well, the two reach another underground temple to be met with a hooded figure, Excella, and Albert Wesker, Chris's old commander in the Stars unit and right hand of the Umbrella Corporation. Taking a shot, Chris shoots the mask off the hooded figure only to see that it's actually Jill Valentine, now brainwashed by a chemical being administered by a device implanted in her chest. Wesker, in all of his arrogance, tells Chris he can only spare seven minutes to fight with Chris and Sheva in the four face off and hand to hand combat. Wesker now enhanced with superhuman speed and senses and Chris and Sheva just being humans. Eventually Wesker leaves to continue his plans and the two square off against Jill, ripping the device out of her chest and bringing her back to reality. Jill sends them off to stop Wesker and the two head off to end things with the infamous villain once and for all. Upon leaving the temple the pair see Wesker and Excella boarding a giant ship stockpiled with missiles and bombers. The two stow away and fight their way onto the control deck, giving chase to Excella who drops some syringes from her briefcase. Cornering her, she injects herself with Ouroboros to have no obvious signs of effect on her. She claims that she was selected by Ouroboros as suitable for the virus before the mutation actually begins to set in. During this, Wesker comes over the intercom, disavowing Alexa, who begins to lose it, thinking that she might have been able to actually rule the world next to him rather than be a pawn in his plans. With the mutation taking hold, Excella morphs into a giant bioweb. What the hell? Farewell.
forcing Kristen Sheva to use satellite targeting lasers to take her out. This fight is actually kind of cool as well, but pretty much a carbon copy if you play Gears of War of the Berserker fight where you light the bitch up with the Hammer of Dawn. This fight is really no different. It's all just about ad clear and aiming a laser, but it's still pretty cool nonetheless as a set piece as a whole, even though not overtly difficult. Chris and Sheva catch up to Wesker, who reveals his plans to infect the globe with Ouroboros, exploding the laden missiles into the stratosphere and having the plague essentially reign over the entire planet, allowing him to be the ruler of the new world or of evolved humans. Learning from Jill over comms, Wesker does have a single weakness, that being his need to take regular injections of a serum to keep him stable, saying that overdosing him could lead to actually poisoning him and subsequently killing him, or at least that's the hope. It just so happens that the syringes dropped earlier from Alexa are the exact syringes we need to in order to overdose Wesker, so on we go. The two do just that, working as a pair to kick and stab him twice over with the serum, and upon his fleeing into the bomber, Chris ejects Wesker out of the airlock and into an active volcano below. Yes, that is right, I said an active volcano. The bomber then crashes into the same volcano soon after, and the two square off against Wesker in the final showdown, once again in an active volcano. I feel like we've lost the plot here. Now having lost any semblance of sanity, he thrusts his arm into an Ouroboros missile, infecting himself and causing him to be laden with the virus worms. With the power of teamwork, punching boulders, shooting weak points, and dodging some well-telegraphed attacks, the pair defeat Wesker and are saved by Jill in a helicopter. However, what Resident Evil game would not be complete without the need of a rocket launcher sequence? And thus, here we go. Wesker uses his virus arm to snatch the helicopter, which in turn delivers the required scene, blowing him to kingdom come, and the two escaping with Jill to fight another day. Ready, partner? Locked and loaded. Suck on this, Wesker. Your time's up, you son of a bitch. That was for our fallen brothers. Chris having found his resolve to keep fighting alongside Jill and Sheva, we fade to black on Resident Evil 5, and that is that. What an ending. Much like everything, and going back through this campaign again, I'm pretty mixed on it as a whole. As mentioned in prior videos, I do have an affinity for Chris. As your typical hardline protagonist, and while not full of wit like Leon is, he brings a more serious vibe to the franchise, dedicating his life's work to eradicating bioterrorism any way he can after the incidents of Raccoon City. Sheva is likable enough and acts as the voice of calm in these insane moments that occur in the story. Acting as the foil and catalyst for Chris, softening him up a bit creates an ebb and flow with the camaraderie between these two, as you can see during the interstitial chit chats that occur in between combat set pieces. While I wish Sheva was flushed out a bit more as a character, rather than being a stand-in for Jill essentially, she's not all that bad. I do wish she had come back in the series, but alas, this is the last we'll see of her up until this point. So maybe she'll make a return at some point, as Chris sure as hell does in later games, but here's the hoping. See the inner turmoil and guilting Chris for losing his partner is a nice touch as well, giving the inner conflict to a character as well as the main external one, and it does a nice job at making him seem a bit more human despite the size of his massive guns. However, the villain department is lacking a bit, and other than Wesker, we almost have no screen time with any of them until they're transformed and mutated just to be slain. Juxtaposed with how much screen time our villains in Resident Evil 4 got, our cast of baddies in RE5 feel like a speed bump on the way to Wesker. What I do appreciate is the continuation of the plot lines we know from Resident Evil as a whole. Resident Evil 4 really does, in going back, feel like a side adventure featuring Leon, whereas 5 continues the through line events that have been established in the series thus far, all of it leading back to Albert Wesker. However, there's a lot in this plot that just doesn't make any sense, and a lot of it could have come down to the pacing in Resident Evil 5. Being more of an action game, this plot has almost no room to breathe, every cutscene followed by a massive combat encounter or boss fight. And while this works in keeping the octane high all throughout, it makes a lot of the plot just be completely forgettable. Hell, I even forgot Excella's name when writing this script and as she's just kind of tossed in when we meet Wesker, with no real motivations expressed as to why she's even helping the yellow-eyed bastard in the first place. If this game could have taken its time to slow down just a little bit and let the details that are unveiled just rest on their own a bit, it could have helped a lot with the player actually retaining what the hell is happening here, as a lot of the lore in this is actually pretty good. Also, why does Wesker think that by mutating the entire world population, he could rule over them all like what was the follow-up plan to that seeing as who would listen to him while there were giant mutated worm monsters
monsters lurching every street and alley corner of the world. I know I sure as hell want it. I do appreciate seeing the finality of the conflict between Twi Chris and Wesker, however. Despite even the boulder punching scene in an active volcano, seeing Wesker finally put down after so long I actually felt pretty rewarding. Like we were closing a chapter in a book that is Resident Evil. But seriously, Capcom punching a boulder? I mean, come on. Change this whole location to like a destroyed facility after the bomber goes down, and this part would have been way the hell better. But an active volcano? That's just absolutely fucking ass and I'm dumb. Anyway, despite my feelings on the pacing and certain plot points, this story here wasn't actually terrible when looking at it on a deeper level. Was it great? No, not by far. But was it serviceable? Of course. There definitely are a couple of gems in this action-filled nugget, but all in all, it definitely is my lowest rated Resident Evil game, at least until I played Resident Evil 6. But with that, let's put a pin on Resident Evil 5 and wrap this video up. Thank you all for watching, and as always, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time. Time to discuss what I feel is the most universally agreed upon as to being the absolute worst game in the Resident Evil series, that being Resident Evil 6. This is in spite of this game being one of the highest selling Resident Evil games in the franchise, even more so than the acclaimed Resident Evil 4, up until the remake, obviously. While this should never be a benchmark for if a game is actually good or not, this does go to show the amount of interest and expectations this game had going into it. Instead, what we got was a kind of narrative mess, an insane UI, in a game whose gameplay consisted more of quick time events than actual gameplay. But rather than dwell here into the intro, let's dive into what makes this game so reviled by fans of the series while highlighting some of the positive points. Yes, there are a few along the way. Now, I'll be honest, if this game didn't have a Resident Evil name in the title, this would probably be an entirely different video. But more on that soon. I never actually played this until making this video, and I don't think that I ever played a more conflicting game thus far in my life. But let's continue. With all that out of the way, let's delve into why Resident Evil 6 is such a strange, jumbled bag of mess for me. Back for more. honest, while writing the script, it was kind of hard to know where to begin with this cavalcade of a game. So let's do what we always do and start at the core of what any video game entails, that being the actual gameplay of Resident Evil 6. Continuing with what came before in the last two entries in the franchise, we do have a more action-focused title of Resident Evil here, but this has taken up to over 9,000. Now in the last two videos, I did really kind of buck against the action trend that was happening in survival horror at the time, and I think those feelings were justified to agree to get them off my chest. However, I do understand that the franchise needed to grow and with that change with the times, that being becoming a more action focused style of gameplay rather than the slow plotting of the originals. Yes, one can learn from the comments, imagine that. And with rolling with four separate campaigns in Resident Evil 6, that's right, four, with four separate groups of protagonists, each of these campaigns sets out to have a slightly different feel than the last. Each campaign is split into four separate pairs, Leon and Helena, Chris and Piers, Jake and Shelley Birkin from Resident Evil 2, and Ada Wong and the series agent number one, if you have a co-op partner. And while it seems that the intended goal is to make each campaign different, they all kind of end up feeling like a run and gun shoot fest filled with their own bombastic set pieces. I mentioned in the last two videos, but starting with Resident Evil 4, you can feel the shift in the style of the series turning into more action focused rather than survival horror. Looking back at the first three games, however, in the series, there were three tenets that were the through line even up until four, and I would even say to a degree five, that being tension building, resource management, and then honing the two to build on each other. Resident Evil 4 was the turning point of this series, and while still regarded as the best, it was so by still threading the needle that the core game set out to do originally, that being tension and resource management. Resident Evil 5 began to lean way more into the action side, and Resident Evil 6 takes it all to its natural conclusion. Long gone are the long hallways, tight quarters, and debating on using your shotgun because you only have three shells left with none in sight, or using your pistol where you only have five rounds left. Now we're just lobbing grenades out of a grenade launcher attachment from our fully automatic rifle, then swapping to our automatic shotgun to blast our way out of a corner, followed by the one-two kick to explode the head of a Separatist terrorist combatant, and then using a rocket launcher to take down a helicopter. 
And while subjectively this action actually doesn't feel all that bad to me when playing, the entire spirit of what made Resident Evil so popular is just absolutely gone. What we have now is a giant action cinematic quick time event that features mutated humans. Keep in mind too that this was a franchise that spawned the entire conception of survival horror. Without Resident Evil, it's hard to believe we would even have games like Silent Hill, Fatal Frame, The Evil Within, Amnesia, or even Dead Space, which just had an awesome remake. As mentioned before, this game sports four separate campaigns campaigns, all of which center around different themes and playstyles. Leon's, which attempts to create the same feel as Resident Evil 4, albeit a little bit faster. Chris, whose campaign plays a lot more like a third-person shooter like Gears of War or Spec Ops The Line. Jake, which has a slight focus into hand-to-hand -hand combat, and Ada, who's the only solo campaign in the game, focuses more on the puzzle aspect of what we've known from the Resident Evil games in the past. And while I like this idea in theory, where Resident Evil 6 fails is making any of these feel truly distinct and leaving most of them feeling pretty half-baked. With Jake, for example, you're not using your hand-to-hand -hand combat more than three separate times in the campaign, and all of them distill down to two separate movesets, the three-hit combo we see with everybody, and a charge attack. And while powerful for sure, given the amount of enemies that you're going to be running into who are shooting you from far and running up to you close, this option feels only truly viable at the times where your guns are basically taken away. The rest of the time feels like a gun-filled, action-packed romp, leaving the differentiating mechanics to the side. Ada's campaign feels different due to the puzzle aspect, but given the fact that she's solo in her adventure, combat feels a lot more punishing to go through as well. This is by far the hardest campaign to me personally, given the amount of cramped quarters and vast amounts of masked mutants you're running into. <laughs> My main issue with this game feels those the sheer amount of set pieces that occur throughout. There's a saturation point in every piece of media when it comes to the amount of massive events that can occur before it just becomes another thing in the timeline, losing its appeal. Transformers is a solid example of this, which by the second movie of giant robots beating the piss out of each other and their transformations looking like just a pile of metal swirling and twirling around like a stupid ooey gooey gumdrop, it all begins to lose its luster as just being another thing that happens. Resident Evil 6 has this feeling by the time Chris has to blow up a tank on the bridge, then fight a tank on train tracks, then two massive biomutants right after that, everything that follows just kind of feels like another thing happening. Rather than being this massive set piece, it would have been on its own, or not sandwiched between the president being murdered and having a third fight with a giant unkillable biomutant with a chainsaw strapped to his arm. This all comes down to pacing once again, something that we touched on in the Resident Evil 5 video, but after the high octane fuel that is this game, it drowns every event subsequent to it in the rest of the game, especially the narrative, which is paper thin in its own right, with some nuggets of gold in there, which we're going to get to shortly. Inventory has also been dumbed down even further than games prior, being basically mitigated to a single bar of hot swap weapons and healing. You can still find red and green herbs to combine to make better healing items, but all this does is distill them to essentially making herb pills, which all end up being the same healing value, no matter how many you combine. As green and red, which used to just be a one full heal, is now now six heals of the same amount, whereas combining two greens gives three pills and combining three greens gives six. I personally miss how important herbs were as a resource in the prior games and seeing their uses distilled down to just a number of times I can click a button just doesn't work for me anymore. There are also upgrades where you, that you can buy at the end of each level with points you earn with the results at the end of each subchapter. And while some seem kind of cool and mildly game changing, I personally ran into paralysis of choice, having me only stick with just putting in the more damage, more defense, and finding more machine gun ammo for a bulk of this game. This goes for every campaign, but if you're going to give me perks and to slot in to make my character feel better, I feel like that there should be definitely be less of them and make them all way more impactful. To feel like my character is getting better in some way rather than arbitrary stat boost or take away my reticle for double damage. This whole system just feels tacked on, and I don't know if it's a bug, but half the time, despite me hitting equip on the loadout, it wouldn't even be equipped at all by the end of the next chapter, which was absolutely confounding to me. I know I'm mildly complained about weapon upgrading in Resident Evil 4, but I would take that power creep any day over this useless system as a whole. I'd be remiss if we didn't take the time to discuss the co-op in Resident Evil 6 as well. Now in the last vi video on Resident Evil 5, I must admit that I did not take into consideration how important the co-op feature was to the enjoyment of many people in this game. My perspective came from a person who had no one to co-op with and thus was resonated to using the AIs as my companions. My experience with this game is pretty much the same, however I must admit that I did enjoy the AI 
AI companions much better here in Resident Evil 6 than I did in 5. I did notice my compadres actually killing things and picking me up in a timely manner while minimally getting stuck on walls and corners as was the case in the 5th entry. Another aspect of Resident Evil 6 which was a nice addition was the self res mechanic where if you just stayed out of harm's way after going down for a period of time you would just kind of pick yourself back up not relying solely on your AI companion or a teammate to do so. And while being in this down but not out state you also have access to the weapon that you were holding at the time making you not a complete sitting duck able to at least ride the timer out to get up rather than just having to lay there and finally take the hit giving more power to the solo player in this regard. However this game defaults to creating an open lobby for anybody to join you mid game which was really confusing at first to me. And for somebody who hates relying on random scrubs to get further in a story based game that he's trying to get footage of this was not the way. I don't know how many times I started playing and there were still people hopping into my games only for me to give them the boot pretty much instantaneously. I honestly couldn't believe that there's still people joining co-op games in Resident Evil 6 11 years after release but I guess there is a community for everything these days. So good on you guys. Keep playing what you want to play. That's pretty fucking cool in my book. Unlike Resident Evil 5 I do have to actually praise 6 on its movement. Coming off the stiffness that was 4 and 5 the moment to moment movement in 6 honestly feels pretty dang good. Whereas the other two games in the series felt slow and unresponsive at times 6 not only felt snappy and quick but gives the player a lot of options for dodging evading the infected roaming the area. From dodges to rolling on the ground the snappiness of your guns and the melee combos you can perform the player has a ton of options in dealing with the bad guys that are thrown at you. I specifically love rolling around on the ground as not only is it just kind of fun and fun to watch but it can be used for a quick getaway and looks pretty cool while doing it. When everything clicks there's a flow state in Resident Evil 6 that's actually a pretty damn good experience to play despite me also feeling that this amount of movement is antithetical to the series as a whole. It's hard to argue however that movement shouldn't get better as technology and the game feel improves inherently with time and the power given when creating games on newer platforms just makes this a natural. While the stilted movements in the prior games felt intentional they were also done due to the limitations of the hardware at the time thinking of tank controls here. I do think Capcom went overboard with the amount of power given to the player and as this is what we got I have to say that if this game was not a game continuing the Resident Evil series it probably would have been pretty fucking awesome much like Vanquish from Sega at the time. So it's hard to say that it wasn't fun to move around in this game. It's a hard feeling to have and that's the joy of doing these things to get the nuanced thoughts out there. I may be off base with this feeling so let me know in the comments down below what you guys actually think of the moment to moment gameplay of Resident Evil 6. Am I off base or am I kind of on point? Let me know in the comments below. Because of Simmons. She's working for Neo Umbrella. You know what that means? Yeah, I do. And you're still going to protect this woman? I am. Before hopping into the story, I would be remiss not to bring up the fact that even after 11 years after release that this game still looks pretty fucking good overall in the graphical fidelity department with one major caveat, that is that the setting has to be dark. Which with this game is most of the time minus a few scenes at the end or epilogues. The lighting on display here is actually awesome and unrivaled in many ways. The lighting occlusion is on point, the amount of colors that saturate the space while not being overbearing really make this game pop visually and use the lighting to highlight important areas areas is done pretty well here. Just the neon signs saturating the downtown streets of China just absolutely left my jaw drop for half of it when I first was playing through Leon's campaign. However, when the lights turn on and the daytime is in effect, this game shows its age pretty damn bad. I mean, compare these two scenes. Oof. These games have always been pushing the boundaries for graphical fidelity, even now with Resident Evil 4 Remake, but I was amazed at how well the game looked today, 11 years after release. While not important overall, I did feel it was something worth calling out. From here, I think we really need to start diving into the story of Resident Evil 6. With four separate campaigns, this is definitely going to be a long one, ladies and gentlemen, so don't be surprised that this video is going to go even longer. So without further ado, let's get right into it. ...my desire to reveal the truth. I know where they're coming from. And might create more problems than it solves. A lesson I learned well in the military. Bioorganic weapons are a global threat. And we are partly to blame. We have to come clean and start working with the rest of the world if we want to have any chance of fighting this. 
Whatever you decide, sir, I'm with you. I have always valued your friendship, Leon. It's time we take responsibility and end this mess. From the initial boot of Resident Evil 6, I had a feeling that something was going to be off with this game. Upon booting up the campaign, you see four names listed. Leon, Chris, Jake, and Ada. Four campaigns, one game. The idea of having the, that Avenger-style moment in Resident Evil Universe and bringing all the main protagonists, minus Jill and Claire, back for a big finale is a great idea on paper. However, I believe that this is the root cause of this game feeling disjointed and all over the place. Look at yourself in real life. If you have a singular focus that you put all of your time and attention into, generally speaking, your end product will come out stronger and more succinct. Whereas if you're splitting your focus and attention on getting multiple things done, there's less dedication to one project or item, leading to all just kind of feeling weaker and disjointed. The same can be said for games. I mean, really, how many games do we play that have four separate narratives and protagonists in one package? Not many. The last time I could think of was actually Grand Theft Auto V, and narrowly this game did suffer a little bit as well, becoming more of the Michael and Trevor show by the latter half of the game with Franklin kind of being off to the side. And that game had about five years to cook in the dev cycle, whereas Resident Evil 6 only took about three. And while mentioned before, having this Avenger style moment is a, with a ton of returning Resident Evil members is a great idea. It's just not executed on well here at all. Each group of players tend to cross paths for brief moments at a time, but never last for longer than five to 10 minutes, either just a cutscene or a boss fight. So let's delay no further and let's hop in with the fan favorite returning, Leon S. Kennedy. We meet Leon in the city of Tall Oaks in a massive of zombie attack helping a defenseless Helena through the back alleys, only to jump into a street fighting hordes of zombies and running to a helicopter on tops of roof of cars, only then to be subsequently shot down and taken to the main menu. Instantly, just in this short prelude tutorial sequence, we can get the tone of what we're going to be getting in this cold open. These events actually take place in the middle of the campaign, giving an insight to the conflict at hand, while also tutorializing Resident Evil 6 as a whole. However, with little context, this set of action pieces serves really just just to set the stage and teach the player basics of Resident Evil 6. However, we do get to see Hunnigan, your over-the-radio help in Resident Evil 4, is back, which is a touch I can actually appreciate, the two staying together long after the incidents of 4. We then go back to the very beginning, focusing on Leon aiming at a zombie, staying his hand until the zombie attacks Helena, his Secret Service bodyguard. We learn that this was actually the president he shot, as he was giving a lecture and planning to discuss some classified information regarding the Raccoon City incident, how it was actually a chemical attack perpetrated by the Umbrella Corporation before being blown off the face of the map. Helena blames herself for the president's death and upon briefing Hunnigan, claims that Leon may have a lead on who's responsible for the attack at the cathedral nearby. Leon, not knowing anything about this, plays along with the lie and the two form a tenuous relationship. Leon, obviously skeptical of Helena, there's for sure something she's not telling, given her reaction to the president's death and now leading him to a random cathedral in town. God help us. I'll submit the report. You two just focus on getting the hell out of there. The virus has already spread three miles past the campus perimeter and it's not slowing down. Upon murdering tons of zombies as the infection is spread throughout the town, the two reach a cathedral and after some problem solving bell shooting and killing a giant infected, the two make their way into the catacombs to reach a strange lab located underneath the church. Hidden amongst the test tube is a video of Ada Wong, Leon's wannabe boo, bursting from a cocoon naked and sticky. Like, huh? We also find Helena's sister Deborah, which is obviously the reason we're here. But upon Helena grabbing her sister, she morphs into a chrysalis of sorts and then bursts out as another mutant. Ada then shows up and after what feels like a 20 minute fight, we murder Deborah and learn from Helena that it was actually Simmons, aide to the president, who kidnapped Deborah and forced Helena to aid in the assassination of the president. Hence her reaction earlier. No more tears. Not until I avenge your death. Please. Forgive me. <laughs> 
Ada pieces out as she normally does, and out for revenge, the pair call Hunnigan to tell her what was actually going on, only to be answered by Simmons himself, who in turn threatens to frame the pair for the murder of the president unless they come and join him. The two make their way to the surface, only to see the entire city being attacked by missiles the same way Raccoon City was. The pair escape, and learning that Simmons was heading to China, Leon and Helena enlist the help of their mutual friend Hunnigan and fake their deaths in the explosion to travel to China. While on the plane, Leon and Helena find a bio-mutant sea vice carrier stash on the plane and after ejecting them out of the luggage department down below go back to the main cabin to find all the passengers have turned as well with the pilot now dead as also the two must try to land the plane despite not knowing how to fly i want to hold here for a second as this section here may be one of the best scenes in the entire game i have a fascination with airplanes and tragedies occurring upon them i know that probably makes me sadistic and weird but the cramped corridors contending with outside forces on the plane and the ability to take a space that takes just two minutes to walk from front to back and create a halfway decent level out of it is something I'm just an absolute sucker for. I love the plane epilogue and the end of modern warfare for the same reason, as well as the plane level in Rainbow Six Siege. I'm a sucker for planes, what can I say? Anyway, back to the story. We crash the plane in downtown China, which is now in the middle of its own biochemical terrorist attack, and run into Sherry Birkin, who you may remember being the small girl from Resident Evil 2, as well as being accompanied by Jake, a mercenary for hire. Why these two are together, we will learn soon enough, and after finding out that they're going to report to Simmons, who's also in China if we remember, and are actually on the way to meet him. Leon attempts to tell the two what happened with the president in Simmons' true colors. The four are then attacked by a burly mutant with giant mechanical arms that Jake and Sherry are painfully knowledgeable of, and the four go to work on trying to defeat him. After the fight, the pairs end up separated. Sherry gives Leon the location of Simmons, and the four move separately to meet up and confront him on their own. Catching eyes on Ada, however, Leon and Helena give chase, and after running through a research facility, meet up with Chris Redfield and his partner Pierce, who's in a fit of rage chasing Ada as well, blaming her for all the bio attacks that have happened recently, as well as murdering his squad as part of the group called Neo Umbrella. Leon insists that it was Simmons who perpetrated the attacks, and asks Chris to trust him and to not murder Ada despite wanting to catch her. Chris agrees and the pair split again, and upon reaching Simmons, kill him on a train and then after a quick dust off, get a call from Chris telling him that Ada is also dead, and to evacuate the city, as a missile loaded with C-Virus explodes in the middle of town, infecting the entire population. <laughs> Determined to survive, Leon and Helena fight their way through the infected streets of China, only to find Simmons not actually dead. Surprise, surprise. After a string of fights with mounted machine guns, helicopters, him turning into a T-Rex, as well as a giant spider using lightning rods to knock him off a building, Leon and Helena work their way to the roofs and upon seeing Aiden Simmons still duking it out in a glass hallway, Leon jumps down to assist his wannabe boo and ends Simmons once and for all. Helena, cover me! Can you hear me? It ain't like this. I was just resting my eyes. You shouldn't sleep on the job. Leon and Helena make it to the helicopter, while Ada gives him a makeup kit and a flash drive and zips away, and leave the tragedy behind. The information Ada gave them was all the incriminating evidence to clear their name and ensure that Simmons was blamed for all the attacks. We meet up with them after the fact, now seeing Leon and Helena truly becoming partners, their names cleared with the evidence Ada provided, and move on to the next mission. And going back, this is by far the best campaign in Resident Evil 6, with some decent plot twists, true stakes, and interesting set pieces like the plane scene in the fight on the elevator. Leon is real rough and tumble in this one, dropping the amount of pithy one-liners in his role deck since his last outing of Resident Evil 4, but seeing him suspect Helena from the very beginning, as well as his need, nay, desire to protect and save Ada is commendable, given how many times she's cucked him over and over again in every game she's been in. His interactions with Shelly and seeing the imprint he left on her after the events of Resident Evil 2 was nice and a good interaction and callback to the original outing. And even though we never see Chris and Leon actually fight together, 
until this game, you can see the fellow camaraderie in the two when they meet in the factory. I mean, Leon did work with his sister in Resident Evil 2 in order to escape Raccoon City, so the two obviously know of each other, so this moment of seeing the two main protagonists interact as equals is pretty cool as well. Minus the painfully long chapters in here, I did enjoy Leon's campaign quite a bit, and it's nice to see our emo-haired boy back in the limelight once again. However, as we will see, this campaign is maybe the shining part of Resident Evil 6, and so let's look at our boy Chris and how he was done absolutely dirty. Leon. For the next time you see her. Women. open Chris's campaign in a dingy bar in Eastern Europe with an aged mopey Chris drinking his pain away wallowing in his own misery. We see a BSA officer walk up by the name of Piers into the bar and approach Chris to convince him to rejoin the BSAA to help with an incident going down in China. Not remembering why he was even wallowing in his own sorrows, Chris reluctantly agrees to join and lead Alpha Team and the pair head off to China. I guess everybody in this bar was also a BSAA agent at the same time, standing up like all the assholes and space balls. How many assholes we got on this ship? Anyhow, Yo! I knew it. I'm surrounded by assholes. Keep firing, assholes. I want to pause here a moment as I really like this dynamic Capcom tried to pull with Chris. He is dealing with the threat of bioterrorism for over 10 years now since Resident Evil 1, so seeing him in a stupor drunk in a bar makes a ton of sense. While the amnesia ridden main protagonist is a bit of a trope these days, the thought of Chris secluding himself from the past makes a ton of sense for me. I mean, who wouldn't it be after dealing with the events of Resident Evil 1, Code Veronica, and then 5? But that's not why he's here as we will soon learn. While attempting a rescue in China, Chris begins to remember why he stepped away from the BSAA, that being the loss of his entire team in another conflict in Eastern Europe six months prior, after being betrayed by Ada Wong and mutating his entire squad. At least, someone who looks like Ada Wong. More on that here real soon. This is basically the entirety of chapter 2, which is moving through the conflict until the betrayal, working with Sherry and Jake along the way. This part seemingly goes on forever and plays more like a chapter in Gears of War rather than Resident Evil. This section dragged on abnormally long for me and it was by the end extremely painful to go through. I mean, hell, half these guys don't even mutate even though they're supposed to be infected, but I digress. Also seeing these giant bioweapons come down like they're dropping tanks onto the battlefield I find mildly hilarious and a weird and sadistic way. But we return to current day Chris in China, where the story essentially turns into a revenge fantasy against Ada Wong, sacrificing nearly everyone on his team short of peers along the way in order to catch Ada. We catch up to her playing out the scene from Leon's campaign, where the two actually meet, with Ada making her escape and Chris moves in pursuit, this time on a Humvee, murdering more infected militia members known as the Javo along the interstate until reaching an aircraft carrier, and in a scene straight out of the Fast and the Furious, boards the ship as well. Turns out, this ship is part of Neo Umbrella, and the missiles on board are loaded with C-Virus, and after battling their way through the holds with these weird, masked, creepy, fucking skinny-ass creatures, corner Ada on the bridge as she triggers the missile launch, attempting to turn the world into another Raccoon City incident. As they chase Ada, she gets laid into from a helicopter gun and falls to her death in a crumpled mess, thinking her plan and victory is assured. Chris and Pierce attempt to stop the missile in a helicopter cover sequence, but fail to stop one, which is the missile we see 
Nazi blast over the city in China. It's then that Leon contacts Chris, asking him to save Sherry and Jake, who are trapped on a nearby oil rig, as Jake is not only the carrier of the antibodies for the sea riders, but is also Albert Wesker's son, the man Chris killed four years prior. Chris and Piers find Sherry and Jake, where Chris feels obligated, and rightfully so, to let Jake know that he is the one who killed his father. And rightfully so, Jake pulls a gun on Chris, and after expecting what the outcome was looking to be, Jake files around, grazing Chris on the cheek, and the four move to escape. I do enjoy the slight dialogue here between Chris and Jake as they're riding the platforms together, both on edge of what the other are going to say or do, coming to an agreement that they need to talk about this more later. Knowing that Jake's blood is pretty important, Chris tells Jake and Sherry to leave while him and Pierce stay behind to take out this massive bioweapon that's hanging suspended from the ceiling. Reluctantly, they agree, and Chris and Pierce move to fight and nearly lose. But in the latch ditch attempt, Pierce injects himself with a vial of the sea virus, mutating in order to save his superior and, dare I say at this point, friend. Using the mutation, the group eventually wins out, but at what cost? Piers begins to succumb to the mutation, and Chris, not wanting to lose another compadre, attempts to get both of the escape pods. Prepping for launch, Piers pushes Chris into the pod and shoots Chris up to the surface of the water, sacrificing himself to save his friend. Probably because he knows that it'll be really hard to pick up chicks looking like this. As Chris moves to the surface, he has a renewed sense of duty, having lost everyone he cares about again. We see Chris again in the same bar at the very end, this time getting up to respond to another case and moving on to the next mission. Looking back at Chris's campaign, this is one that I'm really, really mixed on. As I mentioned earlier in this section, the idea and themes of the campaign had the bones of a story that could have been something really special. We've been with Chris for a long time now, playing with him in three separate games, the most of any character in the series to date, from the Spencer Manor in one, saving Claire and Code Veronica, and murdering hundreds of African natives with Sheva in five. Chris has been through some shit, and that is sure to take a toll on anyone. One, even after one of these events, let alone three. However, the willingness to get back into the fight because he doesn't remember why he quit just rang wrong to me. How do you forget the complete mutations of your entire team in Eastern Europe? And then after the realization as to why he stepped away, Chris's singular focus is retaliation no matter what the cost, just becoming hell-bent on murdering Ada. This kind of becomes old after a while. I mean, half the time he just yells, where's Ada? over and over again. Piers, on the other hand, acts as Chris's conscience, working hard to keep him in check, so much so as to chastise him and threaten him if he puts any more of their soldiers and comrades in danger. I actually really like Piers a lot here as a character, with his loyalty not only to the BSAA, but also being there as the second in command, and even as a friend for Chris to assist on his path to redemption. The redemption arc, collating with Jake and admitting to killing his dad and being remorseful, also kind of just felt weird to me. Given the events of Five, I'm not so sure there's much to feel bad about here. I mean, Wesker was absolutely batshit, and Chris did the right thing doing that. And yes, telling Jake was probably the correct thing as well, but seeing is how Jake, as we'll discuss here soon, was already contending with the fact that his dad was kind of nuts. I'm not so sure why he's mad at Chris for this. I wish we had gone deeper into the nuance of these themes in the middle of the campaign rather than just having massive action sequences. But the beginning and the bookend, ending with the sacrifice of the man who helped Chris out of his downward spiral is pretty good. Just the entire middle pretty much sucks. And with that, we move on to Jake and Sherry, who similarly have decent ideas, but not great execution. So let's continue. Chris, we need to stay calm. After what she's done to us, how many of our men are dead because of that bitch? I'm right there with you, Captain. But your personal vendetta isn't gonna get us anywhere. If you hadn't been blinded by vengeance, we could have prevented some of those deaths. Shut up. Do you even care about our mission anymore? Shut up! I feel sorry for all the men that died believing in you. What happened to the legendary Chris Redfield, huh? What happened to you? It's a good thing Finn's not around to see you this way. I'm going after Ada. HQ, this is Alpha Leader. I need a location on Ada Wong. I'm going with you. Someone's got to keep an eye on you, whether you want them to or not. 
Jake and Sherry, the next crew we're going to be looking at, honestly, this campaign takes the most risks while also suffering from the same pacing issues as Chris's did. We open on Jake, a mercenary part of the Chahavo, injecting with what we now know as the C-Virus into his body, and while all of his other cohorts begin to mutate, Jake does not, thinking it's a combat stimulant of some sort to make them better in battle. Sherry bursts into a form that it was in fact the virus, and due to him being unaffected, is determined that he is the potential carrier of the antibodies of the virus that are inside him. It may be the key to saving humanity. She says that she needs to extradite him right away, and Jake is only willing to go for the low, low price tag of $50 million. The government agrees, and the two begin to move to the extraction zone, when they run into Chris and Piers in the Eastern European conflict, to ass and after assisting with taking care of the giant bioweapons that are in pursuit, Chris helps them get onto the chopper, and as the two are flying away, are knocked out of the sky and crash in the middle of the snowy nowhere. Shielding Jake from the shrapnel, Sherry takes a chunk of metal in her leg and after pulling it out, reheals the same mutation that we learned that she was injected with in Resident Evil 2. The two seek shelter in a blizzard in a cabin and the two get closer together, sharing events of their past and both realizing that they're important to the coming dangers of bioterrorism ahead. Romance is brewing, boys and girls, if it wasn't painfully obvious. This quiet moment is cut short, however, when the soldiers appear to murder the two as they escape, run into a woman that, that we saw in the very beginning of the game handing the virus injections out telling Jake all about Albert Wesker and how he was his father and all the atrocities he committed in the meantime. The two are then captured and sent to a research facility in China, and working together they escape. Jake is obviously still rattled at the realization of his father and the atrocities he committed, and after a heartfelt shake up by Sherry, the two steal a motorcycle and boogie on to hopefully freedom. This isn't the case, as this is short-lived once again. They become surrounded by Neo Umbrella Jahavo, only to be once again helped by Chris and Piers. I swear, these two just spend their entire time being saved by other people. People. Sherry learns that her superior Simmons, that we know from Leon's campaign, is actually in town, and the two make their way to his location, running into Leon along the way as we saw in his campaign. Leon tells them what Simmons done, Jake and Sherry contemplate how they're going to approach him, about what they heard, and as they move forward, find Leon and Helena, beat them to Simmons as well. It is here that Simmons finally admits to everything that he's done, and that Leon was in fact right about everything. Leon tells the pair to escape, and in doing so, are captured once again, and taken to the lab in an oil rig. We now know the bulk of what happens here. Sherry and Jake are freed, run into Chris. Chris finds out that killed Jake finds out Chris killed his dad and move to escape. While on the way up, they run back into the beast that they've been chasing since Eastern Europe for a final standoff, leading to a sick hand-to-hand -hand combat fight over some lava, and then holding each other as they blast the beast from the kingdom come, obviously fully trusting each other at this point, as we can see by this delicious handhold. I haven't brought up this monster much, despite how much he shows up in this story, because honestly, he just kind of gets old after the sixth time you see him. With the only fight actually being worth it being the end one where you punch the fucker in the lava, all of the Wesker fight in Resident Evil 5, and then blow him up in the escaping train on fire. A lot of it was just running away, and while chase scenes are cool, after so many times just begin to lose their luster after a while. I swear, I think I subconsciously tried to block these out. We reach the epilogue and see Sherry on a plane writing a debrief report about the incident. The BSAA now hiding Jake's relationship to Wesker when she receives the text from Jake, lowering the price of his blood to only $50, rather than the $50 million. Changing his ways to better the world world, we see a renewed Jake riding off into the sunset in a desert moving on to the next adventure. This will be the last we will see of Jake for now in the series as well. I kind of liked him, and watching him contend with his past and soften in the events of the story it was a fine character change, seeing as he was this grizzly, hard mark at the very beginning. However, Sherry feels kind of shoehorned in here, creating what is known as small universe syndrome. Sherry, while important to Resident Evil 2 as a small kid whose parents were fucked, there really wasn't a reason why she needed to be involved here at all. I also wish there was more of her aftermath after the events of Resident Evil 2, as this is still a mystery, and how the events of losing both of her parents could actually be pretty interesting. But that's not what we got, we just have a Sherry put in here in order to make sure that we had callbacks to other games. Once again, a lot of the malaise here can be attributed to the pacing, and like the other stories, there are nuggets of actually good and genuinely interesting ideas here, but focusing on creating four separate campaigns makes every idea feel like a half-baked turd cookie, where you can see the delicious cookie but it's surrounded by hours of action field shit mess. This is the campaign that feels most linked to all except for one, that being the last story we will be looking at today. That is the through line character that we've seen in each and every one of these campaigns thus far, Ada Wong. You know anything about him? 
Albert Wesker. What? Take that as a yes. We talked about him. A lot. I guess he had an antibody that could fight off any virus. Apparently, he abused his gift. Took it for granted. And ended up turning himself into some kind of monster. You know, I thought dear old dad was just a deadbeat who skipped out on us. No, no, no. He was actually a freaking nut job who almost destroyed the world. Ada's campaign feels different right off the bat, as she is entirely solo in this adventure in regards to her story. If you have a buddy playing co-op with you, there will be another agent with her as well, but this character is not part of any sort of narrative, so just kind of a stand-in. One day, Ada receives a message from Simmons regarding information that he claims to be of interest to her in her future endeavors. Boarding a submarine that the message points to, she works her way to the cabin through the mass amounts of mutated creatures we saw in the aircraft carrier guarding the way, reaching a door with a fingerprint scanner, which, to her surprise, her prints are actually encoded into the door. Inside, she finds orders to capture Jake due to his immunity to the C-Virus. However, these are dated six months prior with no knowledge of her actually receiving them. Wondering what this means, she finds that the submarine's actually being scuttled, and after a grand escape of zip lining and explosions and swimming and the like, Ada gets another call from Simmons, revealing that there's going to be a bioterror attack in both the United States and Tall Oaks, and following up with another one in China. In order to investigate the information she received, Ada heads to Tall Oaks, where Leon and Helena are contending with the president's assassination. We make our way through the graveyard and run into Leon and Helena, where we meet them in Leon's story and after the whole Deborah incident, Ada makes her way further into the lab. A lot of Ada's campaign revolves around backtracking through areas that we'd seen in prior campaigns after meeting the original cast, so we should know the layout here fairly well. Ada finds the tape we ourselves found earlier as Leon of herself busting out of a cocoon. We now know that there are actually two Adas, the real one and the fake one, this fake one going off the rails, defecting from Simmons and working to overthrow the organization Simmons is a part of. Ada, not wanting her to take the fall for these incidents, leaves to find the fake Ada to take care of this doppelganger of hers. This does shed a lot of light that the Ada we had seen in both Chris and Jake's campaign was not always the real Ada, leading to the death of Chris's squad. Plot twist! There are two Adas! Anyway, making her way to China, the third chapter is basically just her helping Sherry and Jake seeing Chris and Leon in a factory, and making her way to the last and lone location of fake Ada. And while seeing all these old chess pieces, pieces back into play recognizes that this incident seems to be like Raccoon City Part 2. She makes her way to the aircraft carrier as we went to as Chris and boards in search of fake Ada. Making her way through, she finds notes and videos based on the creation of fake Ada, essentially that she is a clone made from the lead scientist, Carla Radimus, injected with a sample of Ada's DNA as well as the C-Virus and placed in a pod, all in an effort to make a version of Ada that would actually listen to orders, as the Ada we are playing as is known to go rogue as we've seen in the last two games, and all of this instigated by Simmons. As fake Ada existed, the scientist Carla's subconscious begins to slowly bubble to the surface, leading to Carla slash fake Ada to wanting to get revenge on Simmons for essentially killing her. Ada finds Carla lying on the deck, dead, body broken, and twisted beyond repair. Moving down to ensure she was actually dead, the body springs to life, melting into what can, I can only refer to as C-Virus cum, mutating and screaming that she is the only true Ada and attempting to kill her actual true counterpart. This fight revolves around running and blowing up barrels, and while the spectacle is there to be sure, this fight just wasn't fun at all to me, and in fact was pretty frustrating if I'm being honest. I'm all for gimmick fights, but this one was just not a lot of fun. I mean, you just have to shoot through her face in order to shoot some barrels. Like, it's nothing really all that special. And after murdering cum Ada, real Ada hops into a helicopter to find and finish Simmons. This is beginning to get confusing, and I'm glad that cum Ada is now dead. Flying through the city, Ada spots Leon and Helena, and from the chopper helps the two with T-Rex Simmons, and takes the pair to the top of the quad tower, knowing that the full data of the clone experiments is somewhere within. Simmons popped back up for a fight on the bridge, and after subsequently defeating him as we did in Leon's, zips away, leaving Leon sad and alone as we saw in the first campaign. She makes her way to the lab, finding notes, research terminals, and most of all, a single cocoon. Unloading about five magazines into the lab from her machine gun and causing its total destruction, she escapes, answering another phone call and smiling. We fade to black on Ada Wong and the entirety of Resident Evil 6. 
And while there's a ton of late game reveals here when it comes to Ada's story and it's important to the Resident Evil 6 narrative as a whole, I could not stand this campaign at all. With what felt like over half of it just being quick time events, chapter 3 being literally nothing but running and shooting a couple things, and every other location being somewhere we've already been with other characters time and time again, this part feels like an absolute slog due to the amount of asset reuse here. I understand that these stories are all supposed to interconnect, but literally half of it feels like I'm just playing Leon's campaign all over again, but from a different point of view. Not only that, this is the part where the plot really jumps the shark. What with the clone Ada being the real bad guy the whole time, it just feels kind of like lazy and a waste of ton of potential playing as Ada. She hasn't been back in the series since, minus some remakes of course, and I kind of hope she stays there. We've been around this character for three games now, and short of just being mysterious and helping others in the lore, she hasn't provided a ton of actual gameplay or narrative to the player of said games. I, I don't know, I guess I just never really understood the appeal of her in the first place other than just badass in a dress. Let me know what you guys think of Ada in the comments down below and keep your horn doggery to yourself. Wrapping up the campaigns here is a lot, and all in all, almost all of these had some slight nuggets of something that could actually turn out to be awesome, but misses the mark in a ton of ways to keep any of them from being truly stand out. And while Leon's campaign does feel most akin to current Resident Evil games at the time, the other three just kind of feel like misses, either being too focused on action like Chris's, terribly paced like Jake's, or just boring like Ada's. I feel like this is likely due to the split focus we discussed earlier. If Capcom had just focused on one of these stories, ensuring that the pacing and story beats hit just right, and trimmed down the amount of senseless action rooms that we get, this could have been a much better game. Revisiting all the same spots four times over gives the feeling that been there, done that, making each subsequent campaign feel more and more like a drag. The same neon back streets, while looking good, the same graveyard, the same snow buildings, hell, half of the fights are even the same. I understand the desire of bringing all the old characters back for one last hurrah, but if you're going to do that, at least let them be together for more than five minutes at a time. I mean, hell, half the engagements, the group just say hi and then bye, and the best we get is a boss fight sequence that we've already done four times before that is Jake before leaving. You never get that moment where Leon, Chris, and Sherry, with all their subsequent partners, are fighting with their backs against the wall, holding their own in the affected wasteland that is infected China or infected tall oaks. This all just felt like a complete miss for me. My name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. That's for my sister. Come on. Let's get to the chopper. Resident Evil as a franchise has branched into almost every medium of entertainment at this point, between movies, TV shows, Netflix specials, and naturally video games. However, unlike the other two mediums, gaming has a bunch of different verticals inside of it as well, that being of handheld, PC, and console, and mobile gaming if we really want to consider that. I know it's like the biggest corner of the video game market right now, but I digress. And while the three have grown closer together in the latest generation cycle, that wasn't always the case until arguably maybe even the PlayStation Vita. With its ubiquity on all of these consoles, branching out isn't always yielded the best results, leaving many of these games lost to time, such as the light gun games of Resident Evil Survivor, Resident Evil Guide End released on the Game Boy Color, and even Resident Evil Outbreak, a bizarre multiplayer experience on PlayStation 1, bringing your friends into the horror as well. So it's no surprise when Capcom announced in 2010 a Resident Evil game for the 3DS, bringing the survival horror to the 3D handheld, that being Resident Evil Revelations. Being headed up by Koshi Nakamishi, excuse the pronunciations here, the gameplay designer of Resident Evil 5, what we get here is a semi return to form surprisingly, while keeping with the gameplay changes and system designs that we saw in Resident Evil 5 and subsequently 6, and something which I think is actually a pretty neat package. And while the 3DS release was met with pretty high regard, the re-releases on newer consoles were less so, an aspect that we'll be getting into later in the video. Taking a slight detour from the core games in the series, let's take a look at Resident Evil Revelations, what it did right, and what was kind of a miss here. With that, let's get into the breakdown of Resident Evil Revelations, continuing our Resident Evil series as a whole.
the last seven or so videos, we've seen the transition of Resident Evil from a slower paced corridor crawler in the first three to an over the shoulder fast paced action focus of the latter three, with Code Veronica in the middle leaning more towards the prior Resident Evil games. Revelations in its core game design attempts to thread the needle between the two styles, one which I think was more or less achieved. Coming off of the back of Resident Evil 5, movement and shooting feel quite similar to that game, even a bit slower at times due to the lack of a sprint button. This was maybe my biggest quibble with Revelations, as much akin to the old Resident Evil games. You're doing a ton of backtracking after unlocking a door or finding a key, making the trudge through old areas kind of a slog, especially when enemies don't respawn here. When it comes to the firearms, these feel pretty solid as well, powerful but not broken as weapons would get in 4 and 5. Upgrading weapons are gone as well, replacing that with a mod part system. Finding these parts in the world can be attached to your weapons to strengthen or change how they work entirely, from boosting reload speed or damage to creating a charge up weapon of sorts, making holding the trigger down longer doing more damage as a charge shot. I like this system in upgrading weapons a lot, as it gives that choice to the player on how they want their firearm to actually function, while not overall breaking the entire gun. While upgrading works in the same way, you could in theory dump all of your money into one weapon, creating this basically a one-shot kill gun. Whereas with this mod system, there's only a certain amount of mod slots on each weapon, meaning you can't completely juice out a pistol to just one-tap everything that walks. These mods can be equipped at a weapons box as well, meaning you need to make your way back to one of these in order to change your loadout or hold off until you find one further down the path. As a system, I love making these sorts of choices, where each are viable, but in taking that choice, you're sacrificing another. Binary upgrades are nice in creating the power fantasy that these games wield, but the power of choice in how you want to actually upgrade your guns, rather than just due to reload speed damage or ammo capacity, leaves these decisions in your hands, empowering you to make that decision. To me, that's a far more interesting choice to make rather than just putting money into a single weapon. But other than that, the core mechanics are basically the same as we've seen in all the other games so far. Quick turns, we can actually aim while we move. We have a companion, but he doesn't really do all that much, but I think that's okay in this game. But on the game plan front, those are the biggest changes that we see here, and ones that I actually kind of appreciate, minus the lack of a sprint But The other main mechanic introduced in Revelations is one that I'm actually really mixed on though, that being the scanning mechanic. In the tutorial section on the beach, you are introduced to the Gamma Scanner, a virtual handheld scantron that analyzes samples of bioweapons throughout the game. Doing so will reward the player with another herb, and restarting the percentage once again. In Lord, this actually makes a lot of sense for the BSA agents to carry around with them, their main occupation being that of combating bioterrorism, and as I learned from Schoolhouse Rock back in the day, However, the practical implications of this device are completely scattershot, being useless on one hand and vital, albeit annoying, in the other. Let me explain. The scanner's main purpose, as it's introduced, is to analyze bio tissue. You aim at the thing, hold the trigger, it dings, and you move on, not unlike the photo system in Bioshock 1. However, hitting 100% on the gauge nets you only a single herb. And while this can come into clutch if you're out or low on health, in general, this incentive really isn't anything all that special if you have two thumbs and mild hand eye coordination. We'll also find finding herbs in the world and only having a max capacity of 5, the need to keep scanning by the middle of the game is essentially gone. The scanner now being used for other purposes, it may be one that is a little annoying if not slightly overtuned. You see, the scanner can also detect hidden items in the world as well, from ammo to mods to even, uh, wow, more herb. And while revelations on the surface seems kind of skimp on ammo, if you're using the scanner often, and by often I mean every time you enter a new room, you can find more than enough ammo and equipment stashed in all sorts of corners, shelves, and behind geometry in the world over each entire level. And while you may go, yay, more stuff, I began to have flashbacks of playing Arkham Asylum upon release. Arkham Asylum incorporated a mechanic known as detective mode, allowing Batman to see all of his enemies through walls, their vitals, and everywhere that he could hide or blow up. Meaning, because of how powerful this mechanic was in the world of Arkham, you would actively be making combat harder on yourself if you didn't play with this quote unquote filter on the entire time, making the dark gritty Batman adventure feel like a well-rendered voxel game. Batman even today is a stunning game to look at, is taken away by the need to constantly be using detective vision or else you're just severely gimping yourself. The use of the scanner in Revelations here has much of the same effect. This time a laborious forest green coats the screen as you scramble to find any hidden case casings tucked in the corner only visibly picked up by the scanner. This was the craze in gaming after Batman Arkham Asylum came out, to have a quote unquote better vision mode or something that you can use to find secrets in the world. But in creating these, took away from the entire look of the game 
and replacing it with this monochrome information and stuff finding filter. I'm glad that we really stopped doing this in games now as to me it just detracts from the work done on the visuals which is a crying shame. Speaking of visuals I'm going to be honest here this game is not necessarily a looker in all regards but for a reason that actually makes a lot of sense. As mentioned before Revelations was originally built as a 3DS game and it shows. I do remember playing this back in the day on my old 3DS and remember this game actually looking really good on the handheld but much like how any game that is upscaled to a larger screen format everything just looks slightly off in this version. Textures aren't as detailed, lighting doesn't look the way it should and character models look more like dolls than what we're used to in games even at the time. And while necessarily bad as graphics aren't everything nothing just I don't know looks really right to me much like how I felt Diablo Immortal looked when being ported over to PC seeing as how that was a mobile game at first as well as these details are not fleshed out due to having the small screen size. It's not ugly per se but it didn't really age all that well. It's hard to have a severe knock against it given the fact that it was originally a 3DS game but I felt the need to mention it if you're a newcomer to the game or to the series as a whole just so you guys know what to expect. We also see the remnants of the on the go experience come out as well in the flow of the game itself. Revelations being broken up into episodes much like a TV show experience. This was done to allow for logical breakpoints in the flow of the game in order to have a more stop and go experience that is conducive for playing games on a handheld, even incorporating recaps of prior events after each episode. While I like this system and feels like it works really well on a handheld space, this stop and go experience really breaks the flow of the gameplay, each episode lasting for about 10 to 20 minutes at the most, with 12 episodes in total. This holdover style choice was probably a godsend for handheld gaming, really hurt the pacing as someone who just likes to play through these games in a few settings at best whenever I can. Pacing can make or break a game in some instances, and while not affecting to the point of actually hating this game, this really took me out of the experience at every breakpoint, and there's a lot of them, as there are subchapters in every episode. When porting this to consoles and PC, I do think that these breaks maybe should have been taken out, but as this is almost a straight port over, as we can tell from the menus as well, they look really handheldy. It was probably more dev time than deemed actually necessary during the porting process, a choice which, as a business owner myself, understand completely. But while there's a ton of handheld stink on this game, it wasn't detrimental to the experience for me in the slightest. Long have I complained in the last three videos of the loss of identity in Resident Evil up until this point, and even when making those videos, I think I inadvertently stumbled on something that truly allows survival horror games to stand out to be a cut above the rest. And looking at the differences between Resident Evil's 1 and 2 compared to 3, 4, and 5, minus a few gameplay tweaks obviously, the other main change is the setting or lack thereof in certain cases. Introducing the Queen Zenobia, the setting of Resident Evil Revelations, and the main reason why I think this game is pretty damn good. Akin to the first two games in the series, Revelations takes place on one singular location for a bulk of the game, minus a few side tangents here and there which we'll get to in the story, making this ship becoming a character of its own. Think back to the Spencer Manor of the police station in the first two games. These areas are iconic due to the fact that the entirety of the game takes place in this one location, learning its layout, its secrets, and lore, all while surviving and working your way through puzzles and doors to make your escape from the evils within. While globe trotting in 4 and 5 is fun and keeps the visuals interesting, you lose the oppression created by the cramped corridors, locked rooms, and the sense of accomplishment in making your way through new areas of the space, as well as the satisfaction of retaining all of the knowledge that you've had running through this place before. The Queen Zenobia fits the bill. Being a ship stuck out at sea, and honestly, is maybe one of the most interesting settings the series has been in so far. Isolation in a house is one thing, but being isolated on a ship in the middle of an ocean with no way of escaping is a far more terrifying setting. Being trapped in the middle of the ocean to me is a terrifying place to be, as even if you escape the confines of the ship, there's really nowhere else to go after that, seeing as one can't swim that far or long without making it to land. And even with the changing of the setting, this game still has the more action-focused side that we've come to know from the recent Resident Evil games, but taking place in the tight hallways makes everything still feel dangerous, much akin to the first two games. Not knowing what's around any corner, navigating your way through cramped corridors and locked rooms, it's a feeling that was lost in the last outings of Resident Evil. And while I've been railing against the action of these games, maybe what I was really railing against was the setting itself. This game did change that outlook for me a lot, realizing that the blend of the two styles can easily be achieved to make a more satisfying play experience, one that plays actually mildly well well while also keeping the feelings that the first two games had. Now, I never finished Revelations before this playthrough and while the story is definitely over the top as we will see later in the video and like every other game in the series thus far, playing through the Queen Zenobia here is a much more engaging experience, something which I was, feel was sorely lacking in games like 5 and 6. We still have sequences in different areas focusing more on the murdering of ton of biomutants but every time I was taken back to the ship was a treat to play through, making the Queen Zenobia one of my 
favorite areas in the Resident Evil series as a whole. Taking it back to the close encounters did wonders for me in this game, but am I alone in that? Am I completely off base with this take? Let me know if my theory and thought processes is on the right track in the comments down below. I'm curious to hear what my fellow Resident Evil fanatics feel about this. Enemy variety here in Revelations is both gross and if I'm being honest, a bit lacking. We all know Resident Evil for their zombies, mutated animals, and things like hunters and lickers. In later entries, we see the zombification turning more into a parasite of infecting the host and turning it into its mutated form, like we see in 5, 4, 5, and 6. Revelations takes a different approach to its fodder enemies, known as the ooze. These white amalgamous blobs, taking different forms for different functions, look more like melting clay or formed semen that stalk the halls of the Queen Zenobia. These guys, honestly, really suck in my opinion, and are the biggest detractor for me in this game. While I don't find zombies inherently scary, the ooze enemies honestly just kind of made me laugh at this point. Looking like the Michelin Man stood out in the sun for too damn long and got thrust on a boat. And with this being the most common enemy that we see, and there are a lot of them. Some with shields, some with ranged attacks, others with ooze swords. We also have the Hunters making its return here as well, which is, in this fidelity look more like the Raptors from Jurassic Park rather than the foreboding bioweapons that they were in the first games. We also have some underwater demon fish in the flooded decks below, which kind of just look like bonefish and are highly annoying to fight against. The boss fights here also kind of suck as well, with just a mutated lady here, a giant blob there. There really is no interesting ones here, minus the one with the ooze monster at the very end, that being having surrounded the ship the entire time. This fight consists of blowing back the reforming tentacles over and over again, and while not a fun fight per se, is at least visually interesting. Plus, there's lots of rocket launchers which you can use, which really lends to that power fantasy that Resident Evil has always been going for. I feel like there could have been something different and more ominous than the ooze, and I'm glad these guys have never been back in the series in this form again. With all that outside stuff out of the way though, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the narrative of Resident Evil Revelations. We open Revelations with returning protagonist Jill Valentine riding through the waves of the Mediterranean on a boat heading towards a ship, the Queen Zenobia, the location of the last known coordinates of the missing Chris Redfield. Accompanied by her partner, Parker Luciana, the two agents of the BSAA make their way on board, weaving their way through the cramped halls of the abandoned cruise ship. Taking place between the events of Resident Evil 4 and 5, this game focuses on the agents of the BSAA and their rise in becoming the prominent organization we see them in Resident Evil 5. And while Jill and Parker are the pair we spend the most time with, there are a cadre of characters we interact with as well. Chris is a known quantity, so I'm not going to delve much more into him, but he's accompanied by new partner Jessica Schwerwat, whose main character trait involves being obsessed with Chris and not wearing the appropriate clothes for the current predicaments, needing to show off as much skin as possible. I'll be honest, she just kind of sucks and is like completely shallow. I feel like there could have been a lot more done with her, but whatever, Capcom, thanks. As we will learn in time, Parker and Jessica were both agents of the FBC, or the Federal Bioterrorism Commission. Parker is like enough with his sense of justice always being pointed in the right direction and while cracking wise still goes out of his way to make sure that his partners are safe no matter the situation. We learn that these two are partners together during the Terra Grigia incident, another main thread that we will see come up time and time again in weird commercials, newscasts, and flashback scenes to the fall of the city. Essentially Terra Grigia was a city built in the middle of the Mediterranean, a green city run solely on green energy utilizing focused sunbeams from a satellite, and a safe haven for those who want to live there. However, the city fell victim to a bioterrorism attack perpetrated by the terrorist group Il Veltro, with hunters flocking the city in an effort to cause panic. In a last-ditch effort to contain the outbreak, the city was destroyed using the Regia Solus, a satellite used that focused the sun's energy beams that was given the power to the city, turning this city of the future into complete rubble.
We also meet O'Brien, head of the BSAA, who was also a part of the FBC during the Terra Grigia incident, alongside Morgan Lansdale, the current head of the FBC. O'Brien plays a major role later on, but for now, he's just known as our CEO for this mission. We also have fellow BSAA agents Keith Lumley and Quint Ketchum, also known as Jackass. These two are fellow BSAA intel agents, Jackass being a savant with technology, but honestly, I absolutely despise these two. As the attempt of comic relief in this game, these two are a complete mystery on the mark for me and if we're being honest if they weren't in the game at all there probably would be no difference in the story that couldn't be handled by any of the other cast they honestly drive me up a wall anytime we have to play as them and thankfully it's only about three times and we never see them in the series again while they do play a role on information gathering on locations of ships and information on Lansdale that's really the only point they play and I can't really see why they're even in this game at all so we're just kind of gonna leave them up here and with the players on the field let's get into the plot one of which is convoluted to say the least. Jill and Parker land on the boat, and while navigating the abandoned hallways, see Chris locked in a room tied to a chair. As Jill moves to unlock the door, we are introduced to the ooze, and upon entering the said room, discover this isn't really Chris, but a dummy plant to lure the pair into the room, being knocked out by a masked figure with toxic gas, reportedly to be a part of Veltro, the terra cell responsible for the terra grigia incident. Meanwhile, Chris and Jessica are in the mountains of Europe, investigating a Veltro base hidden away in the mountains. As Chris and Jessica make their way there, O'Brien calls them to inform Chris of Jill and Parker having gone missing in the Mediterranean, which given how Jill was sent to find Chris there, there's obviously something deeper going on. Chris and Jessica are redeployed to go find Jill and Parker, while Keith and Jackass are sent to the base. Chris just left to pull any information from the Veltro servers. Going back to Jill, she wakes up in the cabin on the ship, stripped of all of her weapons and gear, and is contacted by Parker, saying that they should be syncing up on the bridge. The two do link up, find their gear, and head to the bridge after combating the ooze all over the ship to find a video outlining Veltro's plans, that being to infect the world with the T abyss virus via the water supplies in the ocean as revenge against the FBC for murdering a ton of them during the Terra Grigia event. They are then attacked by FBC agent Raymond, who given his hair and creepily shaped head is obviously not on the up and up. In an attempt to call for help, Jill and Parker move to locate another terminal to open communications and call for help, but in doing so learn that Lansdale, still head of the FBC, is planning on activating the Regis Solus in order to take out the ship, erasing any evidence of the FBC's involvement with the Terra Grigia incident. The pair move at the behest of O'Brien to the front of the ship where a UAV armed with chaff grenades is located, able to mask the signal of the ship from the satellite scanner, and with the pair successful in this, stave off imminent death, but the subsequent wave of the laser leaves the ship flooding from down below. At the same time, Chris and Jessica land on what they think is the Queen Zenobia, navigating the ooze within, only to find that they are on the sister ship, the Queen Samarias. The wrong ship altogether, albeit with the exact same layout. They escape via boat and head towards the correct ship, contending with the giant tentacle monster under the water along the way. Upon reaching the ship, the two pairs meet in the casino, only to be confronted by the masked Veltro agent, who goes off on a long spiel about something deeper going on behind the scenes of the incident. However, before this information can actually be spilled, Jessica shoots the agent only to for him to be revealed as Raymond, the bad-haired guy we met earlier. Parker moves over to help him as they do have a history, but as Raymond dies, he whispers something into Parker's ear. Our two, four heroes decide to split once again, Chris and Jill working together to find and stop the T-Abyss virus from spreading, while Parker and Jessica work to find their way to stop the ship from sinking due to the flooding down below. Let's focus on Jessica and Parker for a moment. As the two make their way to the bridge, as Parker decides that he's going to confront Jessica, as Raymond has informed him that she was really an FBC mole working against the BSAA all 
all along. Raymond ends up pulling up, joining in the standoff, not actually dead due to a Kevlar vest, and as the two bicker on what they actually are going to do with Jessica, she shoots Parker in the chest and activates the self-destruct sequence on the ship and boogies on out. We leave seeing Parker and Raymond attempting to escape. Focusing back on Chris and Jill, the two reach the lab in the ship, only to be contacted by Lansdale, who spills the beans on the FBC and Veltro actually working together to cause the Terra Grigia incident from before in order for the FBC to gain more funding and unfettered power to operate as they see fit. He also informs them that he also had a cure for the T Abyss virus manufactured on the ship as well, and once delivered to him, murdered the scientists on the deck. The two destroy the virus as the ship begins to explode. Jill and Chris find Parker limping under the deck on their way to the helicopter to escape, and as they try to help him out, the catwalk below Parker drops. In a touching scene where Parker basically tells them to let him go so that way they can escape, an explosion occurs and he falls to his death, essentially sacrificing himself to ensure Jill and Chris could make the run to the helicopter and survive. Upon getting on board the helicopter, they are contacted by O'Brien, who tells the pair that this entire operation has actually been a ruse conducted by him in order to gather evidence on Lansdale's involvement with the Terra Grigia incident and working with Veltro, which naturally is now sitting on the sinking and molten hot ship that just exploded. He also informs the duo of the Queen Dido, a third ship in the fleet located under the rubble of Terra Grigia, which may hold some evidence to Lansdale's involvement. As Chris and Jill reroute to the remains of the ship, Lansdale appears in the BSA headquarters and arrests O'Brien and takes control of the BSAA, leaving Chris and Jill essentially flying blind. On board the Queen Dido, the pair find Jack Norman, the lead of Veltro, having been stuck after being betrayed by Lansdale, and is now infected with the t -Abyss virus. He injects himself with more virus, and after the mutation and subsequent defeat, they find a video recorded by Norman spilling all the information of the group working with Lansdale and the FBC to commit the atrocities over at the Terra Grigia event. Chris and Jill broadcast this back to BSAA HQ, and with this information now public, Lansdale Lansdale is arrested and O'Brien is back in control. However, as we see at the end, he steps down due to a sacrificial plan and involvement in the Queen Zenobia mission. We also learn that Parker is not actually dead, having been rescued by Raymond, and he goes back to the BSAA as well to continue working. Raymond, however, has also seemingly been triple-crossing everybody with Jessica, as we see the two meet up in a cafe to hand off a sample of the T Abyss virus to her, explaining he has his own reasons why he decided to rescue Parker off of the ship. We end this title with Chris and Jill, while Walking up to the Spencer Manor, the beginning of Resident Evil 5's DLC, Lost in Nightmares, and we fade to black on this. This campaign is an absolute doozy, as there is a lot going on here, thanks to the focus on literally nine different characters. While Jill and Chris's campaigns are fairly straightforward and fine on their own, the inclusion of the betrayal of O'Brien by concealing the true goals of the mission and entrapping Lansdale makes this plot way more confusing than it needs to be. This game's story essentially plays out like a giant spy novel, with double crossing and triple crossing hidden intentions in everyone's agendas, minus the pawns consisting of Jill, Chris, and Parker. What began as a simple mission to locate a friend turns into a web of deceit, backstabbing, betrayal, and more. The inclusion of Jessica and Raymond also being double or triple agents, depending on how you look at it, but really working together at the very end add a whole layer of confusion to the story, more than there should have been in my opinion. I do think that the Jill side of this story is pretty solid for a Resident Evil game, being the fish out of water and trying to figure out a way off of this ship from hell. However, the overarching focus of this game serves in providing more backstory for the BSA as a whole. Given how we see its rise to power after these events leading into 5, a goal that I think does actually get achieved here. Learning more about the organizations at play in the world does a lot to flush out the lore of Resident Evil going forward, seeing the full power of the BSAA from its infancy at work, only to have it juxtaposed next to the massive PMC-like organization that we see in 5. All in all, while a bit convoluted and not necessary to the overarching story of Resident Evil in the main line, this side story is still pretty solid, and while not necessarily a must-play, does shed a lot of light on our heroes that we've been following and will continue to follow in the next entries in the series. As always, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.
With the success of Resident Evil Revelations 1 in both reception and sales numbers, it made a ton of sense as to why a follow-up was made with Revelations 2. Tasked with bringing the old-school horror back to the franchise, as well as being marketed in this fashion, Capcom aimed to create a game that catered to the fans like myself, itching for a survival horror experience like its predecessor. But did Capcom actually achieve this? Is Resident Evil Revelations 2 actually good? At the time of this recording, 8 years after release? In this video, we aim to find out just that, looking at the good, the bad, the confusing, and everything in between. With that out of the way, let's hop right into it. This is Resident Evil Revelations 2, a retrospect. Being revealed in 2014, Resident Evil Revelations 2 was meant to be the follow-up to the original, this time being released on consoles rather than a handheld. With more power at its disposal, this could be seen as hopefully alleviating the handheld feel that was present in the original, even in the console board. And while for the most part this was true, Capcom decided to keep one major aspect that was in the original game, that being the episodic format. Releasing week after week for a month, Revelations 2 was doled out in a month-long period, something akin to a TV show. While this decision would be bizarre to do today, this was a way that Capcom could attempt to keep the game in the zeitgeist and conversation for a longer period of time, as was the case for old Telltale games and upon later release, the re rebooted Hitman. Unlike those others, however, Capcom made a smart decision to actually finish the game first and then dole it out then, ensuring that the fan base knew when the next episode would be releasing, as opposed to being left in the dark as many of us were for games like The Wolf Among Us and The Walking Dead. Much like the first game, this also gave multiple logical breakpoints in the flow of the story once all the episodes were out. Something which I actually appreciate being as busy as I have been, being a husband, dad, and business owner, especially here in the last few months. While the tedium of seeing the last time on Resident Evil Revelations is real when you're binging it, is also a nice quick catch up on the plot as well when playing it week to week. Along with the episodic format, Revelations 2 also incorporate two interflowing narratives with two different sets of protagonists, Claire and Moira, Burton, and the returning fan favorite, Barry Burton, and the mysterious girl Natalia. With each episode containing essentially two campaigns, with both being connected, as we will soon discuss in the narrative breakdown, there is a surprising amount of content here, along with two DLC campaign missions and the return of raid mode for more replayability, this time much more expanded than the first one. This package is honestly fairly robust, and while I've always struggled to engage with anything like mercenaries or raid mode due to not having much of a carrot on the stick pulling before as there is with like a story, it's nice to give players more options to keep them engaged. Keeping in tradition for this generation of modern Resident Evil, Co-op has once again returned, and with a new few tricks and mechanics up its sleeve. I feel this is almost the perfect balance of co-op in the Resident Evil franchise in utilizing the partner experience. Looking at games like 5, 6, and even Revelations 1, you were saddled with a co-op partner, or AI, where the main goal was much like yours, to shoot, loot, grab ammo, and heal the pair, as well as work together to solve puzzles, you know, all the major trappings in Resident Evil. In Revelations 2, however, the partner in tow has a much different experience than the main player itself. If you're playing Claire or Barry, shooting and pushing are the name of the game for these two, along with the other trappings like healing and the like. However, your co-op partners, that being Moira and Natalia, for lore reasons or the fact that one is a seven-year-old girl, cannot use a gun at all, resorting to melee attacks as well as locating hidden items and gathering information for the pair. Moira being equipped with a flashlight, she can also blind enemies to prevent their progression forward to hit them with a crowbar and allowing Claire to conserve some precious ammunition. Natalia, on the other hand, can see enemies through walls, sense invisible mutants that litter the island, and clock people in the head with a brick, while also sends hidden items and unlocked doors by crawling through tight spaces, allowing Barry to find more items, guns, health, and collectibles. Having a difference in your partner's playstyle can lead to the other feeling a bit more bored depending on how they feel about the mechanic itself, but having variation of play at least makes the partner feel that they serve a different purpose to the gameplay while also balancing the difficulty encounters for the solo player. While playing solo, you're able to switch between the partner as well with just the simple press of the Y or triangle button, allowing for the solo player to not miss out on the hidden items or interact puzzles as well. The main problem with this though is that co-op was relegated to split screen, meaning that you needed to actually be playing with somebody in the same room, as opposed to playing with somebody over the internet, which is all we do in this day and age. This is slightly mitigated on Steam with the use of remote play, but neglecting online co-op in the age of the internet, even in 2015, felt like a huge miss at the time. However, in the scheme of having multiple partners and as a solo, this change of pace does feel like a win. It is far more interesting partner experience tackled in Resident Evil to date. I hope that more is done with this idea in the future future, but at the time of recording this, that remains to be seen. Still, shout out to Capcom for implementing split-screen co-op, a long-lost art form in gaming as we have moved on to the internet future. I, I really do miss the days of old-school Halo split-screen, where you and your buddies would all be sitting in a room and just blowing each other up. Man, those are the good times. Continuing on the gameplay front for a bit, Revelations 2 takes a bulk of the systems introduced in the original Revelations and brings them forward to the sequel as well, and while not deviating much from the formula of Resident Evil at large, it still works well in the sequel. With introducing 
scarcity of ammo and meds and bringing the core of survival horror back to the main with the Revelation series, I do enjoy how this game plays still. Being actually low on resources makes every engagement just feel more interesting. The weaving of stealth mechanics that are new in this game on a basic level really evens the playing field as well, so if you're good enough to pull it off. Between slinking behind cover to stealth takedowns, you as the player are empowered to use any means at your disposal in order to clear the field and save multiple rounds of ammunition while doing so. I'm a sucker for stealth, so I welcome this addition. However, sometimes the vision codes of the enemies seem pretty busted in both ways, both being seen behind cover as well as literally walking in front of a biomutant without being spotted. These hiccups aside, I did enjoy this addition of the Resident Evil formula. There are two other massive changes introduced as well, one being the character squat, which we discussed prior, and the skill tree. The character swapping plays a massive role in combat, especially with Barry and Natalia. Natalia has some otherworldly powers, allowing her to sense biomutants nearby, whether alive or invisible. This allows her to not only sense those invisible ones that we talked about before, but the weak points on the mutated, regenerative creatures as well. You walk into a room as Barry, and Natalia informs you that she senses something nearby. You swap over to her and see a big yellow or red blob floating, heading in your direction. Now armed with the location information, you swap back over to Barry and take aim. You hear Natalia telling you to aim right or left, and once you're aiming over the enemy, she tells you to shoot. This feedback provides the player, while fighting something you can't see, is actually super awesome. Breeding tension is something that was either frustrating or trivial in prior games, and let's be honest, any game with an invisible enemy. I don't think invisibility is a very good mechanic in games as a whole, as the enemy that is actively hiding the key information from the player, like where he actually is, just feels bad to me. Natalia, however, helps mitigate this without the use of some marker on screen, but relying on the player to use her voice to put a cap in his proverbial ass. I do think Moira is mildly underutilized, however, as just stunning someone while good never feels as impactful of an addition as assisting and aiming at invisible dudes or finding weak points. Yes, she can find hidden items, but I never find myself switching off Claire all that much, whereas in the Barry campaign, I was swapping back and forth between Barry and Natalia in order to get some of that sweet, sweet, juicy information and seeing what's next. This was a fantastic utilization of the partner mechanic, and if it ever returns, I hope Capcom takes a lesson from here rather than 5, 6, or Revelations 1. I brought up the skill tree earlier, and as really the first and only one so far in the Resident Evil series, to have one, I feel that it's definitely worth talking about. Accompanying the mod system introduced in Revelations 1, 2 introduces a skill tree as well. To unlock said nodes in the skill tree, you spend points, or BP in the case of Revelations 2, that is earned at the end of each chapter section based off of the grade you get at the end of the level, allowing you to give boosts to both sets of characters on the same tree. Skill trees are a difficult thing to balance in any game. Making trees too powerful can break a game with overpowered abilities, like something you would see in Fallout with its perk feature, or if too weak can feel like a meaningless upgrade where you don't actually feel the power gained, and making the system feel basically redundant or a last minute addition. Unfortunately to me, Revelations 2 skill tree falls into that latter category. There are a couple of decent perks, like meds heal for more, carrying more herbs and the like, but then you have perks where your gun deals like 30% more damage when you're on your last bullet, something which can definitely save you in a pinch, I guess, but use case is narrow to say the least. I continue to invest in these because, like a mouse on a wheel, if a system is there, I will in fact engage with it. However, short of some healing ones, the difference I felt while playing was pretty minimal, where by the end game, I was just getting points on anything I could spend them on, rather than actively thinking and making meaningful selections about where to put my points in. Percentage boosts are decent filler, as is in the case of games like Path of Exile or even Final Fantasy X, as those generally lead to more meaningful nodes and selections along the way. Here in Revelations 2, however, it ended up feeling like a pretty redundant system that definitely could have been more impactful to the overall experience. While some of these are clever, like dealing more damage while crouched, if this entire system was stripped out, I don't think there would really be much of a loss or change to the player experience here. But we've talked a lot about systems, so let's get into the world and eventual narrative of Revelations 2. As mentioned before, Revelations 2 takes place on a secluded island, hosting a ton of facilities, ruined cities, and the focal point of the island, the tower in the center. In the past, we've discussed in prior videos how important a setting is to a game, and specifically in a genre like survival horror or Resident Evil as a whole. Becoming so engrossed in a space while wandering the halls, solving puzzles, and opening new areas in said space is what just makes these games click, which is why I was so fond of Revelations 1 and the Queen Zenobia cruise ship. Wandering the abandoned decks of the deserted floating murder house allows the player to learn the space intimately through exploration and lore, and allows the space to become another character in and of itself. While Revelations 2 being set on an island much like Code Veronica, we do lose some of that intimacy we get in a singular location like the Spencer Mansion or the Raccoon City Police Department. However, with the structure of the game being split into episodes, Capcom was able to focus each episode 
episode on a specific area of the island, such as the prison, the town, the city streets, the mines, and the tower itself. Each of these areas feels distinct, the prison feeling cramped and secluded, the town feeling abandoned and dilapidated, the mines feeling, well, like a mine, and the tower, erected by our big bad in this story, feeling like a looming presence over the entire area, not unlike the Black Tower that hosted the Eye of Sauron in Lord of the Rings. With each area being segmented off on their own, these areas do feel like a microcosm of the entire space, and hearkening back to other areas we've seen in the Resident Evil games thus far, filled with the lore, interlocking hallways, and puzzles to progress. Certain episodes, like the town and the streets, feel really linear, but combined with the other areas, it mixes the two styles of location, sprawling and wide, and yet narrow and secluded. However, there is a major fault, that being the two campaign aspect. You see, each episode contains a section of Claire's story, and then focusing on Barry's story, which is taking place six months later or so after the events of the Claire run-through. With the focus on this, by the time you finish Claire's campaign, that being about an hour or two, you then move through the same place as Barry, in almost the same locations, and navigating through a lot of the same obstacles, or even worse, obstacles that were already triggered by Claire, that you can just walk through. Navigating through the same areas twice in pretty quick succession really loses the luster in Barry's campaign, and while there are new paths taken to get to the next point, it doesn't do all that much to change it up, especially in the mine area. Backtracking is one thing, as you're still making progress throughout the space while you're doing so, and opening new areas of said location. Repeating the same locations just becomes a chore, and I wish Capcom had done more with the assets to change it up a bit more between the two campaigns, especially in the streets and the mines area. Those two felt like a slog while playing through it again just because it's all the same locations that we had already seen before but what makes these campaigns so truly different within them is the enemies that they are about revelations 2 taking place after 5 ends up being like the catch-all virus area here and i must say i kind of like it we are introduced to the t phobos virus a variant of the t virus which was a variant of the progenitor virus that has been altered to respond to the body's chemical response to fear essentially the mutation begins once the infected becomes scared enough these being a bulk of the enemies we see specifically in Claire's campaign, more mutated and crazed inmates who are all experimented on to perfect the virus. Mixed in with a little bit of Ouroboros from Resident Evil 5, these mutations progress to more horrifying creatures, given time, as we will see a lot of stitched together masses in, his, in Barry's campaign. While a lot of the base enemies act a lot more like cannon fodder, the enemy variety here in Revelations 2 is actually pretty wide and do a lot to keep the combat fresh, all culminating in a large standoff in Barry's campaign, where every type of these enemies are thrown at you in a completely wild fight. From the slightly mutated to the grotesque, the enemy variety and methods of killing you, and you killing them, are pretty solid here for sure, with the rotted being very similar to other creatures we will meet in the next game, the molded in Resident Evil 7. The bosses are pretty good as well, and unlike other games, many of these fights are actually comrades that you find along the way. From Pedro wielding the once helpful giant drill to Tyrant Neil, who may have been banging Claire when not a thousand percent, these bosses are all pretty interesting and fun to beat, with their own gimmicks and mechanics in between. While I think that the last box kind of sucks due to her just being relatively boring, this game's monster closet is pretty good overall. But with all the enemies, we also need to evaluate the narrative of Resident Evil Revelations 2, so let's go ahead and dive right in. As mentioned before, Revelations 2 is split into two separate campaigns, one focusing on returning hero Claire and Moira, daughter of old protagonist Barry Burton from Resident Evil 1, and the other one centered around Barry himself and a mysterious girl named Natalia, who he finds on the island while searching for his daughter Moira. So let's go ahead and tackle these one at a time. We start with Claire and Moira, who are part of an NGO called TerraSave, and upon the inauguration of their new headquarters, are captured by a mysterious group and taken to the secluded island known as Sedja Island. Now having bracelets that track the amount of quote-unquote fear they have, they are directed around the island via the Overseer, finding other TerraSave survivors who die along the way and discover the mysteries of the island. As the two make their way to the tower, the ominous presence down in the dead center of it, and where they believe the Overseer to actually be, Moira contends with her underlying issues with her father due to an incident where she got a hold of one of Barry's guns and accidentally shot her own sister. Firearm safety people, come on. After the incident and Barry's lashing out at her over it, the two are at odds, which Moira makes painfully obvious. Due to the incident, however, she's become vehemently anti-gun, thus never uses one, opting for the flashlight and crowbar instead. Everything culminates in the discovery that Neil was really behind the incident working with Alex Wesker, sister of Albert Wesker, main antagonist for the bulk of the Resident Evil series, and brought them to the island to, much like land Dale, took extreme measures in order to gain his organization TerraSave, more power with the government, and around the world. Alex Wesker, as an antagonist, is a pretty interesting callback to the original villain of the series, also being heavily involved with bio mutants in order to create a way to transpose her soul into another body, allowing
allowing her to essentially live forever. This is the reason why Natalia is on the island as well. Being seen as a suitable vessel for Alex's consciousness, as we see in the underlying lore as well as the DLC. In the confrontation with Neil, Moira overcomes her fear of guns in order to help Claire in a desperate move to stop him. In the confrontation with Alex, they learn of the project and experiment she had been conducting in the tower, and upon this revelation, shoots herself in the head and the tower goes into self-destruct mode. In the ensuing destruction, the pair is separated, leaving Moira to be stranded on the island while Claire escapes to find help. With the help of an old Hungarian man surviving on the island, Moira learns the skills to survive, only upon finding a BSAA patch six months later, knowing that this belongs to Barry and he's there to save her in an attempt to find them and be rescued. This is where we meet Barry, coming to the island based on Claire's report in order to find Moira. As I know I would if my daughter was stuck on a stranded island full of biomutants and absolute fucking craziness. Upon landing, he meets Natalia and throughout their adventure in searching for Moira, find a mutated Alex, who is still attempting to find Natalia in order to finish what she started. As the two search for Moira in the Battle of the Horrors, Barry and Natalia begin to bond and grow closer, becoming a father-like figure that Natalia never had. It's honestly kind of nice to see. During their time, Barry opens up to Natalia about his feelings on the incident with Moira and his regrets about their falling out, hoping that in finding her, he can mend what was broken, albeit maybe a little too late. Making their way to the tower, we see a mutated Alex again, injecting herself with Ouroboros, and upon her defeat, attempts to finish the meld with Natalia that she'd started six months prior, only to be taken out by a now hardened Moira. The three escape with the help of Claire in a helicopter and move into a normal family life. Or is it? For it's the first in the series in Resident Evil history that can have multiple endings as well, where rather than grabbing a gun to help Claire, Moira can just stay still, allowing Claire to escape herself, this leading Moira to be trapped in the rubble and then dying, leading to the bad ending where Alex melds with Natalia and escapes, as Barry can't bring himself to once again shoot a seven-year-old girl, even if she is infected with the psychotic mutant mind of Alex Wesker. Overall, I do enjoy the themes laid out here in Revelations 2. Focus on that father-daughter relationship and the break in mending back together. This theme permeates throughout the game, with Moira reflecting on her resentment towards her father. Meanwhile, we play as her father, who's attempting to make amends and save his daughter, imparting that fatherly relationship with Natalia as well. Much like how Revelations 1 focused on thematic ties to the Divine Comedy by Dante, we have here in Revelations 2 the focus of Kafka and his novella work. Many of the titles of these episodes and themes being pervasive throughout, especially the novella Metamorphosis, which is what Alex Wesker's entire plan is based on, the supplanting of consciousness into a new form. Episode 3 is titled Judgment, based on the short The Judgment, where the main theme deals with the strained relationship between a child and their father, much akin to Moira and Barry, as this is also the chapter where Barry levels with Natalia and Moira with Claire about the incident that strained their relationship so long ago. The amount of links between Kafka and Revelations 2 are numerous and is deserving in a video in and of itself, so if that's something you guys and girls would like to see out there, let me know in the comments down below. Mixed in with the camp of the main plot and dialogue we are used to seeing in Resident Evil games, the themes underneath are really quite powerful, as long as you're willing to look a bit past the surface. While a lot of the game does not revolve around the main plot itself, mostly moving from place to place, the inter-character dialogue does a lot to flesh out these characters and how they operate, what they're thinking, and their motivations for staying alive, as well as conveying the main themes that we see here in this game. I really like the story of Revelations 2 and how it weaves here, and do find it's definitely worth laying through to explore yourself. The game does a pretty good job in bringing some of the personality to the island as well, something which is important to these kind of games, and while I do wish it was a bit more confined than it is, being on this island is absolutely terrifying, if also a little sad as well. All in all, I really like what Revelations 2 set out to do and say, and as a Resident Evil game, it's a pretty solid entry. I really hope that the spin-off series of Revelations gets a third entry, as the two games in it already are honestly pretty damn good. Focusing on the core pillars of the franchise while also bringing the new school blood that we see in the newer games has made for a good duality of games, and while Revelations can get in its own ass sometimes with the book references, Revelations 2 does a good job at linking the inspiration with the material on screens. Thank you all for your time, and as always, my name is Brendan, and I wish you luck in diving into that back catalog. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Resident Evil has never been afraid to morph with the times, evolving with trends as the years went along. Having covered a bulk of the mainline games on the channel thus far, minus some of the spin-offs, I've watched and seen this franchise transform from a slow-paced, tension-filled excursion into a globe-trotting, action-packed gore fest. But with Resident Evil 7, Capcom took a brand new direction in its survival horror franchise, a soft reboot in most regards, taking the franchise closer to its roots while changing how the game is fundamentally played. But with all these changes made, was Resident Evil 7 actually good? And how does it fare compared 
compared to his last eight contemporaries that released prior? Well, let's find out. But for now, let's smash these yellow painted crates, wolf down some intestines, and hop into Resident Evil 7. Just a quick editor's note before we get into the video, I've been suffering from a cold that seemingly won't go away, so I may sound a little bit more stuffy and nasally than normal, so I apologize in advance. Thank you guys for understanding, and now let's hop into Resident Evil 7. You were right. I did lie to you. I shouldn't have... All I can say is that if you get this... Stay away! In 2015, PlayStation VR owners were treated to a demo only known as Kitchen. In this, we play as an unknown player, strapped into a chair with a video camera pointed at ourselves, while essentially watching a murder, and subsequently our own, through a female character. This tech demo is one of many released at the time as a marketing blitz for the machine to promote the newest headset in the VR race. Capturing the attention of people around the world, having a horror experience in VR brought a whole new sense of terror to a video game. At no point was there an inclination that this was really tech demo for something that would eventually become Resident 7. In June, 2016 at the PlayStation E3 showcase, we get the first trailer for Resident Evil 7, specifically referencing the kitchen trailer that we played prior, as someone walked through the same kitchen as the VR demo itself. With Resident Evil 7 being fully VR compatible, Capcom set out to create a realistic first-person horror experience, taking the franchise back to its roots that was in Resident Evil 1. From the demo itself, it is clear that this new direction for the Resident Evil franchise was created to take what we know and love from the franchise itself and modify it with all the trappings and experiences the gaming scene had provided when it came to horror, taking influence from games like Amnesia, Outlast, and most obvious of all, PT, or playable teaser, for the now cancelled Silent Hill reboot. Releasing a playable demo for the first portion of the house, we will see in the final game, millions of fans were scouring the demo for weeks for hidden ghosts, easter eggs, and any bit of information that could be gleaned from the demo itself on the direction this new Resident Evil game would be taking. It hit all the benchmarks as well, great sound design, hyper environmental realism, puzzles, and the slow plodding footsteps through the hallways of what we know as the Baker Estate. But the most the captivating aspect of all was the playable VHS tapes, allowing players to experience the past rather than how most games tend to do it, where you either just watch or listen. Needless to say, this demo created a ton of hype for not only Resident Evil 7 itself, but for the PlayStation VR as well. In January of 2017, only a six month gap between announce and release, I got my hands on this game to brave the horrors within. We play as Ethan Winters, who receives a mysterious message from his lady love Mia, where there is obviously something wrong going on specifically with her, telling him to stay away. As as most men would do, we ignore the warning and go off into the swamps of Louisiana to find her. Approaching the estate, we get the usual trappings of any horror game. Mutilated animals, pagan ritualistic deer heads hanging on branches, locked gates, figures walking into the seemingly abyss until we make our way inside the house. The same house from the demo, in fact. Armed with nothing but your good looks and charm. While exploring, we locate the same videotape and by playing through it, watching this TV crew seemingly get mutilated and hunted along the way to discover a handle that leads to the basement. Navigating the basement of the guest house, we find some bodies, clippings of missing persons reports, blood, and best of all, Mia. Naturally, she is manic from being locked in a cage underneath this creepy house around dead bodies, bloods, and torture devices, but there are some odd idiosyncrasies in her words, referring to someone as daddy and confused of what message Ethan received as she has no memories of making it. Looking for a way out, something snatches Mia through the wall and as Ethan continues to search for her, we find her crawling out of the basement we just left with something obviously wrong. After a stabbing, beating your girlfriend with an axe, all of it culminating into Ethan getting his hand cut off with a chainsaw. all in first person, and more importantly VR by the way, Mia scuttles off into the attic like a mutated grip. By now, Ethan should probably be leaving the house as most people would do, if anything, to get that nubbin he just now got taken care of, seeing as how you should always pick up your hand. However, as in any good horror movie, our hero continues to chase the hand-cutting culprit, essentially putting some rounds into her with a 9mm he finds in a shelf somewhere, and gets knocked out by a grown man wearing wellies. There is a ton in this intro sequence to Resident Evil 7 that I truly admire, and as a snapshot of the game itself, 
executes almost perfectly into dragging the player into the horror. This game is the first in the Resident Evil franchise to bring the horror to the forefront, most notably through the means of changing the perspective down to a first-person camera. Now, Resident Evil diehards will point to games like Umbrella Corp and say, yeah, that was a first-person game, and they would be right. However, built as a first-person shooter with no tension whatsoever, as well as having sold extremely poorly to the fact that nobody remembers it, I think it's fair to say that Seven brought the core of the franchise to the first-person perspective, and it really works in its favor for the series. Being third-person for so long, there is always a separation between character and player, not allowing things like gore and jump scares to be nearly as effective as they are in first-person. Playing the game through Ethan's eyes really enhances this horror and tension built up through the intimacy and closeness that brings an unease of moving forward, much like how you may have been scared to walk down a dark hallway as a kid because you were afraid of dark. Not knowing what could be lurking around the next corner or dark hallway really ratchets up the tension and release required horror games today, something that was lost when Capcom moved away from the forced perspective of the original games. Resident Evil 7 does a lot to play with this as well, as the inclusion of VR, waving items in the player's face consistently, you know, those VR trappings that we've come to know and love. When Ethan gets his hand cut off, for example, he holds it up to his face, allowing the player to see and experience the blood squirting from the cut veins in pretty gruesome detail. Aiming for graphical realism in Resident Evil 7 was a major standout for me in this game as even six years later. This game is still probably one of the best looking games I've played to date, if you don't look at people's mouths and cutscenes that is. The lip sync here is actually horrible, to the point where I can't pay attention to what Mia's actually saying because I'm just staring at her lips and her freakishly shaped teeth. Outside of the mouths though, this game is a looker thanks to the new RE engine. I'm not sure what black magic is behind this engine, but after being showcased here for the first time in Resident Evil 7, I can see why Capcom has moved all internal development to this engine and it's really worked out for them, even to games like Monster Hunter. The detail in each area in this game is exquisite, and while there are always be some hiccups here and there with the occasional texture pop in and so on. The amount of environmental detail, ambient dust particles in the air, and lighting all knock it out of the park. Horror games rely on their environments to build up the fear and tension these games require, and with the attention to detail and fidelity of the environments, Resident Evil 7 really knocks it out of the park on this front. Seeing Ethan reload the pistol using his forearm as he no longer has a hand is a great example of this, as the reload takes much longer while he has one hand, all while Mia is rushing at you with a chainsaw. The state of the Baker estate dilapidated rotting, and in the state of condemnation, brings a scare factor even when nothing is actually happening to the player. The lack of music outside of a safe room also does wonders to build the tension to the player, only hearing the plodding of your footsteps while wandering the halls in this rotting husk that may once have been a pretty okay place to live, makes each ambient footstep creak and house moan that much more intense, as breaks in the stillness creates that anxiety in which we all fear, the fear of silence. Think about it. How often in your day-to-day -day life is it ever just quiet? There's always white noise going on around the hum of your AC, your PC fan whirring, traffic passing on the streets around you, airplanes flying above your head. When it is silent, that is accompanied by a cause of unease, like something is wrong. Resident Evil 7 does a lot to weave its visuals and sound in order to keep the player on the back foot, tense about what could be next, and as a horror fan, this is the shit I live for. However, what is with this title song? While listening to the song in its entirety does become a bit eerie at the end, this beginning sequence has always felt weird and out of place to me, with this loud strings and reverberating vocals. It just never fit, and I had to get that off my chest at some point in this video. Now, after playing 8, this song does hit a little bit different, but all in good time, my friends. But while the space and sound may be great, what good is space if we don't have gameplay? So let's move over to the gameplay front of Resident Evil 7 and see how it stacks up. I told you to stay out of here! Uh, It's pretty amazing to me how well the core gameplay loop of Resident Evil as a franchise translates to a first person setting, as all of the standard trappings are here with some twists thrown in to make it not so feel so samey as its predecessors. Every system we have known and seen in the classic Resident Evil games are distilled down to the core in 7. Ammo is still in short supply, especially going into harder difficulties, weapons no longer have an upgrade path, herbs are similarly in shorter supply I found, however the lack of ammo and med strength are mitigated by combining herbs and gunpowder with chem fluid or strong chem fluid, forcing 
the player to make that all-important choice when finding some. Do I make ammo to kill, or do I make health to survive? This push and pull system has been sorely missed for me in the franchise in the latest centuries, and I'm happy to see it actually make a return here in set. While red herbs are gone, I do think that combining the resources to make ammo and first aid juice was the right move, adding to a feeling of scarcity that is inherent in the survival horror genre like we've seen in the old games. Limiting the types of guns here I felt was a good choice as well, essentially only giving you a handgun, shotgun, flamethrower, grenade launcher, and the all-important magnum. You do get a machine gun later towards the end of the game, but you don't have it for a very long time, and honestly, this gun kind of sucks, as it feels like you're just shooting them with peas, so... Eh. This limitations of weapons makes each one stand out more, all having a special use case depending on the scenario. The flamethrower for scorching bugs, shotguns being great for crowd control, and your pistol being your natural bread and butter throughout the game. However, aiming in this game feels incredibly sluggish, and the speed that you pull the trigger felt the same. Have you ever fired a gun? I know that in my time shooting, I could probably shoot a 17 plus 1 in the amount of time that Ethan takes to fire 4 rounds out of the pistol here in this game. While I feel this was done to create tension to the player, there being a part of me that wishes that I could just mag dump onto a molded. In fact, balance wise, I think this may actually help the game seeing as how sparse ammo can be. Allowing the player to burn through ammo if mashing the trigger out of fear or a jump scare may actually be an interesting experience as this would lead to more resource churn and provide more tension through those lack of resources. Just a thought. My other major gripe is the speed at which Ethan actually moves throughout the house. Slow and plotting was the way of the original games, and in the general walk speed, I actually like how slow it is. It fits with the character and the situation given, as I know I wouldn't be speed walking like the mall grandmas if trapped in this hell house. However, much like Resident Evil 2 and 3, the Baker family roamed throughout the area in order to hunt you down and put it into your trespassing, leading to many chase sequences, either scripted or just emergent while playing, if they tend to catch wind of you. The sprint here just feels too slow, as even when running full bore down a straight hallway, the speed at which the Bakers just walk will outstrip Ethan's ability to run, making running almost futile if caught. I do understand the reasoning for this, as the game is trying to incentivize you to run and tuck into a room and hide, and especially in the first section of the main house. That is almost impossible to do, as you need to run past Jack to get a key, and then run past him again to unlock the door to the basement. This can happen quite often due to the cramped nature of the house, and while tents never felt truly fair. Speaking of keys, we also see the return of key items that allows the player to further explore the house, and while not much more needs to be said, I'm glad to see these return to form, making exploring and backtracking a rewarding experience once again. Throughout the different areas of the house too, there are golden coins placed hidden throughout the home. The coins, if collected, can unlock upgrades to Ethan himself in the form of stems that can increase your health or reload speed. While not a drastic boost, these do feel worthwhile in order to add to your survivability, rewarding the players with a keen eye or for those of us who use a guide. While the systems at play here in Resident Evil 7 are all ones that we've seen prior, this game really does well at taking the series back basics, and while I have some gripes with the guns and the movement, overall I found this game just pretty fun to play through again for this video, serving to both empower the player and breed tension player as well. Narratively, however, this game does stumble quite a bit, so let's get into the story and the DLCs to follow. No, I, I actually envy you. What? You don't believe me? <laughs> this toy? Well, you can't fake this. As we discussed before, Resident Evil 7 starts off fantastic in the guest house, and once being knocked out is when the game truly opens up. We are introduced to the four members of the Baker family, Jack, Marguerite, Lucas, and the Grandma, each with their own personalities, traits, most of all mutations. Jack, the patriarch of the family, large and brooding, is also slightly manic, fighting Ethan to hurt him over and over again, cackling maniacally and sacrificing himself in order to try to, you know, kill Ethan. Marguerite has become bug-like, controlling mutated mosquitoes, creating her nest in the boathouse, losing her her temper at the drop of dime for someone not following her direction, she seems the most unstable of the group, requiring Jack to put her in her place pretty often. Lucas is their teenage son, hellbent on messing with any intruders by creating elaborate murder escape rooms not unlike something you would see in Saw. Sporting his Louisiana prison jacket, he's the sneakiest one of the family, who can also seemingly regenerate with the help of the mutation, much like how we see in Jack. This coming to the fore after he gets his hand cut off at dinner like it was nothing. Lastly, we have Grandma, who shows up randomly throughout the house, just 
staring, wide eyes boring to your soul while watching your progress. The first part of the game is split into areas for each of the three. The main house being controlled by Jack, the boat house being controlled by Marguerite, and the workshop under Lucas's domain. We're introduced to Zoe back in the guest house, seemingly hiding away from the rest of her family as they have all gone insane and are looking to kill her as well, despite her also being infected, as we will learn in a later DLC. Ethan wakes, tied to a chair at the dinner table, hands stapled back on with a strange watch attached around the staples. This watch reflects his health, much like how the back line represented Isaac's health in Dead Space 1. Being treated to a gnarly dinner of rotting flesh and intestines, I think? We get the family dinner sequence that was seemingly made for anyone playing this game in VR, forcing the intestines into your face, prying Ethan's mouth open with a knife, and after the family boogies off, we attempt our grand escape. I love this scene as it does a great job at setting up the players for the story ahead, and as we will learn in the end, set up the main antagonist as well. Come here, boy. Oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. He's not eating the jack. He's not eating Shut the hell up, Marguerite. Get the hell out of here. You're a son of a bitch. As we attempt to escape, Jack heads us off, and after escaping to the first safe room that's in the laundry room, we are contacted by Zoe again, telling Ethan to get to the trailer outside so she can maybe help him out. While searching for the key to the main foyer, a cop appears in the window, and after pleading with the suspicious cop to help, he hands Ethan a knife and says to meet him in the garage. In doing so, and trying to explain the situation, which is obviously pretty hard to explain and really fucked up, our cop meets his untimely demise at the hands of Jack, where we have our first fight, eventually impaling him against a pipe in a garage by driving a car into it. We find the key to get into the main area of the house, finding keys, items, solving light puzzles, and upon his return with you in the bathroom, bow chicka bow wow, avoid a prowling jack. Moving to the basement of the house, we discover the new type of enemy, the molded, essentially being morphed from living black mold that has infested the basement of the home. These guys are very reminiscent of the ooze in Resident Evil Revelations, this time colored black and less formed than their predecessors. Dropping from the ceilings, tucked in corners, and emerging from puddles of this mold, these guys alone pose little challenge. However, their ability to appear behind you, seemingly unknowingly, does well to keep you on edge. And if they swarm you, it's a pretty bad day. While not my favorite version of infected monsters by far, as they do feel generic and boring, blocking the hallway with their large forms forces Ethan to engage, using some of that sweet, sweet ammo that we've collected along the way. Making our way to the meat locker, we spot the item we need to head outside, the head of a dog puzzle leading to the door outside. And in the reach for it, Ethan is ambushed by Jack once again, leading to a second fight with him ending in a chainsaw duel to the death. This time, however, we get to battle the infection inside of him, as when he bends over, the mutation reveals itself, with Ethan taking the glorious chainsaw to it until it pops, leaving Jack with just two legs and exploded gore and goo. Escaping the locker and headed to the front door, we run into Granny again, in a subtle, unsettling scene, where she just is sitting around a corner, only staring with no obvious way of how she got there. It just really creeps me the fuck out, if I'm being honest. Like some of the best horror is, where nothing happens and leaves the player with more questions by your presence than you get answers. Escaping to the yard and moving into the trailer, Ethan gets another call from Zoe, informing Ethan that Mia is still alive, but infected with the same virus as Baker's. In order for them to escape, Ethan must get the ingredients to make a serum to cure them both of the infection so it doesn't escape the bayou. She says her mother is the last one to have them, thus Ethan makes his way to the boathouse to locate the ingredients and recipe for the cure infection. Upon entering the boathouse, it becomes clear that this place is suffering from a different sort of infection in the main house, this time being overrun by tainted bugs, seemingly controlled by Marguerite, using your creaky cracky lamp and loud screeches. This area is a lot smaller than the main house, so after navigating the multiple docks, rebuilding a flamethrower, and evading Marguerite, Ethan makes his way into her chambers, where he finds a shriveled up fetus and a recipe for the antidote, requiring parts from other test subjects to be made into a sort of goo that would cure the infection. However, the door is locked with the weight switch, one side sporting an unlit lamp, eerily similar to the one we've seen Marguerite tootle around with. Heading back to the main area and looking in a hole, we see a scrawny, deformed arm reach over and snatch the lantern, only to scratch a glimpse of the spider-like figure scurrying away into the hole. Giving chase to an abandoned home, Ethan encounters a fully mutated spider Marguerite crawling around the walls, bursting in and out of holes on the ceilings and floors, and scurrying around outside the building, only to be laid out after a long and honestly pretty annoying fight. The amount of time she hides to spawn more eggs or just does not appear into line of sight makes this fight drag on way longer than it needs to, and it's easily 
easily my least favorite one to do, even while I enjoy the spectacle of it. Lamp in hand, Ethan makes his way to Marguerite's room, where everything seems a little off. Being pitch black minus your flashlight, child laughter in the distance, Ethan reaches a child's room, finding a secret room behind a bed. We catch a glimpse of a small girl as well, both in full body and just her little toesy woesies, and after obtaining the sample fetus parts, the molded spring up to attack as Ethan mad dashes his way out of the area and back to the trailer. But a little girl? Huh, seems on the nose, but let's press on. Reaching the trailer, Ethan is greeted by Lucas, revealing how he now has Mia and Zoe both captured and needs to reach him in the workshop part of the house in order to free both of them. Being locked out, Ethan goes to the dead cop's body and after digging in his neck hole that once again seems played up for VR, we grab the key and head inside. After battling some molded, we enter the room where Lucas is hiding, one of his murder escape rooms. Astute observers may remember this from a videotape found earlier where the cameraman from the first video of the show crew is locked away, solving puzzles that will inevitably lead to his ultimate demise. If you found this, you know the solutions, but if you don't, you're treated to a small series of rooms, locks, and puzzles, all ending in an explosion and chasing Lucas, where he escapes and you run into Zoe and Mia all tied up. Ethan frees the parent as Zoe makes the serum, they're once again attacked by Jack, this time so disfigured and mutated he's hardly recognizable, minus the insults hurled your way. Taking this massive beast down requires, like most fights later in this series, the shooting of the orange pestles, and finally injecting Jack with one of the vials of serum that were made, leaving only one left. Ethan must make a choice, and your choice dictates what ending you actually get. However, while you make this choice, there's really only one that is canon, that being inject Mia and leave Zoe behind. While I do wish there wasn't a choice of canon here, the illusion of choice is kind of nice, if only truly surface level and eventually retcon to only having one option. For those purposes, we will focus on the Mia choice of the story, as Zoe's is mostly the same, minus a separate set of events set prior to the game. Now it is here that, for myself and many other fans of the series and maybe this game, Resident Evil 7 should have ended. It makes sense, right? We took out the three main bakers, leaving Grandma alone to be creepy, we saved Mia, and we're leaving the estate. With a tight 8-10 to 10 hours right here alone for just a regular playthrough filled with horror, puzzles, action, and every other trapping of Resident Evil, while there would be some loose ends like the girl and the grandma, Resident Evil 7 could have ended here and been a nice tight patch. However, and this is my main gripe with this game, we are only halfway through, so unfortunately, we must press on. Ethan and Mia, leaving Zoe on the dock, come across a giant ship stranded and beached in the swamps. They are then attacked by a girl named Evelyn, knocking out Ethan, and in this state, has a vision of Jack, normal, unaffected by the mutation, who tells Ethan that Evelyn was just a little girl they took in, but she is truly the root of all the events that transpired, their infection, the mold, and what happened to Mia, as she is able to control people using the infection she gives them. He begs Ethan that he and his family were once good people, brought to do horrible things due to this girl, and asks Ethan to kill her for him. We switch to Mia's perspective, being captured on the ship itself, and begins searching for Ethan. While she moves through the ship, she has visions of Evelyn, begging her to come back to her and be her mommy as she was before. Mia has no recollection, and upon reaching the captain's deck, Evelyn forces Mia to watch a videotape of how everything began. Turns out that Mia was actually in charge of Evelyn once, working for an unknown corporation who created Evelyn with the infection and was planning to deploy her somewhere in Central America in order to test her out. This all goes awry when Evelyn escapes, causing the tanker to flip while infecting everyone on board, all to force Mia to be her mommy. Mia resists and the boat goes to ground in Louisiana, and both Mia, who is now infected, and Evelyn have been taken to the Bakers. Present day Mia realizes that it was because of her that Evelyn is the way she is, and feels responsible for the incidents that occurred, most of all bringing Ethan into this entire mess. Finally locating him at the bottom of the ship, she forces Ethan out of the boat, sealing herself inside with Evelyn, succumbing to her own fate. Ethan, ever determined boyfriend, makes his way through the mines, discovering along the way the truth about what Evelyn was, that being part of the E series of virus meant to control and destroy a community or country from within, with the power of mind control mold. Being always alone, Evelyn grew to have an obsession with wanting to have family, hence the forcing of Mia to be her mother and subjecting the Bakers to be her new family. Well, we also learned that Lucas, while infected, was also working with a different shadow company and had a serum that allowed him to resist the mind control effects, allowing him to freely research Evelyn and the virus as well. With the samples of Evelyn's DNA handed to him by Mia on the boat, Ethan was able to create an antidote that would destroy Evelyn, if injected. Eventually, Ethan and makes his way back to the farmhouse, battling tons of molded, and eventually Evelyn's powers as well, and upon injecting her with the antidote, realizes that it is actually Granny Baker the entire time. Being injected unleashes the power within the virus, causing Evelyn to mutate into a massive creature, destroying the house.
As Ethan struggles to fight back, he is saved by a helicopter bearing the Umbrella logo, and after the monster's destruction, a revamped Chris Redfield appears to put Ethan into the helicopter to go to safety. We see Mia in there as well, both saved from the horrors of the swamp and head off into the literal sunrise. Overall, Resident Evil 7 for the first half game is peak horror. Contending with the Bakers, each in their own motif and style of infection, brings these characters to the fore that Resident Evil has never really accomplished before outside of Wesker himself. The house to me is peak Resident Evil in this game, with its winding hall always locked rooms, dilapidated structure allowing for quick escapes, and the battles with Jack and the other Baker fam members are all tense and honestly creepy. Marguerite, while annoying, is not much to tend within the boathouse. Being able to just run by her and tanking her bug swarm to each safety ends up being a spectacle of a fight, if not annoying. Going through Lucas's domain brings the puzzle solving to the fore, and having a change of pace here keeps the game pretty interesting. With pretty excellent pacing not being anywhere for too long, where it overstays its welcome, this first half of the game keeps everything fresh, and moving with some phenomenal set pieces along the way. Where this game falls apart is after the choice of who to save. The boat sequence feels like it lasts forever. And with the introduction of the machine gun in this area as well, makes everything feel like a shoot shoot fest rather than a tension filled horror house that we got in the Baker estate. And after playing through it once as Mia, you go through it again as Mia, this time with everything broken. It feels like it lasts forever. It really sucks the fun out of everything that this game had going for it. Then blasting through the minds as Ethan also feels overwinded, being a pure combat sequence that honestly, I just tried to sprint through rather than fight, despite having the slowest sprint known to man. The introduction of Evelyn as the catalyst for everything would have been better if not campy as all hell, focused solely on finding a family and yelling that everyone was her mommy, daddy, brother, or sister. Plus, his ability to teleport everywhere really breaks the groundedness that this game had had thus far. I know that's weird to say for Resident Evil, but still there it is. But think about it, having a mold that mutates and infects a family is honestly a way more interesting premise than a little girl who makes the mold by puking and is also trying to infect everyone around her to take care of her. The whole Evelyn story just felt sh like a strange left turn, one that honestly wasn't needed. I'm also of two opinions of the reintroduction of Chris at the end of the game and subsequently in a DLC. On one hand, it's nice to see Redfield again, especially after his turmoil he contended with in his own head during the events of Resident Evil 6. However, there's a side of me that really wishes that this game was a completely segmented off in the rest of the franchise, giving the series a new start with a new style of game. A lot can be said for Ethan as a protagonist, and while I understand many of the critiques about him being whiny, constantly confused, perpetually delays thought process, and generally not the smartest of heroes, and despite all this, I like Ethan as a protagonist, as he's a far cry from any of the heroes we've had in the franchise thus far. Portrayed as an everyman hero of the series, he is a man with no training, just searching for his girlfriend who's been missing for three years, who's been thrust into this batshit scenario that, let's be honest, most of us wouldn't really know how to deal with either. And while he suffers from a massive appendage injury that is seemingly cured by first aid water and staples, there's always need to have a suspension of disbelief when playing games. And incidentally, this also gets answered in the next installment of the series, as Ethan is also the first protagonist to have a back-to-back -back entry in the series. Even with such little time, it's easy to sympathize with how Ethan reacts and comments to the events around him. I'm glad to see his return in 8 as well, and I hope that Resident Evil keeps having more of the everyman protagonist approach, rather than gritty, hardened soldiers. Resident Evil 7 also had a ton of DLC support as well, and a lot of it was actually pretty good. Starting off with the band's footage series, which is just a series of mini experiences that adds some new content to the package, the two biggest stands out are Bedroom and Daughters. Bedroom follows Clancy, the cameraman that was seen in the first found tape at the beginning of the game, locked in a room in Marguerite's boathouse. The entire experience boils down to another escape room, having the player solve a series of puzzles, all while paying attention to the time in order to hide in bed as Marguerite come periodically to come and check on her prey. If she catches you out of bed or catches something in the room that's off, she either makes you eat intestines or hurts you. And if this happens three times, you lose and have to restart. This mode is by far one of my favorites, due mainly to the tension built with having jumped back into the bed, hook yourself back up to your handcuffs as you hear Marguerite clomping up the stairs to you. The other one, Daughters, is a lore-heavy experience, focused on the day the Bakers changed, bringing Evelyn into their home. Taking place through the eyes of Zoe, it's interesting 
interesting to watch how the bakers change to become the monsters we know them as, all due to them taking a little girl who seemed to be needing help. It adds another layer to the baker's story and honestly made me feel even worse for them in their eventual conclusion. I mean, they're just trying to do a nice thing and this is the thanks that they get? Fuck, dude. It makes me not want to help anybody ever again. We also have some smaller things to take up time, like a game of poker with Lucas or feeding Jack for his 55th birthday. And while fun for a bit, don't stick around long in either a gameplay front or a lore front. Two more releases followed, however, Not a Hero and End of Zoe. Not a Hero follows Chris Redfield directly after saving Ethan in a much more action-packed focus experience. Chasing Lucas due to his involvement with virus research, Chris battles his way through the mines, saving his fellow members, or not saving for the most part, of the new PMC Umbrella Corp, whose mission now is to stop bioterrorism via force, keeping the Umbrella name in order to atone for their past mistakes in creating the T-Virus. While short, the culmination of taking Lucas out after his mutation is a fun romp, even if it's pretty straightforward as it sounds. End of Zoe, on the other hand, takes place following the Not a Hero DLC, Umbrella now having set up a cordon area around the Baker estate in order to analyze the infection occurring there. You play as Joe Baker, brother of Jack, alligator hunter, and family man. Joe finds Zoe encased in crystal and being taken by Umbrella in order to get her cured and researched. Being chased by other mold mutants, Joe takes Zoe across the bayou, looking for a cure, taking on molded with nothing but his bare hands. While it's pretty fun to punch the shit out of some molded, this story basically begins and ends with the final showdown with Jack once again in a new mutated form, a boxing form. Duking it out with fisticuffs, Joe eventually gets a cure and Zoe comes back to life and is free of the infection. While none of these add a ton of meaningful plot to the package, having these side additions to further explore the world in the setting of Resident Evil is always welcome. In playing everything for this video, still had a great time just playing them. But at the end of the day, how was Resident Evil 7 as a package and entry in the series? Honestly, it's probably one of my favorites. With the introduction of a true attempt to bring some horror to the series, the almost seamless transition of the first person horror, and bringing the tendency of the original Resident Evils to bear in this title, it is still a treat to go back to, even having played it about 7-8 times through the multiple consoles, from Xbox to PC, and even on VR for a bit. The inclusion of interactive lore and backstory in the VHS tapes was an awesome addition, weaving these in with cool flair, and while long in the tooth towards the end, the first half of the game is almost peak horror. Taking bits and pieces from the renaissance of horror gaming we received over the years since the release of Resident Evil 6 and bringing them to 7. This game did a lot to revitalize the series, and it showed in both fan and critical reception. Resident Evil hits almost all the high notes, and even with its missteps at the end of the game, it is definitely worth your time in playing for the either the first time or going back for another stroll through the Baker Estate. Until next time, thank you for your time. My name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Welcome to the family, son. Yeah. <laughs> Coming off the windfall that was the success of Resident Evil 7, Capcom announced Resident Evil 8, the continuation of the story of Ethan Winters, this time heading back to Eastern Europe in a Resident Evil game that is unlike any other, while also being almost a carbon copy of one of the best Resident Evil games ever made, Resident Evil 4. But even while fighting the lichens, smashing up dolls, and running from tall vampire mommies, how does Resident Evil 8 stand up to the rest of the franchise? Well, let's go ahead and dive on in and find out. With that out of the way, let's dive into Resident Evil 8, A Return to the Village. Then let's devour his man flesh quickly, Mother! But I am the one who captured him! Now, now, daughters. First, I must inform Mother Miranda. But later, well... There will be enough for everyone. <laughs> what am I? We open the campaign on a highly stylized telling of a children's book, Village of Shadows, where an unnamed girl gets lost in the forest picking berries and receives gifts of sustenance from the local monsters, blood to drink from the bat, a dress from the dark spinstress, a scale from the fish. Upon reaching the mechanical horse, the girl takes the gear from his body, only to be captured by a witch, trapping the girl in a mirror. The story ends with the girl's parents searching for her, her father staying behind to fight the witch while the mother frees the girl and escapes to safety. This amount of foreshadowing is not obvious at the onset of the game, but anyone knowing of Resident Evil 8 can see that these events actually depict what is yet to come. We zoom out, once again taking the protagonist of Ethan Winters, three years after the events of Resident Evil 7, now having settled down in, in a seemingly quiet life with his wife Mia and daughter Rose. Mia asks Ethan to put Rose to bed while she finishes dinner, and as we carry the baby upstairs, we are given a chance to reflect upon, with Ethan himself about his family, his current life, and the events prior to everything that's about to occur. There is an obvious weight he is carrying with him that isn't just the baby. Having received combat training from Chris, 
seems to worry if Mia is actually okay, worry that Rose will grow up to be okay, and that the events in Louisiana haven't affected them too much. Seeing the sight of Ethan or any protagonist hit strong for me personally as, you know, I am a dad, and given the shit that they went through in Louisiana, there's an obvious reason to be concerned. I mean, shit, Mia cut his hand off with a chainsaw for God's sake. Placing Rose to bed, Ethan heads downstairs, setting the table for dinner as Mia confronts him with being distant and not the normal Ethan self. During this altercation, the lights cut, shadows move outside, and out of nowhere, gunfire ensues with Mia being filled with more lead than our paint had in 1962. Chris appears and Ethan, rightfully so, is confused and most of all angry as he sees one of the soldiers taking Rose out of her bed and into the back of a car. In the struggle, Ethan is knocked out and thrown into the same car as her. To say that this scene just comes out of left field would be an understatement, and as the setup to the events to come really works well to kick off the events that will ensue, creating that mystery that will spur both Ethan and the player to continue forward in the events to come. So, let's take some time and discuss the gameplay of Resident Evil Village. As with any other game, this may be one of the most important aspects we actually must discuss. Resident Evil 8 continues with keeping the game in the first-person perspective we were introduced to in 7, and I'll be honest, I really hope we continue to get games in this style in the Resident Evil universe. While I enjoy the third-person perspective as well, there is more added tension to being in the shoes of the hero himself, rather than looking over the shoulder at all times as it was in the past. The ability to put the player's face in the gore and guts works on a greater level than observing from afar, not to mention first-person perspective once again gives Capcom more tricks up their sleeves to create suspense for the player, not being able to just shift the camera around the corner to see what's up ahead and force them to commit to actually making that turn. And while Resident Evil 8 is not nearly as horrific in the sense as its predecessor was, it does have a lot more varied forms of fear and tension, which keeps the game feeling fresher and better paced than even 7 did doing the same tricks and techniques over and over again. Lady D's Castle focuses more on the chase sequences a la Mr. X or Nemesis. House Benevenito works more to create the true angles of horror with the soundscape, lighting, and the fact that you're just completely disarmed, something that's never really happened in Resident Evil before. Moreau's area focuses on the body horror and the tension of the large monster chases while navigating a ruined floodscape, and Heisenberg focusing on the tension of combat, both with the factory and with the lichens as well. And while some aspects may not work for you on the horror and tension front, with the variety on display here, it's hard to argue that this game's pacing makes it one of the most fun Resident Evil games to date. I haven't talked about the replayability of these games very much in subsequent videos, as there was never really a draw to, for me to push the speedruns to unlock more items for other playthroughs. However, with the way this game actually plays, I finished this one probably no less than 9 times, actually pushing speedruns to try and unlock everything that I possibly could. The moment to moment in this game is a blast, and while I have a ton of issues with the story, that doesn't stop me from just enjoying the moment to moment action of this game. On a gameplay front, this may be the biggest change from Resident Evil 7 to Resident Evil 8, that being the amount of action on display. The amount of enemies you'll be blasting your way through in Village in just the first 30 minutes trumps the amount that we had in the entire runtime of Resident Evil 7 by far. However, this combat feels a lot more on par with Resident Evil 4 as opposed to 5 and 6. Having spacing between combat encounters to allow the player time in between to catch your breath, slow down, gather your wits, scratch for materials, and prepare for the next area or encounter. It was due to this pacing that made this game the most replayable for me, as just moving through the village, blasting through lichen, running from giant vampire mommies, and battling giant biomechanical mutants with magnet powers makes this game a breeze to play through. With the over-the-top camp, cheesy dialogue, and an actual banana pants story, while not out of pocket for the Resident Evil series thus far, made this game probably one of the most fun for me. While I love horror, the tension it brings, and the heartache of death, it's nice to just kick back and kill stuff while keeping some of those survival horror aspects as well, like puzzles, backtracking, resource scarcity, and the like. Does this sap the tension of the game, however? Well, a bit yes and a bit no. You see, the ability to craft ammo is back again, this time in larger chunks than 7. The enemies of Resident Evil 8 also don't mess around. The lichens are fast, with large, seemingly never-ending packs of them pushing you from all sides, keeping your head on a swivel while trying to maneuver through the village, the ruins, and their cave systems. The mechanical mutants in the last area are ever pressing forward, able to take tons of shots unless you know where to shoot and have some halfway decent aim. And the rotting vampires cloaked in the basement areas of the castle, while slow and zombie-esque, do well to hide in the geometry, lurking underwater, behind barrels, and amongst the shelves in the castle area. With these enemies, as well as the expert pacing of this game, the tension has a great ebb and flow, and while Ethan is given more power to handle the enemies within, the monsters in this eastern European town have tricks up their own. Boss fights make their return here as well, and while Resident Evil 7 attempted to change how these fights worked, 
Resident Evil 8 does them maybe the best, with each boss in the area being a completely different style of fight. Lady D morphs into a giant bat to fight in uber close and uber long range attacks, swarming and forcing the player into a tight circular area while also pulling back to shoot from afar. Lady Benevenito forces the player into a game of hide and seek, sorting through a dilapidated estate full of chattering dolls searching for the bride doll amongst the chattering plastic and enamel. Moreau, using his poison to attempt to trap the player in the sunken village, is also chasing Ethan throughout these rotting streets and raining poison from above, and Heisenberg is that spectacle gimmick fight, Ethan using a tank-like vehicle to blast all of his shiny glowy parts underneath swarms of metal, and while Mother Miranda uses all sorts of magic to consistently barrage the player with attacks. All of these fights, serving as bookends for each area, are a spectacle on the visual front as well. The mutation's horrific, the monster's disgusting, all ending in a death scene, that brings a sense of accomplishment to the player unlike any other game in the series so far. All of the trappings of 7 are here on the gameplay front, and taking them all up to 11, we do have some additions taken from games in the past that we need to discuss as well. So let's waste no time in talking about my boy, Duke. Remember the shopkeep in Resident Evil 4? The iconic... Over here, stranger. That emanates from the purple flame torches, giving a sign of hope and relief from the horrors of Spain. Well, let me introduce you to Duke, the mon giant monstrosity of a shopkeep, your sign of hope in this unforgiving landscape. Selling you items, ammo, weapon parts, and upgrades to guns, Duke not only serves a purpose in Resident Evil 8, but in a lore and story front is critical to the success of Ethan himself. We meet Duke after meeting all the big bads, escaping the tunnels and traps of Lycan, and as Ethan walks up to Castle Dimitrescu, we meet Duke, who mysteriously shows up in order to aid Ethan on his quest to save his daughter Rose. Offering access to his warriors as well as providing hints and history to the player, Duke serves more or less as the guide to Ethan in this hellish place. It all becomes clear how intertwined Duke is after getting the first jar from the castle, where Duke informs him that you're holding Rose's head in a jar and goes into the background of each of the lords of the area. Even after collecting their calcified corpses and selling them to Duke, it's obvious he knows more about them than he lets on at the very beginning, giving his excitement for collecting the remains, giving a little bit of backstory, and buys them for a great price. Along with providing you upgrades to your weapons as well as cooking for Ethan to boost his stats. Duke is maybe one of my favorite shopkeeps of all times. Given the amount of memorable lines he has, the grotesque nature of this very helpful beast, the amount of charisma, jokes, and knowledge, and the fact that at the end of the game he straight up just saves you. It's hard to fathom a better shopkeeper, besides maybe the singing ones in Crypt of the Necrodancer. <laughs> In the past games of the series, we have focused a lot on the world and play space of Resident Evil, given how critical of a role it plays in both the gameplay, style, and memorability of these games, and Village is no different. As the title spells out for you, Resident Evil Ace takes place in an Eastern European village, and while larger in scope than Seven, the areas visited here are distinct and memorable and some of my favorites in the series. We begin our journey in the village, winding roads leading to run-down wooden or cobblestone houses, abandoned to time and rightfully so given the circumstances. I mean, who would stay in the middle of a village full of lichen attacks? Oh, wait, these guys here. The village itself serves as the hub area for eight, branching paths leading to the different realms of the different lords. There is a ton to explore here in the village itself, especially as Ethan begins gaining key items like cranks and keys in order to scour the abandoned houses for anything that would give him an edge. I love taking the time to scour the village, battling the monsters, hiding in the corners, and as the setting and play space is awesome to explore, with new paths opening up, changing the world through your actions or just with time. There's a ton to explore here, and given the amount of upgrades and treasures you can find, it's definitely well worth doing. As mentioned before, I mean, hell, I think this is the first Resident Evil game that actually introduced side bosses as a thing, killing them, gaining you tons of different money or upgrades for your guns. These fights are hard as fuck, let me tell you. But while not so much lore based, they're just kind of fun to do. Mentioned before, each lord has their own space as well, each one reflecting their themes and main characters. However, even given how distinct they are, they still all really flow well with each other, minus one area which we will get to. Lady D is housed in the looming castle, with her and her daughters prowling the abandoned mystic halls, adorned with treasures and honestly in great condition, minus the blood wine cellar down below. This area feels lived in, and while 
Certain less occupied areas are a bit more run down or even flooded. The main bedrooms, hallways, and kitchens are all immaculate, well lit, and ominous all at the same time. Lady Benevenito resides in her house, ruined to time, housing photos of her and her doll. That is, until we move to the basement, or when the hallucinogens kick in. You see, Lady Benevenito. <laughs> 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 ha! Gotti! Gotti! Ha! Lady Benevenito uses hallucinations as her power. So as we dive into the basement, it becomes a dark, if well-maintained, science lab and hidden bedrooms, which only become more grotesque as time goes on, as Ethan's psyche becomes more and more fucked with it. Moreau, the fishman, inhabits the flooded village down by the dam, navigating the waterway to activate the dam and drain the village, exposing the mold and the rot that water causes to wood if submerged for far too long, fitting for a giant fish man who spews poison. We also explore the lichen nest, nestled in the ruins and caves by the town, cramped and secluded away to allow them to breed and transform. However, the one area that I've never enjoyed or understood and doesn't ever seem to fit with this game in its themes is the Heisenberg factory. Sporting the look of quote-unquote low industry, corrosion and rust infest the still-functioning halls. This area has always felt long and boorish, each area feeling... More of the same as the last, which was never the case for the other areas in this game. That change and morph as you make your way through them. I wish that they had done something different with Heisenberg in his area, or just got rid of them altogether, but it is the way it is, and thus we have to deal with it. But it's definitely a low spot for me when it comes to the settings of this game. However, given how great the other four areas are, it's hard not to see Resident Evil 8's level design and portrayal as anything other than great. A space that I would never want to live in, but also had me coming back time and time again to wander through. But with every setting, needs a story, so let's waste no time, and let's hop into the story of Resident Evil 8. This is your spoiler warning if you haven't played this game before and you don't want to know what happens and any of the narrative this is your point to back out and thank you for watching all right those guys are out let's fucking hop into this one boys we return back to the story to ethan coming to on the snowy ground secluded in a dark snowy brush wandering our way through the brush following the sounds of crunches and blood trails throughout the snow we reach the cliffside overlooking the village going down ethan wanders into one of the homes to be greeted with a shotgun in his face a panicked man listening for the sounds on the roof handing ethan a gun ethan and said man are then attacked by a lichen ripping the guy through the ceiling and ethan through the floor filled with dead bodies as we shuffle a corpse out of the way again ethan loses one of his fingers to said lichen that being bit off ethan has really bad luck with his hands and after killing him, is only ambushed again by an entire pack of these beasts, including a tall one with a giant hammer and a dope-ass beard. As Ethan succumbs to the waves of enemies and is about to have his head caved in like carrot top in a watermelon, the like it back off, leaving Ethan alone with the crazed old hag, speaking in riddles about how his daughter was about to be sacrificed to somebody named Mother Miranda. Making his way through the field, we meet up with some of the survivors of the village, and during their prayer session to a person called Mother Miranda, we can tell that something just isn't right here. Nope, not at all. So it may be a good thing that everyone here is either mauled by a man turned into lichen or burnt in the fire that overtakes the house. Moving up to the castle through a locked door, we are confronted by our first lord, Heisenberg, trapping Ethan in metal and taking him to the meeting place of our major antagonist. Much like the dinner scene in Resident Evil 7, we come face to face with all the bad guys in our story, listening to them bicker about who was going to get the honors of murdering Ethan. It's here that we meet our five main antagonists, Lady Dimitrescu, Lady Benevenito, and her doll Angie, Moreau, Heisenberg, and finally Mother Miranda. It's clear that Mother Miranda is the leader of this group, both from the actions of the lords regarding Ethan's capture as well as what we learned from the prior sequence before with the survivors. Being the leader of this cult, all eyes look and worship towards Mother Miranda, giving credit to all of her, their powers to her. We also get the snapshot of all of our other four lords here, Lady Dimitrescu being fanciful and, for lack of a better word, posh, but with a very mean side to her given her reaction to Ethan being given over to Heisenberg. Heisenberg being full of himself, knowing that he's hot shit, but seemingly cool about it. I mean, look at that trench coat. He's just a cool fucking guy. Everybody beating up on Moreau is obviously the punching bag of the group. And Lady Benevenito is quiet, her doll Angie doing all the talking for her, acting like she's hopped up on 
epinephrine or something like that. As the group bickers on what to do with Ethan and who will get the reward of disposing of him, Heisenberg is rewarded, setting his lichen on Ethan, chasing him through the cave systems full of traps, spikes, and most of all, monsters. Escaping the cave, Ethan makes his way out and finds himself back at the door he was captured at, the door leading to the castle of the vampirist Lady Dimitrescu. As mentioned before, we meet Duke and head inside, only to be captured by Lady D and her daughters. Strung up by his hands with meat hooks, Lady D leans in to get a taste of that sweet, sweet blood of Ethan, only to emerge from her drink, complaining of him being stale. Now, this is what we call foreshadowing. Left alone, Ethan escapes and wanders the halls of the castle, looking for masks to place on pedestals to open the way out. As Ethan makes his way through, avoiding the looming vampire, Mommy, in dispatching of her bug-ridden daughters, Ethan finds the keys and begins to escape, once again being snatched up by the eight-foot giantress herself. And as he stabs her with a dagger found in the tomb, she transforms herself into a massively mutilated bat-like creature, and after a long battle on top of the tower, the pair fall. Lady Dimitrescu finally ended. Finding a container, Ethan heads back to the village, learning of the fate of his daughter from Duke, that being that she was basically quartered and put into jars, the one he currently has in his hand being her head. Learning this, Ethan sets off to find the other jars holding his child's body parts in hopes to bring them back together again. This whole section here has a lot of ideas and gameplays not dissimilar from Resident Evil 2, Lady D and Mr. X serving almost the same role as the ever-hunting antagonist, meant to thwart and divert Ethan to in his goal of escaping. While foreboding, the AI is pretty easily manipulated here, as there are a ton of areas to act as triggers to get her to go away. There is also an awesome chase sequence in the wine cellar where she appears out of nowhere after cutting off Ethan's hand again before he makes his escape. It puts his hand back on using the first aid magic juice. And while this is bizarre and makes absolutely no sense, like how do his clothes stitch back up together, this is explained more towards the end, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. After the castle, we set off for Manor Benevenito, and after wandering through the graveyard, we find a giant mysterious grave surrounded by flowers in a strange elevator with a slot asking for Ethan's memories. Inserting a photo of Mia and Rose, Ethan heads down where he is confronted by a hallucination of Mia herself, leading him to the house. Making his way into the basement, Ethan finds the next baby jar part next to the doll Angie, but as Ethan reaches for it, the lights go out and the scene changes. Here we find a mannequin of Mia needing to be pulled apart, cut up, and the like finding clues and items to solve the puzzles of the basement. As more and more are completed, the scene begins to change, becoming more gruesome, dark, with cries of a distressed Mia coming over the radio, all of it culminating in being chased by a monstrous mutated fetus wandering through the halls. Making his way up the elevator, we catch a glimpse of the beast, and as a fan of horror, I wish that this wasn't the case here. The tension built with being chased by something you don't ever see is peak horror, leaving your imagination to come up with what the monster could actually be. Upon showing the weird baby thing, I audibly laughed, as this thing honestly looks disturbing and yet oddly funny. Horror thrives on the unknown, and once the creature of any sort of game or movie is a known quantity, it becomes inherently less frightening. That is not to diminish how terrifying this section is. Being disarmed in a Resident Evil game turns this section to something more akin to the games like Amnesia or Outlast, a risk that I think actually paid off, given how people actually feel about this section. I'm curious though, did you guys find this part absolutely terrifying or was it kind of a joke? Let me know in the comments down below. Anyway, getting upstairs, we move to the Angie fight, which is just the game of hide and seek that we spoke about earlier, stabbing dolls with scissors until dead. Once Angie is stabbed for the third time, the hallucination breaks, showing that Ethan has really just stabbed the puppetress, Lady Benevenito, herself, killing the host and not the puppet. Coming to this realization, we grab the jar and head out to Moreau's area, battling more lichen along the way. Especially this giant one who really sucks. Unless you stand in this house and blast him with a sniper rifle, then the fight just becomes a joke. Just FYI. Heading down to the reserve, we meet Moreau as Ethan attempts to steal the jar from the unsuspecting pudge of a beast. Rather than R-U-N-N-O-F-T... Ah! Ah! Get out, boys! I'm gonna R-U-N-N-O-F-T! Ethan waits for him to turn around to ask what he was doing with Mother's special child. You begin to feel kind of bad for Moreau here as he begins to beg for you not to take it so the rest of his siblings won't make fun of him, until Ethan realizing this was a ploy to just get by time to block off the exit with his sick sticky goo. I mean, look at this dude puking, man. It's pretty nasty. Finding his way to the fishing hamlet, Ethan makes his way to the abandoned house, or so he thinks, as it's filled with research equipment. Being attacked by a soldier, we run into Chris Redfield again, telling Ethan that he's meddling in things he shouldn't be meddling with. And despite the fact that a day ago, Chris just blasted his wife and stole his kid, 
How could Ethan possibly think about sitting back and not be involved is just beyond me and honestly slightly bothers me that Chris never explains what he was actually doing or why he did it until way later in the game. But before the two can finish arguing, they're attacked by a giant water beast that is now Moreau, having transformed in an attempt to stop Ethan from escaping with that jar. Running through the flooded village, Ethan turns on the power to the dam, drains the water, and takes care of this lord pretty handily, escaping again to a room where they first met. Here, Heisenberg comes over the TV, telling Ethan to get the last jar out of the Lycan stronghold and then meet up with him in the factory. In doing so, while fighting hordes of wolfmen, as well as the chief from the beginning with the giant hammer and the dope-ass beard, Ethan gets the final jar and places them in the altar that looks suspiciously like the Umbrella logo, opening the final gate leading to the factory. As discussed before, this place stands out as the one area that A, I hate, and B, doesn't fit with the rest of this game. In meeting Heisenberg, he asks Ethan to help him kill Mother Miranda by giving up his daughter Rose, as her powers are what Miranda is scared of most, as she has the potential of being the most powerful bioweapon ever created. Ethan rejects the offer, only looking out for the best interest of his daughter, in which Heisenberg responds by Spartan kicking Ethan's ass into a hatch down into the factory, only to be met with a mutated mechanical soldier with a giant airplane propeller for a head. Escaping, Ethan makes his way through the factory's four levels, finding his way to the top to reach the hopefully way out. Meeting a host of mechanical monstrosities along the way, these guys all kind of suck. Once you understand that the sniper rifle to the red spot essentially is a two to three hit kill, these guys are kind of a joke, with never having more than two or three of them coming at you at one time. As you make your way through the factory, they do become more armored, but in that armor, they are slowed down a ton, making it pretty much a breeze to just flashbang them and run away. The final encounter with old Propeller Head again is the final boss of this area, but unlike the rest of the mechanical soldiers, this fight is an absolute blast. With the focus being on getting behind him and shooting him in his power bank, this fight consists of just dodging the charge and flames shooting out of his face, and then turning to try and get a shot in whenever you can. I love this fight as the walls break around you while the Propeller Beast charges you over and over again, unrelenting in its pursuit to make Ethan into some sort of minced meat. Escaping the factory, we meet Chris again, this time actually explaining to Ethan what's happening. It turns out that Mother Miranda had captured and impersonated Mia. In order to capture Rose, due to her dormant powers Heisenberg discussed before, in an effort to bring her back as a vessel for her daughter. Chris also explains that this entire village was a giant experiment by Miranda, as she was experimenting with the mold known as the Megamycete that is located in this village, and that everyone we murdered up to this point was one of her experiments gone wrong. Ethan, having dealt with mold in Louisiana, naturally wants to help. When Chris gets a call that Miranda now has all of the Rose Jars, and upon arming Ethan with the polymer tank to fight Heisenberg, promises to get Rose back. Upon defeating him in a giant swirling battle of swirly twirly metal tornadoes and blowing off weak points ethan is confronted by miranda who runs him through ripping his heart out and ethan passes away chris screaming over the radio in the background it is here that the game shifts perspectives to chris in an action-filled section where we blast our way through dozens of lichen in order to get to the mega my seat underground that's the mold route if you don't remember what that name is as it wasn't said until about five minutes ago Making his way to the center of the village, Chris spots a BSA helicopter land and asks his team to follow up on that. This will come into play a little bit later, but not so much. Breaking his way through the caves, Chris discovers a massive mold structure below, the Megamycete, in case, once again, you don't remember because it was introduced five minutes ago, and plants some kind of explosive on it. Hellbent on getting revenge on Miranda for killing Ethan, he begins to head to her last known location and makes his way to the labs below, the labs of Miranda. It is here that if you decide to read all the notes of the area that you can actually learn a lot about what's going on here. That the mold is the same one that was in Louisiana. That the mold roots absorb the consciousness of those who died in the area and also imbue anybody infected by the mold with super regenerative powers. You here learn as well that the local populace were basically just served as experiments for Miranda, leading to the creation of Lady D, Lady Benevenito, Moreau, and Heisenberg, being the best out of all of them, were made by injecting them with a parasite derived from the mold known as Kado, I think. Miranda, it turns out, was instrumental to the creation of Evelyn from the last game, also an unworthy host, and that Rose may in fact be the perfect vessel to bring her daughter back, who died of the Spanish flu years prior. There's also a nod to Oswald Spencer and Umbrella Corp here, as he was a student under Miranda 
before beginning work on the T-virus. In the lab, Chris also locates an actually alive Mia, and in taking her out of the cage, lets her know the fate of Ethan and his desire to still save Rose. It is here that the biggest revelation actually comes out, through Mia telling Chris that Ethan is far more special than he even thought, and that he is not actually truly gone. Fading to black with this news, it's obvious where we go from here. To say that this is a lore dump, however, is an understatement, and while I like the attention to detail and all the biochemistry that actually occurs here, it pains me when Resident Evil puts all of this into readables, rather than telling or showing the player. I mean, let's face it, not a lot of people actually read these things, and if you're not paying attention, all is all of this is just lost to you. This game, if you don't know anything about this, really goes off the rails, which it is, but with no context of what the rails are to begin with. I personally love collectible and readables in games, as lore dumps is the shit I love. However, this is key information to what is actually going on in Resident Evil 8, which makes it all the more odd that this info was here and not in a cutscene or anything leading up to the final events. This all very well could have been spread out throughout the rest of the game, but I digress. We will analyze more here shortly, so let's get this fever dream out of the way. We once again take the shoes of Ethan, waking up in a weird cold wasteland, where we once again meet Evelyn from Resident Evil 7, who after Ethan protests, informs him that he was not actually killed by Miranda, as he was already dead long before that after the fight with Chainsaw Mia in Louisiana when Jack captures them. It turns out that the only thing keeping Ethan alive was his mold infection, essentially becoming a mold monster himself. This explains the amount of bodily torture Ethan goes through with no real effect due to the regenerative powers of the mold. While this revelation explains a lot, it really seems to jump the shark here, with the reveal essentially being that you were part mold for two entire games. This turn of events really feels like the writers had painted themselves into a corner and they needed a way to keep Ethan alive and going, as well as explain the power of the healing juice not actually being the cause of limb regeneration or limb fusings back together. I personally can't stand this reveal as well as it takes a lot of that feeling of the everyman Ethan Winters and once again makes every protagonist in Resident Evil some sort of super badass, even though this time you are actually one of the infected, which is a slightly interesting twist. Following the taunts of Evelyn, Ethan comes to in the back of Duke's wagon, who is bringing Ethan to Miranda, as he assumed that Ethan would want to go and finish the job and save his daughter. Being the badass he is, I love how Duke is ride or die by Ethan, even while Ethan is essentially falling apart. Reaching Miranda, he sees Rose reborn. In the struggle to rip the baby from her hands, Miranda absorbs Rose into her body and the fight begins. Now, this fight is pretty awesome, with the amount of different forms Miranda takes in order to stop Ethan is vast and ever-changing. It's a long battle, but eventually Ethan wins out, and as Rose, and Matt, as Rose emerges from the remains of Miranda, Ethan begins to fall apart, his hand calcifying and turning to dust as he passes out. Awoken by Chris, carrying Rose and assisting Ethan, they attempt to escape. Ethan knows his demise is imminent, and rather than go forward with Chris, pulls away, taking the detonator, and heads back to the expanding mold growth. He tells Chris to look after Rose, and struggling the two part ways, Ethan making the ultimate sacrifice by making sure the bombs go off, destroying the village, the mold, and Miranda in the blast. Chris boards the helicopter, informing Mia that of Ethan's sacrifice, and learns that the BSAA, the, you know, the helicopter we spotted before, had actually sent bioweapons dressed as soldiers to fight Miranda. And with that knowledge, the crew heads to the BSAA headquarters in Europe to get answers, while Mia cradles Rose in her arms, mourning the loss of her man. The helicopter drifting into the sunrise gives a feeling of hope to fight another day, and we fade to black. That is until the after credit scene appears, where we see an, a now grown-up Rose speaking to a grave that is her father's. One who she never really knew, until being called back to a black van, threatening the government agent there that she has powers even Chris doesn't know anything about, and the car drives away, meeting a man at the end of the road. And with that, Resident Evil 8 is in the rearview mirror, and we truly end this game. I mentioned before, but I have replayed this game more than any other Resident Evil game so far, minus maybe 7. seven. Hold still. And in looking at the story and actually writing it down, I have to say that even by Resident Evil standards, this one is by far the most outrageous and bananas of a story compared to any other games thus far. From the very beginning with Mag dumping Mia, who we now know as Miranda, to the very end, 
and the gun battles with the mold roots and learning that Ethan was a mold man all along. This game goes out of left field to the realm that is, for all intents and purposes, kind of stupid. However, it's not the overarching story that I like here, but the smaller beats that occur during the game. I love wandering the halls of the castle. I adore slinking into the dark corridors, avoiding a giant mutant fetus in the Benevenito house. I enjoy dodging a giant fishman in the hamlet, avoiding the poison, and running from plank to plank to avoid the massive beast. After the Moreau section, however, is where the game really begins to take a turn. I despise the factory section of this game, as it feels like it could basically be cut in half and would still be far too long for this game. The power fantasy of blasting away mutants as Chris is fun, but loses that survival horror attention and is filled with so much story as to what is really going on here that it makes me wonder why this couldn't have been spread more throughout the game, which is about, you know, an 8-10 to 10 hour runtime. Backloading every reason and reveal of a story into the last 20 minutes of a game or movie always feels bad. It makes it such that the lore, story lore dump, the s- aspects of what the game is trying to convey, is easily missed. As the player has little time to comprehend or come to grips with what is actually happening. Even if everything was spaced out a bit better for this overarching story, I feel it could have done it more justice and service, but that's not the case. As mentioned before though, this game does a great job with the villains of Resident Evil 8, the best in the series by far, making every step along the way feel pretty great, which is why this disappointing ending hits so much harder for me. But given the pacing of the areas, the world of the different lords, and its fun kinetic gameplay, threading the line of survival horror and action beautifully, it's hard not to say that I didn't have a ton of fun with this entry of the series. With the DLC added last year, allowing you to play the entire game in third person like the old games was a nice addition, and I did also enjoy the Shadows of Rose DLC. Focusing on Rose herself, she travels into the memories of the Mega Mycete Shard. Now remember, this can hold consciousness of people who have died, keep that in mind, with the hopes of finding a way to be rid of her powers. While traveling through the remixed areas of the base game, Rose runs into a warped and twisted version of the castle, Lady Benevenito's manor, and the village. Running into an evil duke, another version of Evelyn and Miranda, whose memory that was imprinted on the Megamycete lured Rose into the mold itself. Being helped along the way by her father, Ethan, allows the two who never truly met to bond, allowing Rose to actually feel and know something about her father and have a newfound respect for him. A sweet moment that hits pretty strong as a dad myself. All in all, while this ending was pretty disappointing for the main game, I still had a great time playing Resident Evil 8. Focus on the characters of this sick and twisted village, and is a pretty great follow-up to 7, tying up loose ends to the story, albeit in a super rushed and kind of bizarre way. But as always, thank you guys for watching this video. Thank you all for your time. My name is Brendan, and I'll see you all in the next one. Later. I know. Growing up playing games in the 90s, it's always amazing to go back today and play some of these old games from my childhood, re-experiencing old titles on the hardware we had back then. Going back to Resident Evil 1 in our retrospective video we posted some months ago really highlighted how far technology had come from visuals, audio, and even game design. Resident Evil 1 was a stellar game back in the day, but by today's standards, it definitely looks a bit dated. Hell, even the jump from the 5th generation of consoles like Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1 to the 6th generation from PlayStation 2, Dreamcast, and GameCube shows just how far a leap in technology is actually made. Even in just 6 years, Resident Evil 1 goes from looking like this... ...to this. Introducing Resident Evil 1 Remake slash Remaster HD. Released on the GameCube originally in 2002, and then released with an AI-enhanced visual update in 2015 for the modern hardware like PS4 and Xbox One. 
In the sliding scale of remakes, even seen with later additions in the Resident Evil franchise, Resident Evil Remake is by far the gold standard for how this should be done. Taking the original formula from what made the original so beloved and adding on top of better visuals, better audio, gameplay tweaks, and enhanced puzzles, while keeping the core experience basically the same. For anyone looking to get into the Resident Evil franchise to see where it all began, this one is definitely my go-to answer for what they should play first. In this video, I want to get into the differences between the two games, the original and the remake what changes were actually made, and if they affect the core of the original title. So if you like this type of retrospective content, please consider subscribing to the channel. I would greatly appreciate it, and it would make me a very happy boy. But for now, let's dive into what makes Resident Evil Remastered the gold standard in game revisitation. Ugh. For better or for worse, remakes and remasters are going to be a continuing trend in gaming from here on out, and with the role that Capcom's been on lately with the remake products it's been putting out, like Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 4, there's always a question that is floated out there whenever these are announced. Hell, I even see in your guys' comments, that is, how much and what should and will be changed when it comes to being remade. As diehard fans of the series, this is a very valid and all-important question that constantly comes up. That being, what, what are they actually going to change? It's pretty clear in the games that we loved of old are, for lack of a better word, inaccessible in today's market. Due to either hardware or software costs for retro games and consoles, as these have just skyrocketed and gone through the roof. I mean, I sold a copy of Resident Evil 1 for $100 on eBay about six months ago. And with the forever debate of whether emulation is moral or justified, and let's be honest with ourselves, these games are just kind of inaccessible on a gameplay front. While much of the hardcore is either reminiscent or forgiving on how old games used to play, for the modern and general audience, these games are seen to be playing like crap, bouncing potential new fans off of the games that you and me love. In order to accommodate new trends, new hardware, and new inherent standards of games, concessions will have to be made. Hence the question, what is changing? In terms of Resident Evil 1, and going back to this remaster, it was honestly pretty amazing to see how well the core of the original was preserved in this remake, while also bringing in more than just a facelift and a new coat of paint to this original hallmark of the PlayStation 1. But again, the age-old question is, what changed? So, let's find out. When it comes to the narrative and what you actually do in Resident Evil 1, it's basically the same. Alpha Team is sent out to the Spencer Estate to respond to the disturbance and disappearance of Bravo Team. When the helicopter goes down, the group is chased into the mansion by demon dogs, forced to find a way to escape while traversing through the same area, the main mansion, guest house, courtyard, underground tunnels, and finally the laboratory. And while I do miss the original FMV cheesy-ass cutscene at the very beginning, this new rendered one is far more cinematic and does a wonderful job at setting the tone for what is to come in the game. From the helmet cameras, to the dogs gnawing on dead bodies, to the chase sequence to the house. While I love the original, that first cutscene definitely does not capture the essence and tone that this game was going for even back then. Which is what this remake really nails as a whole package. The tone. Playing once again as both Jill or Chris, you're left scrounging for materials, solving puzzles, and blasting or avoiding zombies along the way. The biggest change that is obvious from the get are the visuals here. While this seems to be obvious given the amount of time between the original and the remake, Make it is still stunning to see the same locations in such dr drastic amounts of detail. Sticking with the pre-rendered backgrounds for the remake, everything looks nearly photorealistic, albeit even in this HD remaster a little washed out just because AI isn't really good at this yet, or wasn't in 2015. This time with the inclusion of dynamic lighting, depth of field, and realistic shadows crossing the walls as your character runs or walks in front of a lit candle mounted on the wall. Given the power of the PlayStation 1, one thing I did realize while playing the original was just how bright everything was. Despite only seeing lit candles on the walls while also taking place at night. This was obviously done due to the limited color palette and also allowing players to see, and with given how lighting technology was in 1996, made it difficult to render realistic lighting sources and how light actually works. In the remake, however, lighting is scarce, drenching the abandoned or not so abandoned hallways and shadows, some areas only having candles lighting your way, like in the underground tunnels. Not only does it make the mansion feel more realistic, but also lends to the tension and horror vibes the original game seemed to be going for back in the day. Dark hallways and shaded corners in the house full of zombies and biomutants brings a more inherent tension to plodding through the corridors and just this simple change in lighting does wonders to create that buildup. Coupling that with the enhanced audio, allowing for the plodding footsteps to change based off the type of surface really brings the space to life in a way not captured in the original. Mostly just being due to technical limitations of the PlayStation 1 at the time. 
Well, Resident Evil has never been quote unquote scary in a sense that we know horror games to be now, there is no denying the amount of tension built from the improved visuals and sound design. I played this game on PC, so with the ability to play in 16x9 in the most recent HD re-release, as well as getting up to 60 frames a second, this feels like the most definitive and beautiful way to actually play this game again. And even on console, which if I remember correctly is capped at 30 frames a second, just on the visuals alone makes this version a must if you're looking for a taste of the original. And that's just based on looks and sound alone, which I will admit does a lot of the heavy lifting here to be fair. Gameplay in this remake has had some additions as well that not only stay true to the core of the original game, but elevate them to bring out more of what I love from the original to the forefront. Looking back at OG Resident Evil 1, there's always discussion today about the lauded tank controls. As discussed, this control scheme is focused on holding up on the D-pad to go forward and turning with left and right as back when it originally came out. We didn't have the luxury of analog sticks, that being released a year later with the DualShock controller in 97. This method of control was further assisted by the inclusion of static camera angles, the camera essentially being in fixed positions in the rooms and halls of the mansion, with no way to move or control it. Resident Evil 1 Remake keeps these fixed angles, but also includes a control mode which was developed in order to better work with analog sticks. That being, you move the stick in the direction to which your character actually needs to walk. However, this just never felt right to me. As it always felt like I was constantly adjusting the stick to whichever way was up, but because of the camera shifts, it also just is constantly changing. So after about 20 minutes of struggling through this, I defaulted back to the standard tank controls as they just kind of felt right to me, especially having played all these original games not that long ago. One thing that I forgot exists until revisiting this game was the actually inclusion of a difficulty selector as well. As a newcomer to the series, I could see how the original Resident Evil would be considered hard, mostly due to the finality of the resources. These difficulty sliders adjust the amount of items, the amount of zombies, and how hard they actually hit for, making this an easier jumping off point for a newcomer to get their feet wet as they explore the Spencer Mansion like we did so long ago, something the original didn't have. And while shooting, moving, and interactions all remain the same, there are differences in the interactions that newcomers would never even know about, but also keeps veterans of the game and series on their toes as well, creating some changes to keep it more than just a simple retexture of the original. So let's go ahead and dive into those right now. Puzzle solving has always been the core of the original Resident Evil games. The act of finding items, solving riddles, Changing or combining items with each other has always been the staple of the Resident Evil games, minus some of the entries towards the middle of the series like 5 and 6. And as this is in fact a remake of the original, the return of these puzzles seems pretty obvious. And while it would probably would have been easier just to bring the puzzles over from the original as they were back in the day, I was surprised to find that almost every puzzle in this game has been slightly remixed, either changing the key items altogether, changing the solutions, or adding an additional layer to almost every puzzle. The biggest example for returning players would notice is the addition of the crypt section, requiring players to find four death masks scattered across the mansion in order to obtain the first shield key. While not drastically changing any of the formula, creating new barriers like this not only adds a new challenge for the player, but returning players can't just breeze their way through this entire game because they've played it 16,000 times since 1996, essentially making this game newish without disturbing what players loved about the, this game to begin with. Hell, even Shinji Mikami himself, who directed the original as well as the remake says that about 70% of this game is actually different from the original, essentially keeping the bones, areas, and story the same while changing up almost everything else within. Save rooms are still in the same location, but this time the door leading back to the East Wing hallway has a loose knob, so if players use that door too many times, the knob breaks, forcing the player to take the long array up on the second floor around to head back downstairs. Another example would be the clock puzzle in the main dining area. It uses the same shield switch mechanic as the original, but in the remake you now also have to change the hands on the clock according to the picture next to it before getting the item within. While not drastic changes on the face, Resident Evil Remake is full of these slight alterations and really do its job on creating a similar but new experience for those returning fans, still attempting to puzzle and entertain both new players and vets alike. And while these aren't drastic changes, it's nice to see something a little bit different coming out of the puzzles that we've played so many times in the original game. 
like I said, none of these are that hard, but change is good in this case and just keeps it fresh. But no addition is as game changing as the Crimson Heads introduced in this remake. So let's go ahead and talk about these bad boys. Whenever you kill the zombie in the original game, the zombies just lay there dead, as good zombies do. Remake, however, introduced a change that honestly made this game far more intense than its predecessor, that being the introduction of the Crimson Heads. In the remake, whenever you kill a zombie, he lies there, gathering his strength overcoming his humiliation until when you least expect it he rises sporting long talons and you guessed it a red head these reanimating reanimated corpses serve to make sure that the player can never feel safe there are ways of dealing with the crimson heads that being to set them on fire using gasoline and a lighter however as you may guess this combination takes up one to two item slots depending on if you're jill or chris chris starts with the lighter permanently in his permanent slot above your inventory with the amount of gas being finite in the mansion, it no longer becomes solely advantageous to just murder all the zombies in the halls. Gas is finite, found in gas cans scattered around the play space, and you can only carry two charges with you at one time. With these crimson heads being faster and hitting harder and much harder to kill, the decision is posed to the player if a zombie is actually worth killing and burning, killing and leaving to turn, or just running around them. I personally chose to burn zombies in key areas, around the safe rooms, in a cramped hallway, or in areas I would for sure be returning to. If I did make a kill, burning was a must, meaning I must be backtracking a ton to refill the gas can and hoping they didn't turn in the moments I was gone. However, most of the zombies that were easily avoidable or I knew I wasn't going to be going back to, I just kind of avoided. Of course, killing them with headshots, exploding their craniums, does the trick as well, so aim well, as headshots are still just as finicky as the original. Zombies can also break in other areas now too, so running to the next area doesn't mean you're safe. This further creation of choice made my time in this remake far more intense than even the original, where I just kind of murdered everything in my way, as I knew I'd be making my run through just that much quicker and easier at the expense of some of that sweet, sweet ammunition. The other main addition to the gameplay formula is the inclusion of defensive items, like daggers and stun grenades. These items were used solely for when you're grabbed by a zombie, so when you have either of these on your person, these items are expended in order to just get out of trouble and get out of the grab, so you can either finish your opponent or run away. The dagger just stabbing them in the head, while the stun grenade allows a headshot to detonate it, blowing their heads just clean off, good for stopping those pesky crimson heads from returning. While there is not a ton just lying around the mansion, these get-out-of-jail-free cards can be absolute lifesavers if you're needing one, especially when you have no ammo or just a small one-time safety net. It's just a simple quality-of-life add-on, making this entry far more accessible for anybody today. Take care. Yeah. Much like gameplay, there are small additions to the story and lore, further flushing out the world of Resident Evil, the biggest being the addition of the side kind of tangent regarding Lisa Trevor, the daughter of the original architect of the Spencer Manor. Having been captured by Oswald Spencer, she was subjected to being tested on with the progenitor virus along with her mother. And in the remake, we get more story and lore on her, as well as we run into her mutilated form in the shack outside, as well as in the tunnels down below. I mean, there's even a boss fight with her at the end that just amounts to you pushing some rocks off of a ledge, but it still made it a little bit more interesting in having just a completely different twisted boss fight that we'd never seen before, just implanted in the middle to end of this game. While not a massive addition, it's nice to see more lore and story added to the original formula, once again having something new for returning players as well. With some expanded voice acting and reshot cutscenes, the story here holds up with the original, which, given what we're going to explore in further remakes, really is a good thing. Tweaks and alterations aren't necessarily bad, but nothing here was cut or greatly transformed, keeping with that original beginning plot set up so long, long ago. With some additional cutscenes, tweaks to cameras to make it feel a bit more cinematic, almost all of the narrative we got in the original lies here in its pure distilled form. And while some innovation can be a good thing, there is a comfort to be going back to the original experience we had in 1996, albeit in a much cleaner format. And for those who are just new to the series who picked this up because they'd heard such good things about Resident Evil, you don't know any different and it's still probably pretty good for you to this day so for further thoughts on the story go check out the video in the timestamp above that's the original resident evil retrospective and i think it's a pretty good video myself and if you have any other games or series that you want covered on this channel please let me know as well as i'm always looking for new ideas i'm already working on the next run of videos so look forward to that here after the resident evil ones and as always my name is brendan and i'll see you guys in the next one later taters
Following the well-received, if also safe, re-release of Resident Evil 1, Capcom wasn't done there, announcing the long-rumored Resident Evil 2 remake, now using the RE engine that was used for the graphically impressive Resident Evil 7. And while this game has its foibles, which we will discuss, Resident Evil 2 in my eyes is the way a true remake should be done. From gameplay, story delivery, monster mechanics, and more, this game is made from the ground up to bring a beloved classic into the modern day lexicon. And I can safely say that this was achieved in spades as it not only is an amazing remake, but just an amazing game, period. This game also spurred Capcom into redoing almost all of their older games in much of the same vein, and is also more than likely the template for all the next remakes to come. So don your fedoras, slap on that leather coat, duck through that door frame, and let's explore what makes Resident Evil 2 Remake so awesome. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. The original Resident Evil 2, as mentioned in the video that we did months ago about it, was one of my favorite games in the series and out of the original PS1 trilogy is my absolute favorite. From the location, characters, and the ability to tell a halfway decent, albeit pretty cheesy story, while wrapping everything in the trappings of the survival horror genre pioneered in the original, Resident Evil 2 is a masterpiece in my eyes. So the thought that Capcom could take such a beloved title and do a ground up remake was both exciting and worrying. What was going to change? How would a game sporting tank control fixed camera angles, and slow gameplay translate to the modern day. What Capcom was able to achieve was a blending of the original Resident Evil sensibilities while bringing that style of gameplay to the modern gaming sensibilities we now know today. I brought this up in Resident Evil 1 remake video, but while I adored Resident Evil 2, we must also recognize the fact that these games can be pretty rough to either go back to or visit for the first time. While I've grown up used to the control scheme from both muscle memory and nostalgia, if I plot my 10 year old down to play the old PS1 Resident Evil 2, there would definitely be a steep learning curve on how to play, and the more barriers that are placed in the way of any player, the more likely it is that said player will bounce off that and go play something else that they're more familiar with. It's just human nature. What Resident Evil 2 Remake does brilliantly is marrying the two styles, the slow and plotting elements of survival horror from the PlayStation 1, and making it more palatable for the masses. From the onset, having played Resident Evil 2 recently for a video, it is amazing how faithful this game is to the source material from 1998, from plot to location to characters and everything in between. If you've played Resident Evil 2, all the main beats here in the story are hit, and for those uninitiated, here's the brief TLDR. You play as Leon Kennedy or Claire Redfield, who have made their way to Raccoon City, Leon showing up for his first day as a cop, and Claire looking for her brother Chris, who disappeared since the incidents of the first game in the Arclay Mountains and the Spencer Mansion. Meeting at a gas station, the two drive into town, get railroaded by a zombie driving a gas truck, and are separated, each respectively heading to the police station in their own way, discovering the secrets within and the horrors that exist below, all while warding off zombies, liquors, zombie dogs, and an entity only known as Mr. X. Leaving it there to keep it fresh for anyone new, if you play the original, you know all the major story beats that this game is going to hit. Much like the first game's remake, the core of the story is all here, with some additions, slight recontextualizations, and all done in gorgeous cinematics. Resident Evil 2 Remake goes out of its way to keep the story beats fresh, and with these new additions expanding upon the story told to us in the original game. While purists may critique these additions as not needed or filler, it's honestly up to interpretation, and with the amount added to this game, it amazes me how much of the source material is actually still intact in the way it was about 20 years ago. While over the top in many ways, I adore the narrative in Resident Evil 2 and what it weaves, and with the expansions on Sherry and Ada's story, there's a lot here for fans both new and old to chew on. The other part that I was surprised remained true-ish to form was the layout of the police station itself. In prior videos, we have discussed how important a location is to not only Resident Evil, but to survival horror in general. So color me surprised when Capcom really did leave essentially the layout to the police station almost the same. Once again, with some additions and alterations to room, hallway encounters, and the like, all to just keep it a little bit more fresh. While also working to produce the amount of backtracking the player is going to have to do in order to actually progress the story. The change in layout also serves to aid with the chase sequences from Mr. X, something we'll discuss further in the video. With both the sewers, underground, and lab expanded greatly compared to the original, the end part of the game is far better paced now, and while smaller than the original police station, it's still filled with new rooms, pathways, and lore for prior fans to chew on, even having played the original like myself. My main critique is really in the sewer area, and while the expansion does help flesh this area out a lot, make it more cohesive of space to troll through, a lot of the design choices here didn't feel all that great while actually playing it. The slow walking through the water, the massive mutations and G-virus mutants that lurk in the water, and the amount of crank doors needed to open the space up 
really slow the pace of this area down, making it last way longer than it feels like it needs to. While not detrimental to my enjoyment of the game, en masse, every time I revisit the remake, I find that this part always sucks to play through. So much so that I tend to just kind of sprint through as much as I can, leaving ammo and meds on the table to just scoot on by. However, the revamped lab is absolutely awe-inspiring. In the original, this place felt small and cramped, but in the remake, the expansiveness of the center room with the elevator creates a vast sense of scale, making the fact that this lab is located underneath the whole of Raccoon City far more real. I love the setting at Resident Evil 2, the police station being iconic to the series, its twisting halls and locked rooms giving a fear-inducing vibe that permeates the entire space. Even the small act of turning lights on in the safe room helps to solidify those areas as truly safe, along with the main hall, at least in the first playthrough. Resident Evil 2 is peak location creation and survival horror, and to me, Remake takes it in the spaces that were already great in the original to a whole new level of awesome. But what use are fantastic areas if there's no real gameplay? So I think it's about time we start hopping into that. As I like to say, gameplay is always king. And so thus, we need to make sure that this holds up compared to the original games. Back in the PlayStation 1 era of Resident Evil, while these games were remembered for being the progenitors of survival horror, concessions had to be made to create such a space, given the hardware limitations. And with its first real foray into 3D gaming, the original games are best known for multiple facets of interacting with the play space Capcom created. Tank controls, door animations, and fixed camera angles were a staple even into the PlayStation 2 area until the release of Resident Evil 4. Nostalgic and able to provide a sense of horror, these controls by modern standards are dated to to your average player, as we discussed before. Resident Evil 2 Remake does away with these staples, taking the franchise to a truly third-person experience, all seamlessly loaded upon starting the game. Gone are door animations, tons of loading screens, and fixed camera angles, placing the player directly over the shoulder of Leon or Claire. It still amazes me that this entire game can be played literally from start to finish without a single loading screen, even when transitioning into other areas, now masked by elevators and slow opening doors, which still keeps the player mildly engaged in the experience from beginning to end. With this, it's easy to see how Capcom would have been able to turn this remake into more of an action-focused shoot-em-up given what we had seen from the games of a similar angle in 4, 5, and 6. However, much of the core gameplay from the original game is here, and with the changes in perspective, actually actually feel really great. Walking and running feel fluid, both speeds feeling just absolutely dead on. Unlike how slow Resident Evil 7 felt and how fast Resident Evil 6 felt. Remake 2 threads that line perfectly, your walk being a nice slow plodding walk, able to quiet your footsteps to make sure that the liquors don't hear you, but your sprint is just fast enough to where you're not just flying through the hallways, but you're still feeling like you're moving at a pretty good clip. The twisting hallways and the door opening animations still give the sense of not knowing what you're going to run into next and given how enemy positioning is here lends to jump scares by being attacked by a hanging liquor or a zombie lurking in the next room adds a ton of tension build up the original games were known for when it comes to shooting while your character can shoot and move resident evil 2 remake allows full motion while shooting giving more benefit also to standing still and taking your shots if you notice the crosshairs here while moving or after firing your reticle is huge allowing for bullet patterns to be wild and all over the place however if you plant and shoot shoot as the original games had you do, your crosshair zooms down, allowing your shots to be more on point and also increasing the chance of nailing that all-important critical hit, exploding the heads and ensuring death to the shambling reanimated corpses. If I had one complaint, however, it would be the sponginess of the enemies in this game. The zombies are bullet sponges, taking tons of rounds before falling over, only for them to get back up to eat up more of that precious lead that you've been holding on to. Given the amount of ammo that you actually have to dump into these guys, this does feel a little bad, only because of the fact that you used up all of these resources to knock him down the first time only for him to get up again and if you're really unlucky a third time two to three shots i feel like would have been sufficient here given the amount of zombies that this game does throw at you with the open windows that you don't board up or the variety of enemies later on in the game like the liquors but that would in fact be my main critique liquors are much of the same but given their scarcity and lethality i can understand why it takes so much ammo to kill them like it does but in your general run of the mill zombies taking a ton of ammo before they finally drop for good especially when ammo is more scarce or you're running very little to begin with 
it just once again feels kind of rough. As always, you can just run past them in order to try and save some ammo, but their lunges to grab you are wide and have a long range, oftentimes grabbing you even when taking that giant wide step around. This is doubly bad when Mr. X is introduced, maybe the best part about this remake so far. Give me a... Now halfway through the police station, you're introduced to the looming threat of the tyrant or Mr. X, the giant unkillable mutation that wanders the halls with the sole reason to murder you with his massive fists, all while looking mighty dapper in his trench coat and sporting a fedora. And while he was present in the original Resident Evil 2, his looming threat was not nearly as imposing as he is here in the remake, only really appearing during bits of story scenes or scripted sequences in the B run through. This was obviously due to tech limitations at the time as it was harder to render Mr. X actually following you from room to room given the door animations and loading in a new area every time. However, with those gone, we have a revamped tyrant this time around and he is far more frightening. Once triggered, Mr. X will stalk through the halls, searching for you while completing tasks, finding items, and opening doors. This ever-looming threat always seems to wander in at the worst time, crouching awkwardly through the door in order to give you that cold left hook. With your only choices being run away or stun him and run away, having this presence of a looming, unkillable being that can break through doors that normal zombies and lickers can't is a frightening prospect. And with the inclusion of the sound of his plodding footsteps surrounding you in the hallways literally everywhere, only add to the tension. This constant game of cat and mouse really helps to keep the players on their toes while exploring and always pushing you to move forward. However, I do wish he was a little bit more deadly than he actually is. While taking a punch sucks due to the knockdown, his animations are slow, his damage is on par with your standard zombies, and once you learn the tricks to bait and manipulate him, he becomes far easier to deal with. His tension, however, is drawn from the chase, as he will not give up pursuit until you lose him or you die. In this chase, mad dashing in the halls to create space, I found myself running into a lot more zombies, chipping at my health and slowing me down. This being more deadly than if I had just let him punch me and I run in the opposite direction. I love the inclusion of Mr. X in the remake, making nowhere feel safe and I understand that if it was more punishing that the friction that this would cause to the player may be too great, but knowing that his actual damage was weak by comparison did suck a bit of the fear of his looming monstrosity away as well. Minor nitpicks aside, his inclusion is a deal maker for me when it comes to the remake, as his presence as well as his music really do wonders to ratchet up the fear of the police station. Hearing the even still today sends my heart a flutter. I have to say that replaying this game again, this game is an absolute looker. From the lighting, character models, and most of all, gore, this game is a graphical powerhouse and still stands up. I don't talk about graphics all that much in these videos, as to me personally, it's more about the style, art, and gameplay than it is fidelity and rendering. However, when it comes to this remake, it's hard to not talk about it, as this game is still absolutely jaw-dropping. Where it hits the most is in the gore, as this is some of the nastiest flesh rendering I've ever seen in a long time. Time. Like this scene, where when Leon pulls the head up and the jaw becomes afflicted by that pesky gravity, sagging down on the left side only being held up by tendons and sinew. The ability to see the brain protruding from the liquors is wet, and surprisingly, these creatures aren't very smooth-brained, as we can very visibly see. Couple that with the way everything works with the geometry in the world, albeit small details really let this game shine. Like this body that falls on Leon out of the locker. Watch as he guides the body to the floor, almost uncannily how any of us would be doing if we were doing the same. Couple that with the zombies tripping over their dead brethren, the pushing of the door animations, the way Mr. X brushes off your bullets while shooting at him, the amount of detail here is absolutely astounding. There is also a ton of replayability here in this package as well, with the B-run with the other character being way harder with new item placements and puzzles and taking away that main hallway safety that we had known from the first playthrough. The additional scenes with Sherry, a stealth sequence, avoiding the police chief, which is pretty fucked up. The section with Ada chasing Annette, which I'll admit kind of sucks a little bit, but it was a, at least an addition to Ada's story. And a ton of additional side tangents here as well, as there is a ton of content to chew on for either new players or those returning. 
I mean, the amount of side story DLC things that they came out with is absolutely astounding. This remake to me stands on top of all of them. Capcom should be applauded for this title, something which will soon be taken away in regards to the Resident Evil 3 remake. Thank you for everyone for your time today, and as always, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Coming off of the resounding success of Resident Evil 2 Remake, it seemed painfully obvious that we were not done getting remakes of the old Resident Evil games, bringing them up to a modern 2020 standard of gaming. So when Capcom announced that Resident Evil 3 Remake was going to be a thing, it came as a little shock. But given how faithful the first two remakes were, it seemed like there was no reason to be concerned, right? I mean, this is a fan favorite for a ton of people, including my friend Cameron, as well as a lot of you that left comments on the video of the original where I called it boring. However, what we got was so much of a deviation from the original game that not only was it not faithful, it was also a pretty lackluster game even in its own regard. From boring level design, subpar boss fights, and a focus on scripted chase sequences, this game really is a letdown and in this video I want to get into the details as to why. I hope that you enjoy this video and without any more delay, let's look back at Resident Evil 3 Nemesis Remake. Resident Evil 3 was never my favorite Resident Evil game back in the day. I liked it, it was fun, but in terms of how it stacks up compared to the other two in the original run, this was aptly third on my list of the fixed camera Resident Evil games, having enjoyed the original and 2 far more, especially 2. But coming off of the heels of Resident Evil 2 Remake and how much I loved what Capcom did with that classic, I had no reason to expect anything less than awesome upon the release of Nemesis Remake. What caught me, however, was the distinct lack of memory of even playing this game, despite me having straight it on Twitch at the time when it was first released. And coming back to it again for the purposes of this video, it is clear why I have no recollection of any of this. Why my memory seemingly completely blocked out ever playing this game. Upon completion of it again for the purposes of this video, I figured out why. This game is bad. Bad as a game, and as a fan of Resident Evil, absolute garbage. With the amount of changes made from the original, the squandered waste potential that was Nemesis, the changes made to Jill, and the dumbing down of the level design of this game is boring as a standalone title and an abomination as a remake. Holding virtually no similarities to the original game, it amazes me that Capcom would even attempt to pass this off as Resident Evil 3 Remake. It should be more like loosely inspired version of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, but not really. I mean, hell, they even took Nemesis out of the title of this game. But Brendan, you might say. These are some harsh statements, so where is this coming from? Well, that being said, let's get into the nitty gritty of it. First off, let's start with something positive. Resident Evil 3 Remake is visually impressive on almost every level. I maybe stand alone in saying that I don't mind Jill's redesign as much as a lot of people here on YouTube. While little in the vein of tough girl in tank top and jeans, like the redesign of Laura Croft from the Tomb Raider reboot, she's still a pretty good looking character. Cute, but given how she was a special forces cop, could most definitely fuck you up. Nemesis, in the first form, looks pretty awesome. Standing heads over you, wrapped like a leather daddy, is an imposing presence, much like Mr. X was in Resident Evil 2 Remake. In actuality, well, we'll get there. Carlos had a massive redesign, and while it looks good, I'm personally not a fan of it myself, especially when it comes to the hair. The giant poofball hairdo, much like Ichiban from Yakuza Like a Dragon, is off-putting and dopey. While this style of hair works for Ichiban, given how his character is kind of dopey, Carlos needed to see another visit to the barber to give him a cut that was well within regulation, like the other guys in his unit have as well. It's just impractical and all use cases, as it gives zombies another handhold to grab, and if you were in combat with other humans, that hair screams where you're at if you're ever trying to tuck into cover. This is nitpicky, I know, but coming off of the remake and how much attention to detail was placed in almost everything, this stands out to me given my background being prior military and being part of a military family forever. The pre-order bonuses does give the player that original look, but these are additive costumes and it's hard for me to even count those. I have to say that the world itself is beautiful to look at as well using far more colors than even Resident Evil 2 Remake did to make certain locations stand out and pop a little bit more. Like the cinema that explodes during your run to the train station or the donut shop being lit up like a central beacon for the downtown area. Gunplay also feels good and snappy and pretty crisp. And the trade-offs for moving and standing still, like it was in Resident Evil 2 Remake, still apply. The shotgun got a massive tune-up as well, basically guaranteeing a one-shot head explosion, unlike Resident Evil 2 Remake, which while maybe a little bit overtuned and broken, never bothered me with just how good it felt to pop heads, like that news reporter popping grapes before falling out of that tub. These buckets are filled with grapes. 
What kind of grapes? Foods, having wine tours and tasting, vineyard tours, seminars, arts and crafts. It's a lot of fun. Oh, 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 the Dodge from the original was incorporated as well, and here in the remake it actually feels really good. With just the simple click of a button you're able to either dodge away from the zombies or dodge into them, knocking them back or hopefully popping ahead. However, and I may have missed it so let me know, but I don't think the dodge was ever called out in any sort of in-game tutorial at all. <laughs> Seeing as I kind of stumbled upon it by accident while doing a Carlo section and was surprised when I did it into a zombie and his head basically exploded. I may be wrong about this, but feel free to let me know in the comments below if I'm right or wrong on this. Overall, the actuality of playing Resident Evil 3 Remake still feels really good, snappy, and fluid. And while this game may look good and play okay, it's all of the underlying issues that really kill this game for me. And with the good must come the bad. So let's go ahead and dive into the bad. In looking back at the last couple of videos as we've been talking about the remakes of the older games, we've discussed the major question on every fan's mind, that being, what changed when remaking this game? For the first two remakes, while some minor tweaks were made from the original games in the transition of the 21st century, the core of what made these games tick remained intact, from the narrative, pacing, and mechanics of said game. So, when Resident Evil 3 Remake was announced, the same questions naturally floated out there, albeit a little less given how well the last two were received by players new and old. I mean, two in a row were pretty true to form, so maybe Capcom actually gets it right and knows what they're doing? Wrong. Just wrong. While playing through Resident Evil 3 Remake, I was baffled to find that the only real thing that stayed the same from the original game were the characters, nemesis, and the general setting of Raccoon City. The amount of story beats, location changes, and even boss fights that changed were staggering, which is far more apparent given the closest proximity I had when playing this from the original. And it all starts at the beginning. We open the remake playing through Jill's eyes in first person, who is having a dream or really a nightmare of becoming a zombie herself. Waking up, we explore the apartment, answer the phone, and BAM! In comes Nemesis. I bring all this up as a squandered opportunity here to get to know Joel a little bit better. The game assumes prior knowledge of who Joel is, a member of the STARS unit who survived the Spencer Mansion incident from Resident Evil 1, having battled countless zombies, tyrants, lickers, hunters, and more. We get none of that here, just a strange dream, some random notes, and a phone call from Brad who tells us to leave now before rudely being interrupted by the game's main antagonist, Nemesis. And for a character who was the shining point in the original game, Game, the lack of build-up and tension given to Nemesis himself here in the remake is absolutely tragic. Think back to the original title for a moment. Jill runs up to the RCPD when, from behind, Brad runs in, covered in blood, telling Jill to run as Nemesis comes out of nowhere, dropping from the sky, stabbing Brad through his face with his fist tentacle, only for him to turn his sights on you where your only two options are to either run or fight. This was after the entire introduction of the game where you're roaming the zombie-infested back alleys, meeting that guy who hides in the freezer truck, the first real human you actually see, and fight your way to even get to the police station in the first place. There's a build up to the presence here for Nemesis, who serves as the added ever roaming threat to us the entire runtime of the game. In the remake, he just bursts through the wall no less than two minutes after we've started the game, leading the player to hold up on the controller for no less than maybe 10 minutes, while a ton of scripted chase sequences where Jill thwarts him with bookcases and doors because this monster didn't just burst through a wall five minutes prior. In fact, this game does everything it can to completely neuter Nemesis as a whole. With 80% of the time that he's even on screen, he's relegated to just more chase sequences or boss fights. Short of one section two, he's completely stripped of the iconic rocket launcher we all known him for. That weapon only making an appearance after Joe gets the train line working again. In the original Nemesis, he could appear anywhere. City Hall, the gas station, random side alleys. In the remake, there is only one time where he's roaming the streets, that being after you hose the back alley fire and only around the donut shop or the central area. Besides that, it's just 
just the lame ass chase scenes or boss fights all throughout this game. He's far less threatening here than he was in the original, and the neutering of this once terrifying monster is honestly just sad to me. Also gone is the choice making we had in the original as well, centered around dealing with intense situations like lots of zombies or whether to shock or blind nemesis at the clock tower. While not a huge part of the original, it did add some variation between run-throughs of the original game and why these were taken out entirely. Here in the remake, I will never understand. It's just another couple scenes of rendering and a choice selection button. I mean, hell, we've been doing that in video games since PlayStation 1. Nemesis truly deserved better than the lame treatment he received here in this remake, and it's a shame to see him relegated to basically a lesser version of Mr. X from the last remake. Where Nemesis was the final evolution of the tyrant for the originals in both looks and mechanic, here in the remake he's just a lamer leather daddy with no fedora. As we have discussed in prior videos, location in Resident Evil games is everything, and for survival horror in general as well. And while it was a bit harsher with the original Resident Evil 3 location than the first two games, what has been done here in the remake is also just kind of baffling and confusing. Back in the original video, I discussed how I thought the scope of Raccoon City was a bit far reaching compared to the first two games that were both relegated to indoor locations, giving these areas a ton more character and build up as we revisit rooms and location time and time again. At the time, I thought the scope of a bunch of city streets and their locations like the gas station, diner, city hall, power plant, and even the interlocking streets and alleys were a bit too large in scope for my tastes. Man, am I eating my words now. Here in the remake, the first area that takes place in the city streets have been gimped beyond belief, because I guess Raccoon City essentially only consists of two streets, a couple of alleyways, a donut shop, a toy store, a power plant, and a box warehouse. No lie, once you put the fire out, out, you could run from one street to the next in probably less than 30 seconds, and that's the entirety of the first part of the game. Shrinking this space down not only makes it less interesting to navigate through, but it also dampens the amount of exploration, resource gathering, and locked doors and puzzles, the staple for those for these games, which this game just lacks in spades. While the area of the donut shop and toy store looks cool with the lighting and the amount of detail, there is not much to it, as all we do is flip three breakers on a power plant and solve a train map puzzle a puzzle where the game literally gives you the answer to it on the screen above you. Heading down to the sewer, you have basically one path to go down to get a battery, only to double back and escape from the door right there at the beginning. Even the hospital section as Carlos does not leave a ton to explore, as following the halls leads you to a tape recorder that you need to unlock the door to get the cure for Jill, and then you just go back two rooms and open the locked door. From a game that built its bones on backtracking, exploration, puzzle solving, and all the standard Resident Evil Fair, this remake turns Raccoon City into what could essentially be an interactive roller coaster. Going on one direction, getting chased, go in the other direction, get chased, rinse, and repeat. All of the standard trappings of what made these games so popular back in the PlayStation 1 and even in the newly done remakes of Resident Evil 2 is just gone. The things fans of the series love, leaving us with a soulless husk of a remake in name only, as nothing in this game is close to how it was in the original. Hell, we even lost the entire Clock Tower sequence which was maybe the most iconic section of this entire game, the focal point that the player is literally constantly heading to in the original game in order to escape. Remember that cutscene in the original of the helicopter coming in to rescue Jill, only to be shot down by Nemesis to strand Jill in the city? Gone. All gone. Instead, we have a rooftop boss fight with a flamethrower nemesis, followed by another nemesis boss fight, or I guess he turns into a strange dog and wall runs or something. There's an argument that can be made, I guess, that this game was streamlined. However, in streamlining and cutting these areas down, sapped almost all the fun that I ever have in Resident Evil just straight out of it. The puzzles, item finding, maneuvering through hordes of zombies, and of course, avoiding nemesis. The cuts made here lost the soul of what people loved about these games, and this one specifically. And to me, that's almost unforgivable as what they did to my boy Nemesis. After everything we've been through, that doesn't even touch on the changes made to the story and the pacing of this game itself. Now, Resident Evil has never been anything on par story-wise with games like Red Dead Redemption 2 or Metal Gear Solid, both massively good in my eyes. But there was a pacing and a flow to these games, allowing for the build-up to the finale, which would normally involve fighting a giant tyrant in an underground lab or something of this nature to shoot him with a rocket launcher. Let's once again take a moment to look at the original opening of the PlayStation 1 version of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. 
house. Looking back at the beginning of that game, we escape the apartments to head to the warehouse, head down the alleys to meet Brad at the bar, go to RCPD, run into Nemesis, try to call for evacuation, have to escape the police station, and then we make our way down to the train station to meet up with the Umbrella operatives and thus Carlos. Taking roughly an hour for a normal player, there was a lot of buildup that eventually culminated in working with the group that was essentially responsible for everything going on here, giving stakes to Jill making her escape in search of a way out. In the remake, after the chase scene with Nemesis, we run into the bar, Brad gets bit, we are saved by Carlos and taken to the train station all about the span of 20 minutes. Jill never even goes to RCPD, a seminal point in the original game, that being going back to her old offices to find a way out, reliving the past and remembering her old comrades. After getting the train to work, we are chased by Nemesis again, and Jill runs off and leading to the sewer sequence as mentioned before. Looping around, we get on the train and then we play as Carlos, who then goes to the police station where the area is distilled down to just blasting some zombies and end by going to save Jill from the train crash and subsequent infection. RCPD is subjected to just another place to crawl through, a revisit to the same place that we were in the last game, this time with no real symbology behind it. Yes, it was nice to see Marvin and how he got bit, leading up to the way that we meet him as Leon in Resident Evil 2, and I appreciate that the codes for all the locked doors were essentially the same as the two remake as well. However, moving forward in, in the hospital, this was the section I never really had much of an issue with. That was until we had to hold off a massive horde of zombies while your buddy lowers the barriers. I mean, seriously, this was like five to ten minutes of standing in one room and shooting anything that moved. I can't for the life of me understand why this was added other than to pad out runtime and give a bit of a harder sequence in this game in a remake of a game that was probably also the shortest in runtime. We also, just by the way, lose the entire garden area in the underground section underneath the fountain there as well. And did I mention the clock tower? already oh yeah i did i'm just still fucking mad about that all of these set pieces chase scenes and condensing of story beats honestly hurt not only the storytelling but also the pacing of resident evil 3 remake we've discussed pacing a lot on this channel as this is an aspect of any media that drive to set the tone and feel of the game or movie and in this game in particular from the moment nemesis bursts through the wall at the very beginning the game never lets off the gas and subsequently never giving the player to rest recalibrate and reassess which in turn makes everything not only feel rushed but short and also weakens the effect nemesis has on the game and the player as well think back to mr x for a moment he was always around albeit off screen allowing the player to come to a state of rest only for him to appear when you least expect it yet again ready to bring that left hook to an unsuspecting player there was a tension bred there from the moment of his arrival there was an ebb and flow that he would bring chase sequences escape continue on your way to solving puzzles only for him to just duck through the doorway behind you again when you least expect it ready to fucking knock your teeth in. For a game that is loved by many, this remake seemed to do everything it could to just ruin it, leaving a bad taste for this game in my mouth and what I feel a lot of yours as well. And until then, my name is Brendan, and always remember, laugh and grow fat. Thanks. don't feel like it's any hidden knowledge that when Resident Evil 4 released in 2004, it was not only considered like the best Resident Evil game, but probably one of the best games to release even at the time. A sentiment that is still held by many today. I too love Resident Evil 4 and while it was also the precursor to the more action horror focus that we would get in the series in subsequent games that I've railed against, it's hard to argue that this game wasn't great from mechanics to story with all the zaniness in between. Despite my gripes with the escort mission style gameplay revolving around Ashley, I still played through Resident Evil 4 twice while doing the video on it. See the link to that up above if you haven't seen it already. So when the remake was announced and there was a lot of speculation regarding if it would maintain that pedigree of renown given how the 3 remake went, it would it be faithful to what came before while bringing it now to PS5, Xbox Series consoles, and PC? Well, that's what this video is about, Resident Evil 4 Remake, and if it holds up to the Game of the Year contender that came before. As of recording this, this will be the last video in the Resident Evil series for a while, at least until a new one comes out or I get a bug on my ass to go and play more of the site. 
side games. So let's go out with a bang and cover the remake of the most beloved game in the series by many. If you enjoy this type of retrospective and review content, be sure to hit that subscribe button for more stuff like it and go ahead and check out the other like 12 or 13 videos we've done in the Resident Evil series thus far. And if you really want to, you can go further back and check out all the old videos we did on series like Wolfenstein, Sniper Elite 5, and Dead Rising. Don't forget to like if you enjoyed this video and without further delay, let's get right into it. From the very onset of the remake, if you have played the original before, you can already tell things are going to be vastly different, far more serious, and dark. We get a cutscene focusing on Leon's perspective, recounting the events of the Resident Evil 2 remake and how it actually affected him going forward, joining a secret government organization, getting trained as special forces, and even for the keen observer, see his connection to Krauser, more on him soon. I like this change from the original, which just set up what Umbrella did prior and the larger themes of Resident Evil 2 don't focus really on Leon and his story specifically. Specifically, and with him being the main protagonist of the game just felt a little weird at the time. Leon is also positioned vastly differently than that of the original as well, this time being far less goofy and quirky with one-liners and badass attitudes. But here in the remake, he's more hardened from the events that happened before, and while he maintains some of his old quips like the bingo scene after the village encounter, he's far more serious here in the remake. While I do miss the old Leon on occasion, as he was genuinely funny to me then and now in the original, I much prefer the tone of this new one as it fits far better given the events of Resident Evil 2 Remake and the situation at hand. And with the power of modern machines, his abilities and spec ops training are far more showcased as well, performing far more CQB and agility in the remake than we had even in the original. He's also a much deeper character here, and while I don't necessarily want to have to psychoanalyze my protagonist in Resident Evil games, it's nice to have a character with more nuanced motivations and backstory. Leon isn't the only character who had a major overhaul as well, with almost everyone getting more screen time and getting far more developed. By far the best of these was Luis, the Spanish scientist we meet in the original tied up under the house, and in the original I found him woefully underutilized, only popping up about four to five times before he meets his untimely demise. In the remake, while not only being far better acted and rendered, he also sees a ton more screen time as well, which allows Luis to become more fleshed out throughout the story of Resident Evil 4. We learn through actual dialogue that he used to work as a bio-researcher for Umbrella, and after their collapse began to help with the Los Illuminados in their research of the Los Plagas virus that was found on the island. In doing so, we learn that he is essentially to blame for aiding the entire infection of the island, but having a change of heart begins to work with Leon and Ada in order to help cure Leon and Ashley of the Plagas and getting a sample for Ada and the mysterious benefactor she works for. I love Luis in this remake, and while he still sees his death, it is in fact much later in the game, this time giving the player the ability to learn more about him and his research, something that we only really got in text files in the original. Speaking of Ada, she may be the only character who is probably worse in this remake than she was in the original. Still playing the same role, she mysteriously appears from time to time to aid Leon by asking vague questions and subsequently dipping out of the scene. With the voice acting being absolutely terribly directed, she also sounds painfully bored to even be in the scene in the first place, and while I don't blame the voice actor for this, it is extremely fair to blame the voice director on the performance here, as it's pretty pitiful if I'm being honest. I never really liked Ada as a character either, and that continues on here in the remake as well. And also, so let's not forget up until this point, Leon thinks Ada is dead, as mentioned in the beginning cutscene, so it comes off as bizarre that there isn't more fanfare when he discovers that the woman he loves is in fact alive. It's just bizarre that in a world where you watch a girl you fell for in Raccoon City supposedly fall to their death, that you wouldn't have a little bit more enthusiasm when finding out that she might be alive, even though she did try to betray you. And I understand that sense of betrayal, but come on, it just doesn't add up here. The last main character we need to speak of is Ashley, the girl Leon is here to save. We'll get more into her mechanics as a escort mission character and her level that she has to herself a bit later in the video, but in the remake, she is by far one of my favorite characters. Much like the original Ashley, she plays the trope of the damsel in distress, hence why Leon is here to begin with. And in the original, she played this role to a fault, essentially being useless nearly the entire game, short of being captured and yelling for Leon over and over again. Here in the remake, however, she does begin that way, covering her ears when the guns start blasting and the action gets going. However, throughout the game, we see her attempt to try to help Leon in whatever way she can, even if it's just a simple check-in asking if he's okay after a long, drawn-out fight. She also helps assist in tangible ways as well, like in the castle where she tosses the blue fire to stun the infected armors, making it easier for Leon to dispose of these monsters and move on. Let's look a little bit forward into the game as well at the house defense sequence. In the original, Leon tells Ashley to go upstairs and hides, only to emerge once the fighting is done.
Leon and Luis and Leon are just shooting the shit. In the remake, during the action, she bursts into the back door, telling the boys to follow her to safety, actively taking ownership and making sure that these two make it out alive. Also later in the castle, during her section of gameplay, she's not only working to get back to Leon, but summoning all of her courage to save Leon, who's actually trapped in a cage. You can see the growth in Ashley as a character, and as the dynamic between herself and Leon grows, you can see the relationship blossom as well. And not in that way, you fucking pervs. As the two are making their way through the ruined bunker area towards the end of the game, she takes the reins of a crane in order to knock the wall down. Not because she has to, but because she wants to help in that partnership between her and Leon and what they've built. I mean, hell, she even mentions this on the elevator sequence, saying that they might make a good team together one day and she's going to become a secret agent. And you can see Leon also grow to equally care for her as well. And I personally love to see the growth of these two characters' relationship. It's really touching to see. Ashley's redesign also reflects her actual age. In the original, she looked a bit more like 15 or 16, whereas she was supposed to be a college-age student. Here, she does look aged up a bit, making that scene at the very end of the game way less creepy, as it looks like a 20-something hitting on Leon as opposed to a teenager hitting on Leon, asking if he would work overtime. Just in the characters alone, you can see how everyone of our heroes have changed when moving up from 2004 version to the 2023 version of this game. And minus Ada, I would say that all of them have worked far better than their original counterparts, in my opinion. Keep in mind that these opinions are always subjective, so let me know in the comments down below what you guys think about the character changes here in the remake. But a lot more was done to this game than just character work, so let's get deeper into the world, mechanics, and story of Resident Evil 4 Remake. Ashley. Ashley Graham, are you in here? <laughs> Looking at the remakes that we've loved, that being Resident Evil's 1 and 2, the main thread that flows between those two is the lack of overall changes to the level and world design. Some areas were added, others were retextured, but by and large, they remained close to how they were in the originals. And the same can be said for what was done here in Resident Evil 4. While puzzles and ways to progress have changed as well as adding a metric fuck ton of new treasures, the main core and theme of each area that you go to is largely the same. The first house we go in is almost a perfect allegory for how the rest of the game is treated. In the original, we turn a couple corners and run into the house, where we meet the Ganado stoking the fire and attacking Leon. We have the same thing here, but the house layout has been greatly expanded, adding rooms to the side, a basement where we find the dead police officer's body, and an upstairs with a couple of additions as well. However, the main hallway, the kitchen room, and the upstairs where Leon jumps out of the window are all still here. Keeping the ties of the original there while also giving some more additions to the world and play space at the same time. Keeping it similar, but adding. Unlike what was done in 3 Remake, where it felt like most of the original play space and areas of Raccoon City were completely stripped out. The core areas are all here as well, untouched and still the same way that we remember them back in the day. Like the village encounter, which was still just as tense as the original, which kudos to Capcom for somehow managing to hit that watermark. The church where Ashley is kept, the water room in the castle, which plays virtually the same and terrible as before, as well as the section where the helicopter comes in to the military base to blow up all the Ganado. You know, the part that I don't like as well. Where a lot was added was in the pathing on getting to these core areas. This blending of old and new helps make this game feel familiar and yet new at the same time for returning fans. Much of what was done in Resident Evil 2 Remake, albeit to a much larger scale. These new areas or scenes also fit with the original remade areas as well. That for me when playing made me try to recall whether these areas were actually in the original or not, which is a good sign that these new play spaces were made right, as it's able to blend the old with the new seamlessly. When thinking of Resident Evil 4 as well, I also think of the boss fights littered throughout, and Resident Evil 4 had some pretty awesome boss fights. And I think the most out of all the Resident Evil franchise. In regards to their quality, I don't think there was a bad one in the bunch. The El Gigante fight is still a spectacle, mostly because of the dog coming into the fray, silhouetted by the crack of lightning, making it just fucking epic. The fight with Mendez is so cinematic and visually interesting, it makes you forget that you're shooting this guy just in the back. My favorite fight has to be Krauser, who I'm glad to see get a little bit more screen time to flesh out why he was even here in the first place, making him fit a little bit better than before as he's the one who captured Ashley to get revenge on the United States for leaving him and his men stranded leading to their deaths. You also get more of a relationship between Leon and Krauser in the remake as well, as the original just feels like he shows up randomly, and he still kind of does, but the players give him more stakes as well as Krauser is the one to kill Luis, unlike the original where he is killed by Sadler. This murder of a actually pretty awesome character really got me one to just beat Krauser's head into a pulp, which I think makes it really accomplish the goal Capcom was going for and making you want to just 
destroy this guy. With the revamp knife mechanics, this fight is way more interesting and acts more like a set piece fight, testing your abilities to parry and dodge rather than just being a QTE nightmare as it was before. And while he struggles to fit in as well as the other antagonists, I'm glad to see Krauser get a bit more love here. The fight with Salazar and Sadler as well as the Verdungo assassin all play about the same as it was in the original, albeit on a much more epic scale, making these fights that much better. Also, did I mention that I actually like Salazar way better this time than the original as well? Far more menacing and less of a creepy looking kid vibe like he was slappy out of Goosebumps. His inclusion also fits a lot better here than it did in the original, as he's acting as more of the mouthpiece for Sadler's teachings and also is there to help speed up the infection within Ashley, rather than just playing a long game of cat and mouse and keep away with her. I love his design here and appreciate his inclusion much more this time around, which was an added treat for someone who didn't understand Salazar's inclusion much in the original. The world building of the remake is far more deep and does a great job at telling the player how it's all interconnected, as opposed to the original where a lot of this backstory and world building was told through text logs. For story beats as to why a character or villain is present, serves much better to be told to the player via some sort of dialogue or cutscene, rather than leaving that bit of information to be gleaned through text notes or missable collectibles. There are games that this isn't the case, say in something like Dark Souls, however in my opinion that game serves more as the exception and not the rule. Overall, here in this remake it felt great to come back to this Spanish island again, once again mowing through the Ganado villagers, the cultists in the castle, and the weird military grey dudes in the bunker. With everything feeling more interconnected than it was before, and every antagonist and bad guy being more fleshed out, it made it all more cohesive for me, which caused me to like it even more. Which brings us into the story changes of Resident Evil 4 Remake, so let's move on. Utterly uncivilized! Oh, girl. Speaking of story, while the main beat to beat notes are virtually the same, there are a ton of finer details added to the experience to help further contextualize aspects of the story. A lot of these additions focus on something that I feel was far less focused on in the original, that being the actual infection taking place between both Ashley and Leon. While there was some time for it in the original, like Leon choking Ada with creepy red eyes, RE4 Remake goes out of its way almost every chapter to remind the player of the infection taking hold, from Ashley coughing up blood soon after rescuing her, to Sadler taking control of Ashley to stab Leon later in the castle, the game does a great job at threading in the underlying threat that they can't control. And even more so, we can see the effects this infection has on Leon and Ashley's relationship, specifically on Ashley. After stabbing Leon, she runs off in shame, and upon finding her later, before going into the castle courtyard, you can see the fear Ashley has in being even close to Leon, for fear that she will actually hurt him again. Not only can you see the bond begin to solidify here between these two characters, but both are acutely aware of how the infection is actually affecting them, making the need to get the parasite out that much more imperative. As skin changes color, eyes become bloodshot, and the two fall more and more into Sadler's control, the stakes begin to build up higher and higher, all culminating with the walk to Luis's lab, where Leon begins to actually hallucinate, the parasite finally taking hold, and giving Sadler almost full control. Speaking of Sadler, we've gone this far without actually bringing him up too much, which is crazy because this new rendition of the main antagonist of Resident Evil 4 is far more sinister and plays better as a villain here much more so than he did in the original. I was always confused as to why Sadler basically spilled his entire plan in the church scene before rescuing Ashley, much like a Bond villain does in the old James Bond flicks back in the day. He also just shows up randomly to kill Luis in the castle, feeling bizarre as well. Like his main goal was just to follow Leon around to block his path, despite him being a cult leader and supposedly in control of Los Blagas. In the remake, we don't see him much in person up until the very end of the game at all. Despite some glimpses here and there of him in your mind, trying to take control and naturally the iconic paintings littering the houses of the village and Mendez's homestead. He's also far more menacing than before, speaking more in religious zealotry while flanked by his priests wrapped in plastic bags or whoever these guys are. The remake's attempt to make Sadler mysterious I think worked well for this antagonist as well, making him feel much larger than life than he did in the original. Couple all this as well as the changes to characters like Ashley and Leon, as well as flushing out Krauser and Salazar really helped this game in the long run. As I said before, all the core beats are really still here, but the amount of expansion on lore and character depth that makes this remake able to capture the original well while keeping it fresh, much like the first two remakes accomplished. Even with the amount of additions made here to the story, as a personal fan of the original, felt that it was pretty near and true, but you guys are more than welcome to correct me if I'm wrong once again in the comments below. Over here, stranger. 
Who's that? When discussing Resident Evil 4, it would be naturally weird if we didn't include the shopkeeper at all in this video. And I'm here to say that not only is he as awesome as he was in the original, he comes sporting some new and souped up features not seen in the original. As stated before, the treasure mechanic is still here. That being find treasures and gems, allowing you to slot these gems into said treasures to increase their sale value and allowing you to buy or upgrade more stuff. The gem system here has been far more fleshed out now, receiving bonuses for color matching, having all different colors, and so on. Essentially creating patterns or matching colors makes the sale price of the treasure worth way more, making you actually think about what color gems you're putting in what order to maximize your potential value of said treasure. A nice addition for sure. The shooting gallery also got a large overhaul as well. As you explore the world or get high scores at the shooting gallery, you can earn silver or gold coins that you can spend in the slot machine in order to basically pull trinkets out to attach to your inventory case. These charms act as passive bonuses to Leon with a ton of different abilities like finding more ammo, crafting more, bonus ammunition per craft, or items being worth more when selling them to the shopkeep. While I've never been a fan of the shooting galleries in almost any game, it was nice to see some rewards to incentivize people to go in and actually try to earn some of these charms. I personally just ran with what I had, which was the green herb find and the handgun ammo find, but if you're willing to put in the time, you can definitely earn some cool stuff in here. So I have to say that this is probably a great addition as well. However, the biggest thing we need to discuss, and one that I could see being a bit controversial, was the addition of side quests to Resident Evil 4. While exploring, you will find blue papers hanging on the walls, telling Leon to do certain tasks like shooting the blue medallions, killing a number of rats, or selling a specific item like a golden egg. These tasks can be done for spindles, which in turn act as a currency to earn more special items. Turning in these spindles gains you items like stocks for the TMP or the Red 7 pistol, more gems for you to slot in more treasures, or most notably, item upgrade tickets, essentially allowing the player to bypass all the weapon upgrades to get the special perk in exchange for one of these tickets. While I don't mind the introduction of side quests per se, I do have an issue with how boring they are to do. As most of these are just search for said thing and shoot it. The rats are probably the biggest pain in the ass to me as I have had many issues with these rats even spawning, thus not even being able to finish the task at hand. However, I do enjoy the concept of earning a currency to trade for more or better stuff. And while I don't mind this mechanic on its face, I just wish that the quests to get them were a bit more interesting and less mindless busy work. We also need to discuss the elephant in the room, that being the microtransactions, as this is something that caught basically everybody off guard, especially me. Now, I really haven't had to discuss microtransactions in any of my videos thus far, as it basically has just never come up yet. But for the record, I'm not the biggest fan of any sort of game-changing microtransactions. Cosmetics are whatever, and I'll engage in them if they're really cool, or if I feel like that I've put more time into the game than I've actually paid for, mostly in like free-to-play games. But that's about as far as I'll go. Now, this is a touchy subject, but I what I do care about is the addition of these transactions to a $70 product two weeks after the release of the game. And that is my main issue here with Resident Evil 4. If it was just cosmetics, that would be fine, but it's not. As two weeks after launch, Capcom released the weapon upgrade ticket packs, which is just scummy in my opinion. Now I know that it's a single player game and I'm a huge proponent of do and buy what you want, but it's the inclusion of these new purchases two weeks after the game's launch, ensuring that it got all the good press it was going to get before going and essentially selling upgrade skips is what I find really scummy beyond belief. I'm not a fan, never will be a fan, and this practice needs to stop now. We saw what happened with Ubisoft and how out of hand that got with experience skips, level skips, item skips, and I do not want to see that here in Resident Evil at all. And while the other systems were good, this was a major detractor for me personally. For me though, the biggest changes come in the form of gameplay, and these changes stand out to me as being some of the best revisions to the original formula. I critique the original as being the progenitor of the action into the survival horror genre, and this remake does very little to dissuade that, and in fact, I feel like it's even more action packed than the original was to begin with. However, that doesn't stop this game from being just a blast to play like the original was. While herb mixing and ammo crafting make their return, the largest change of the formula would be the stealth aspects of this game. In the remake of Resident 
Resident Evil 4, Leon can crouch walk, allowing him to sneak upon enemies to basically one hit knife them, thinning the herd before the upcoming fight. This ability to sneak attack with your knife brought a lot of tension back to this game as ammo does feel a little bit scarcer here than even in the original, especially when you're playing on hardcore. And given the amount of additional combat encounters there are in this game, the stealth felt pretty critical to being able to win a lot of these fights. These stealth mechanics are further flushed out when it comes to Ashley's section as well, taking this area into more of the horror genre we know today, her being defenseless and needing to sneak around in order to get to the next objective. However, this scene has maybe some of the best chase sequences as well and pacing than any other game I've played recently. This game is masterful at giving the character control of the chase, but timing the armor statues to always be on your heels, winding the twists and turns of the library in order to make it much more tense and interactive. I have to say, going through it again for this video, that Ashley sequence is masterfully done, and I really wish that we would maybe get a DLC or some more of that into this game. With it being tense, scary, and just well paced, it was a masterful section and a fantastic break to the formula we had been playing thus far. The other main change that was done in the remake was how knives actually work. Leon can parry almost everything now with his knife, including the chainsaw guy, and with a successful parry, is able to stun the enemy for a brief period of time, giving more window to either blast him away or stagger further to allow for this game's melee mechanics to kick in and knocking these guys flat on their ass. From moving, sneaking, shooting, and parrying, this game has a flow state I haven't felt in a long time in any Resident Evil game, and honestly is maybe one of the best feeling games to play, even with the new remakes included. The amount of options a player has to deal with the scenario has been increased a lot, and yet all these mechanics blend so well together and work to keep the tension as the villagers or cultists swarm the piss out of you. With the inclusion of the boar's head enemies, more chainsaw guys, the variety of play creatures, each combat encounter feels fresh and fun to engage with. And while I always will prefer the old school survival horror aspects of gameplay, I can't deny that this game was just a great time to play. My only major gripe was the Ashley mechanics, as while she's following you throughout the island, it becomes a little bit painful. As Leon, you have two options of what to do with her, telling her to either stay close or telling her to stay further back. Honestly, it felt like neither option was all that great, as it didn't seem to matter what I did. She would either go ahead and get herself captured, or just get knocked out, or both. Either way, forcing me to tear away from the fight at hand in order to save her, and pray to god I don't shoot her in the face with a rifle, and cause a game over. There are some lockers located throughout the game as well that you can tell her to hide in, but these also seem to appear a lot when Ashley wasn't even in the picture, so they never got used all that much as she was never there. Gameplay wise, this was probably my biggest miss in this remake, and as I wish there were more options of what to do with her, or just to include none at all, just keep her tight on your ass the entire time, bow chicka bow wow. But even with that odd direction of change, I still had a lot of fun just playing through this game. But this video has gone on for a while, so let's bring this bad boy to a close. We're changing course now. Overall, I really do think Resident Evil 4 Remake is an awesome recreation of the original, which was a tough sale as it was heralded as one of the best games of all time, and especially at the time it came out. And it still reigns in many folks' top Resident Evil games. From gameplay, story, and character changes, I overall think that they were all for the better, leading to a fantastic reprisal of Resident Evil 4. And while some areas still kind of suck, like the water room in the castle, it's easy to overlook when everything else feels just way better to play. Opinions will always vary, and as I mentioned, consistently both in these videos as well as the comments it's cool to not like certain games or aspects of one and i just love reading your guys opinions in the comments below so let me know what your thoughts are down there and you can tell me i'm straight up wrong it's happened a lot look at resident evil 5 but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy a pleasant back and forth and we both listen to each other's sides if you enjoyed this video be sure to leave a like on it as it helps get this video out to more folks to actually watch and really helps out the channel and lastly if you enjoy content like this consider subscribing once again to see more stuff like this when it goes out. We're getting so close to that 1k goal that I've set to hit by the end of the year and it would actually mean the world to me to get to that point. With this video done, it also brings a conclusion to Resident Evil 14 videos later. All along, this is a series that has always been near and dear to me and some of my favorite experiences in gaming and while there will always be missteps along the way, seeing that this franchise is literally over 20 years old, I hope that these videos will serve to re-spark some of that magic for old fans in playing these games or convince newcomers to give them a try. Once again, thank you all so much for joining me on the ride, and keep an eye out for the next set of videos that are to come. Thank you all for watching, and as usual, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one.
Well, there you have it. That was a lot of games. As you can see, this series has had a lot of ups and downs throughout the years, which is to be expected with a franchise that has lasted as long as this one has. While there may be some duds in the mix, Resident Evil as a series has been one of my all-time favorites to return to, and this series of videos has been a great time to play through and speak about. I hope you guys enjoyed the ride as much as I did, but with that, let's bring this chapter to a close. There will be more games in the future, naturally as there have been rumors of a Resident Evil 9, and naturally, more remakes are going to be incoming, hopefully of Code Veronica or Resident Evil 5. And when those release, I'll give my thoughts on those as soon as they come out. But until then, let's close the door as we move on to another series, one stemming from a developer that, while loved by its fans, has never really seen the sales success it truly deserved. The Dishonored series is next, so stay tuned for that real soon. Until then... As always, remember to subscribe, hit the like button, and let me know what you guys think of Resident Evil in the comments down below. And until next time, my name is Brendan, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later.